Doctor Who turned 60 years old recently, and there are very few shows that have lasted that long. Wikipedia says the longest running show is the Lord Mayor's show, which is basically just an annual ceremony, so that doesn't count. But the longest scripted shows I could find are tied for 62 years old, those being Coronation Street and Sand Manchen, whatever that is. The point is, there's a lot of Doctor Who, and it might be daunting to a newcomer considering the 875 episodes that make up this show. And in case you've never heard of Doctor Who before, let's start with a very quick history lesson. So the Doctor is an alien from the planet Gallifrey. He spent his early years studying to earn the prestigious title of Time Lord, a group of Gallifreyans who watch over time without interfering. The Doctor got almost immediately bored of that, so stole a time machine known as a TARDIS, TARDIS stands for Time and Relative Dimension in Space by the way, and together with his granddaughter Susan, he ran away. The TARDIS soon lands in London in the 60s, and the TARDIS's chameleon circuit disguises it as a police public call box, which were actually a real thing in the 1960s. If you spotted someone doing a crime, you could shove them inside and phone the police. Yeah, the Beatles never mentioned that. Susan starts attending school in London, the Doctor accidentally kidnaps her teachers, and they all travel back to cavemen times. The TARDIS doesn't change to fit in with its surroundings when they arrive, which is weird, but I'm sure the Doctor will fix that in no time. The Doctor tries to kill this caveman, everyone escapes, and our group begin travelling the universe, getting into hijinks and scrapes, meeting monsters and aliens like Daleks, which you've probably heard of, and the Monoptera, which you probably haven't. Some of the Doctor's companions leave and he meets new ones, and then one day, whilst fighting the Cyber men, the Doctor dies. The end. No, wait, not the end, as Time Lords have the ability to regenerate, completely changing their biology and personality, essentially turning them into a totally new person. And this was always a thing, it's not just because the actor William Hartnell was getting too old to play the role, this was always something Time Lords could do, so just accept it, yeah? More adventures, more friends, the Doctor regenerates a few more times, and then the show gets cancelled in 1989 due to lowering ratings. In 1996 there was an attempt by Fox to reboot the show with a film, but that didn't work out. Out too well. But then, in 2004, the British Broadcasting Corporation announced that they'd be rebooting Doctor Who, headed now by a man named Russell T Davis, who'd be the new showrunner, writing the majority of episodes and in charge of all the big decisions regarding the show. One of which being who'd be playing the new Doctor. 40 year old Christopher Eccleston had been cast, with Billy Piper cast as his companion. The show would enter production that year with the first episode airing on March 26, 2005 and attracted over 10 million viewers. And I don't think anyone working on the show could have possibly predicted how much of an unstoppable force this show would become. With spin-offs and live shows and books and endless merch, if you were a kid living in Britain in the late 2000s, you couldn't escape this show. And I'm gonna look at all of it. I mean, why not? We've got time, you've seen how long this video is. Starting with series one of the 2005 reboot, I'm gonna look at every single bit of Doctor Who content. I'm leaving no stone unturned. This show is my childhood, and if you're watching this, it probably was a big part of yours too. So. Clear your schedule, because we've got some Doctor Who to be talking about. And I mean a lot of Doctor Who to be talking about. No, I... You are an enemy of the Daleks! So, let's begin with Season 1, Episode 1, Rose. Written by Russell T Davies. In which we meet 19-year-old Rose Tyler, who lives with her mum Jackie, works in a shop, and has a boyfriend called Mickey. The episode does a great job of quickly conveying all of this without any dialogue. In like a minute we learn everything we need to know about this character, before then being immediately thrown into the plot. This episode really doesn't waste time. Rose is looking for someone in the basement of the shop, and the basement is full of mannequins. And they're alive, and they're coming for her. A man then reaches out and grabs her hand, telling her to run. They escape in the elevator, the man rips off one of the arms of the mannequins, and plants an explosive in the building. He then introduces himself as the Doctor, and Rose leaves with the arm as the building explodes. The next day, the Doctor shows up at Rose's flat, and Rose's mum tries to get it on with him. Where anything could happen. No. The hand attacks them, and the Doctor kills it using some strange device. Rose asks the Doctor who he is and what's going on, and he gives a frankly unhelpful answer, before then wandering off to a blue box. Rose starts looking online and meets a guy who has poorly photoshopped images of the Doctor throughout history. Look at that, he was definitely there at JFK's assassination. And if you think that's just some poorly done early 2000s photoshop work, then you're wrong. And you're an idiot, and you're so not invited to my birthday party anymore. Meanwhile, a wheelie bin eats Mickey, 
replacing him with a terrible plastic replica who can't even talk properly and Rose just doesn't even notice. I mean, how self-absorbed can you be? The Doctor shows up and fights evil Mickey, ripping his head off. Then the Doctor and Rose escape in the blue box and oh my god, it's not just a blue box. And the Doctor reveals he's an alien and this is a spaceship called the TARDIS, which stands for Time and Relative Dimension in Space. And we get our first bigger on the inside reaction. The inside's bigger than the outside? The Doctor uses the TARDIS to track down the signal controlling Mickey's head and they work out the transmitter is the London Eye. They find a thing called the nesting consciousness, which is controlling all the mannequins, and they're called autons, okay? They're not called mannequins, they're called autons. Nowhere in the episode do they mention it, but in the credits they're called autons, they're just autons. So I'm just gonna call them autons. And oh look, there's Mickey. Just chilling here, unguarded. You didn't even want to try and escape? So the Doctor tries to reason with the piece of old chewing gum known as the nesting consciousness, but it doesn't listen and starts the invasion killing internet man and a load of others who just happen to be in a shopping centre at night. Rose's mum Jackie is also out shopping at night, is this just something people do? Rose swings into the Auton holding the Doctor, but somehow not also knocking into the Doctor, and some anti-plastic falls into the nesting consciousness, stopping the invasion and saving the day. They all escape in the TARDIS, Jackie phones Rose to make sure she's okay, and Rose just puts the phone down on her without even saying anything. What? Rose, that's your mum. She nearly died. It was too much effort for you just to say, I'm okay? The Doctor asks Rose, but not Mickey, to join him travelling in the TARDIS. And she initially refuses, until he tells her his spaceship is also a time machine. At which point she immediately abandons everyone and tells Mickey to go to hell. Not exactly, but, I mean, pretty much. Thanks. Thanks for what? Exactly. And that's it. That is the end of episode one of Doctor Who. It's by no means the best episode of the show, but it did have a lot that it had to do. So whilst juggling all the stuff it had to achieve in only 45 minutes, I think it was a perfectly serviceable first episode. It did a good job of introducing all these characters, explaining just enough about the Doctor and the TARDIS to keep us interested, and show how a basic episode will go. Rewatching this one, I've got to say, I don't remember the characters being this unlikable. Like, the characters all seem a little bit narcissistic and rude. Like, one of the first thing Rose's mum says is that her daughter looks like an old Bible. And Mickey, when he was comforting Rose after being nearly exploded, is just like, you didn't explode? Wicked. I'm gonna go down the pub and watch some football. All of these characters just kind of hate each other, and I know they all become a lot more likeable as the show goes on. But it's just interesting seeing how all these characters started out as kind of dicks. Episode 2, The End of the World, picks up straight after the events of Rose. Rose asks to go to the future, so they travel 5 billion years into the far future to the final day of planet Earth, as the sun expands. They land on an observation satellite and the Doctor flashes something called psychic paper, which can show whatever he wants people to see on it, and uses it here to fake two tickets to see the morbid display of Earth's death. I mean, what was the Doctor thinking, this being Rose's first trip? You know it would be fun, let's show the death of her planet. So everyone else starts showing up, including tree people, this blue thing, the face of Bo, adherents of the repeated meme, and some others who, in all honesty, don't really matter. But someone who does matter is Lady Cassandra, a woman who claims to be the very last human, except she's not so much a woman, more just a sheet of skin as a result of too many facelifts. That's the real reason they give, I'm not making that up. The Doctor begins flirting with this tree woman, whilst totally ignoring Rose who's just behind him having an existential crisis. That's so funny, you're made of wood and I have- What is it, Rose? Yes, we get it, everyone you ever loved is dead, blah blah blah. So Rose goes off being all overwhelmed as the year 5 billion is just so different, despite them still having things like mugs and Britney Spears and even stairs. I mean, this guy is basically in a wheelchair. You'd have thought they'd adopted ramps by now. Also, everyone speaks English. Except they're not actually. The TARDIS can translate different languages in your brain. Which the Doctor explains to Rose, before then doing some alien stuff to Rose's phone so that she can phone her long dead mum. Or at least add her name to her contacts. That's not how phones work, guys. Oh, also there are these robot spiders that are going around killing everyone. The Doctor then goes exploring with the tree, and Rose calls Cassandra a bitch. It's better to die than live like you, a bitchy trampoline. Before then getting smacked around the face by the memes. 
Meanwhile, the Doctor finds the robot spiders crawling through the vents. And it turns out the spiders are taking down the shields, so everyone on the space station will burn to death. Luckily, the Doctor fixes it just in time to save Rose, before then confronting Cassandra who it turns out was controlling both the spiders and the memes. She has stocks in all the guest rival companies, so she'll be making some sweet sweet profit out of everyone's death, and then she just teleports away, leaving everyone else to die as the shields fail once again. It turns out the only way to reactivate the shields is to reach a switch on the other side of these fans, which is just a great place to put it guys, chef's kiss. Tree Woman burns to death and the Doctor reactivates the switch. The Doctor then teleports Cassandra back and she dries out from the heat and explodes. Rose is saddened by the fact that no one here cares about the Earth ending anymore, what with most of them dying and all. So the Doctor takes her back to present day Earth and tells her his planet is also gone, it being lost in a war, the Time War, and in fact he's the only one of his species left alive. So the pair decide to forget their traumas and go eat some chips. So I do feel like this episode is pretty good because it does pay off the premise of what the show is about. It's about a man who can go anywhere in time and space and so let's start off episode 2 with him going somewhere really weird. And as a result I feel that this is a great second episode to the show. Although obviously the problem with that then becomes how weird do we make it? Do we make it so alienating that general audience just don't enjoy it? Which is why I feel like we got this weird middle ground where there are things like Britney Spears that anchor us back in despite us seeing all these weird CGI effects and mad costumes. Episode 3, The Unquiet Dead. Well, we've done the future, let's do the past. It's Christmas 1869 and the dead are waking up and attacking people. The Undertaker shows up and is at best mildly irritated by this. Oh no. And uses his maid with psychic powers to track the dead down. Also, Charles Dickens is in this episode, and he's doing some readings from his book, A Christmas Carol. In the audience, the previously dead woman is here, presumably having bought a ticket after death, and starts attacking everyone in the audience with her gas powers. The Doctor and Rose show up, and the Doctor says Rose can't go out in Victorian times looking like that, so she goes to the off-screen wardrobe to put on something far more revealing. Great plan. The Undertaker soon kidnaps Rose, and the Doctor chases them down with the help of Charles Dickens. The Undertaker leaves Rose with the dead bodies, who then start attacking her, but the Doctor and Charles Dickens show up just in time to save Rose. Charles Dickens can't handle that any of this is real, having a little existential crisis of his own, whilst Rose starts talking to the psychic maid as she starts reading her mind, knowing all kinds of things about Rose, including the death of her father. Everyone gathers round for a seance to speak to the gas ghost people who are inhabiting all the dead bodies, and summon them through a thing called the Rift. It turns out they're not actually ghosts, they're aliens called the Gelf, who lost their physical forms in the Time War. Yeah, that thing that killed all the Doctor's people. And the Gelf tell everyone they need the maid to help them all get through the Rift, so that they can start inhabiting dead bodies full time. Rose is all like, ooh, that's gross, and the Doctor's like, shut up, we're doing it. So the maid helps the Gelf cross through the rift, and it turns out they were evil all along, and Rose's prejudice was right. The Gelf then climb inside the Undertaker, and deem to take over the whole human race. But before they can, the maid lights a match, setting fire to all the gassy Gelf, causing them all to explode. The Doctor and Rose say goodbye to Charles Dickens, and he watches as they disappear in the TARDIS. Pretty unremarkable, unmemorable episode in all honesty. Episode 4 Aliens of London. The Doctor takes Rose back home, and that it's only been 12 hours since they left in episode 1. Except, slight mistake, they've actually been gone 12 months, and Rose has been deemed missing all that time. Jackie is absolutely furious with the Doctor, and slaps him. Better get used to that. In fact, let's make that number 1 on the Doctor slap counter. Rose can't seem to handle the legitimate concerns her mother has about her, and so just leaves. The Doctor reveals to Rose that he is in fact 900 years old as a spaceship shows up and crashes into Big Ben. They then watch the news on TV where it's revealed that a body has been found within the spaceship. This right here is something Russell T Davis absolutely loves to do in his stories. If there's ever some kind of big global alien invasion, he'll dedicate a good few minutes of the episode to showing different TV shows reacting to it. And in this case we get Blue Peter and they're making a spaceship themed cake. The Doctor gives Rose a key to the TARDIS to promise he'll come back as he goes off to investigate. As the Doctor leaves in the TARDIS, Mickey sees him and chases after him, because obviously no one bothered to tell him that Rose was back. 
he charges after the Doctor, but runs into the wall as the TARDIS disappears. The Doctor's investigation takes him to the hospital where the alien body is being kept, and the Doctor immediately runs into a load of army people. But instead of being arrested for breaking into this secure building, like, you know, something that would make sense, he immediately starts commanding them as everyone realises that the alien is alive and has escaped. Like, he didn't even flash any psychic paper. Everyone just immediately did as he said. Anyway, they find the alien, and it's this little pig guy, and the army men shoot it. Now we get introduced to the character Harriet Jones, an MP who's just wandering through 10 Downing Street, and oh look, she's just found some confidential documents. Harriet Jones quickly hides as all these members of Parliament show up and start farting in one of the cringiest scenes of the entire show. There I go. Oh! 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 And me! I'm shaking my booty. <laughs> Fart! Oh wait, it's fine, they're not actually farting, they're just aliens. And they're wearing suits made out of skin, and I guess air is leaking out of the suit or something. I don't know, the episode doesn't give a great explanation. They just keep using the term gas exchange, but that's what a fart is. So I don't know, maybe they've just had a curry or something. The Doctor concludes that the little pig guy was in fact a fake alien, and the whole spaceship crash was fake in order to hide the fact that the real aliens had already invaded. Mickey finds Rose and is rightfully a bit annoyed, saying that pretty much everyone thought he had murdered Rose. Which, yeah, I can see how that could annoy someone. Then Rose, Mickey and Jackie all find the TARDIS as the Doctor returns. Jackie freaks out after seeing the inside of the TARDIS, and phones an alien helpline to report the Doctor. This then gets the attention of the alien parliament people, and so they bring the Doctor, as well as a load of other alien specialists, to 10 Downing Street. As the police turn up to interview Jackie, Rose and Harriet Jones go off and do a bit more exploring, and find the Prime Minister has been murdered, before then being confronted by one of our alien politicians. All the politicians, as well as the police officer interviewing Jackie, unmask from their skin suits, calling themselves the Slovene, and electrocute all the specialists, including the Doctor. And that right here is our very first cliffhanger in the show, as this episode is a two-parter. Episode 5, World War 3, begins with the Doctor resisting all that electric flowing through his body, and says, Deadly to humans, maybe. Which, admittedly, is a pretty badass line, I'll, I'll give him that. And he sends all the electricity into the Slovene, electrocuting them, all of them in fact, as this somehow affects every Slovene, allowing everyone to escape. Except for the dead experts, of course, they're dead. The Doctor is quickly framed for everyone's murder, and arrested but the Doctor escapes in an elevator. There's some more awkward dialogue. I need to be naked. As the Slovene hunt our heroes down. It's a really weird scene, this, because it can't decide if it wants to be tense and scary or childish and comedic. And every time they run through this corridor, I can't help but think of Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Dooby-Doo, where are you? We got some work to do now. The Doctor sprays all the Slovene with a fire extinguisher, and Rose, Harriet Jones and the Doctor lock themselves in a panic room. Using Rose's new super phone, the Doctor calls Mickey and Jackie and talks them through hacking into UNIT, an organisation dealing with aliens. Basically, the army but for aliens. But then, oh no, the doorbell rings and the police Slovene shows up. The Doctor, based on the fact that Slovene farts smell of bad breath and calcium, works out that the Slovene are weak to vinegar. So what's that now? Electricity, fire extinguishers, and now vinegar? These Slovene are becoming less of a threat by the minute. So Jackie throws some vinegar at the police Slovene, and it explodes. Much like the electricity, the other Slovene can feel this death, and are pretty peeved about it. So the Slovene, dressed back in their politics skin, claim the fake aliens have weapons above the earth, and request the world's nuclear codes to fire at them whilst actually planning on using the nuclear bombs to destroy the Earth. To make profit somehow? The Doctor helps Mickey do some more hacking, and they fire a missile at Downing Street. The Doctor, Rose and Harriet Jones survive by hiding in a fridge, I mean cupboard, as all of the Slovene, as well as 10 Downing Street, get obliterated. The Doctor tells Rose that Harriet Jones ends up becoming Prime Minister, and is elected for three successive terms. I do hope that fact doesn't come back to bite anyone later. Jackie offers to cook for Rose and the Doctor, but the Doctor ain't having none of that, and he's all like, Rose, we're leaving. Although, to his credit, the Doctor does offer to bring Mickey this time, except Mickey's now the one refusing. 
Rose tells her mum that she'll return in the TARDIS in only 10 seconds, and then doesn't. And that's it for the Slovene two-parter. I really find it interesting how people complain nowadays that the show has got too political, when literally in episode 4 and 5, they were doing evil farting politicians. That's about as political as it gets, isn't it? But I would say that it's a pretty good couple of episodes, if tonally all over the place. Like, there's so much serious heavy drama that's immediately juxtaposed with fart gags, making it a bit of a mess, but an entertaining mess. I think this episode is so unfortunate because it is so, so close to being brilliant. For the most part, the plot is good. It sets up a great alien invasion story in England. There's real stakes, real fear, real tension, but everyone's farting all the time. It's the, I mean, the alien design is good. I really like the design of the Slovene, but why make them fart all the time? It just, you've ruined it. You've ruined a perfectly good concept with fart jokes. Episode 5, Dalek. Hmm. Wonder what this one's going to be about. The Doctor and Rose respond to a distress signal landing in the far off year of 2012, in an underground museum full of alien bits, including a Slovene arm and the head of whatever this thing is, something that the Doctor describes as an old enemy. Whatever could it be? We'll just have to pop that in our pocket for now, and we might just get to it later. I don't know, keep watching, see what Santa brings you. Dang it, I rambled too long and now the Doctor and Rose have been arrested. So the Doctor and Rose get taken to this guy, Henry Van Staten, who owns the collection and also the internet apparently. Don't be stupid, no one owns the internet. And let's just keep the whole world thinking that way, right kids? The Doctor proves his worth to Van Staten by showing his knowledge of the alien artefacts, so Van Staten then takes the Doctor to visit his only live specimen. Oh, I wonder what it could be. Still. Me and a lot of people watching this for the first time had no clue what a Dalek really was. And this thing was genuinely terrifying. Exemplified by the fact that the Doctor, who up to this point has been pretty cool and collected in the face of danger, is now legitimately terrified. But we soon learn that the Dalek is weak. Too weak to pose much of a threat. And so the Doctor begins taunting it, telling it that its species is all dead and he was the one who killed them all. That's right, the Daleks and the Time Lords are all both dead. And when the Dalek notices that similarity, calling the Doctor and it the same, the Doctor spins into a rage, trying to kill the Dalek. But Van Staten steps in and locks the Doctor up to study him. After all, he's an alien too. Also, we learn that the Doctor has two hearts. Rose doesn't see any of this, as she's too busy flirting with this guy. And when he tells Rose not to get too close to the Dalek, she immediately goes right up to it. Well done, Rose. Great listening. Rose takes pity on the Dalek, touching it and incidentally transferring a bit of her genetic material to it, allowing the Dalek to regain its power and immediately plunge this guy to death. Van Staten releases the Doctor, realising he's the only one who can help, as the Dalek downloads the internet and goes on a murderous rampage. I mean, 10 minutes on Reddit and I feel the same. Ha ha ha. The Dalek kills a load of people and is impervious to bullets. But it's fine, it can't get up the stairs, the dumb little idiot. Oh shit, it can fly. The Doctor and Van Staten lock all the doors down as Rose and, um, this guy, uh, Adam, his name's Adam, try to reach the doors before they close, with Rose ending up getting trapped with the Dalek. But the Dalek can't seem to kill her. It turns out it took more than just Rose's genetic material, it took her empathy and fear too. The Dalek demands that the Doctor open the door and the Doctor obliges, readying himself with an alien gun to take down the Dalek. The Dalek comes in, but can't kill Van Staten or, in fact, anyone. All it wants now is freedom. So it opens up its metal casing to feel the sun on its gross little mutant innards. The Doctor shows up ready to kill the Dalek, but Rose stops him but it doesn't really matter because the Dalek ends up destroying itself anyway. I mean, 10 minutes on Reddit and I feel the same way. Aha, aha, aha. The Doctor and Rose leave, taking this guy with them, and I forgot his name again. But he's officially a companion now, and I think Rose's boyfriend? And I'm sure he'll stick around for a long, long time. I thought Dalek was a pretty good episode, and it did a great job of showing just how unstoppable a Dalek can be. Probably my favourite episode so far.
The episode Dalek was the first ever Doctor Who episode that I ever saw, and what an introduction. This episode is fantastic. It sets up by far the most scary and terrifying villain of the show yet, with an amazing iconic design. I mean, I mean look at that guy. Yeah, I love this episode, and I'm totally biased as it was my first one, but it is great, and I think it's a great introductory episode if you want to introduce someone to Doctor Who. Because unlike the episodes which have been quite campy, which is what Doctor Who's kind of got a reputation for, this one wasn't. It was really gritty and grounded and kind of terrifying. Episode 7, The Long Game. The Doctor, Rose and, uh, Adam, that's right, he's still here, land on another space station in the distant future. But far from being exciting and cool, it's all gritty and cheap looking. And that's not just for budgetary reasons, it's supposed to look like that. The Doctor is equally confused about how rubbish this place is, so goes off to investigate, whilst also nicking a load of money from a cash point to give to... Adam. The Doctor soon learns that this place is called Satellite 5 and is broadcasting TV, including a show featuring the face of Bo. You remember him? So the Doctor pretends to be an inspector and is given a demonstration of how the satellite gets its news. And, uh, well, it involves this woman's head opening up and sucking up information to then be transmitted to the 600 news channels. And is it just me, or does 600 news channels not sound like all that much? Sky TV has almost 100, and that's now, not the thousands of years in the future this episode takes place. Meanwhile, Simon Pegg is here, and he's watching all of this take place on the monitors. And he learns that one of the people in this room is a spy. But not the Dr. Rose or the other one, no, it's this random woman, who's then brought up to floor 500 under the guise of a promotion. But, surprise surprise, it's not a promotion, and she's killed. Back on the lower floors, Andrew spends all his stolen money on a hole in his head, thereby allowing him to connect to Satellite 5 and access all the information available. The Doctor and Rose decide to head up to Floor 500, where they find Simon Pegg, as well as the spy whose dead body is still working thanks to the chip in her head. Simon Pegg then introduces them to the boss of Satellite 5, which is this thing that was right above them this whole time. But they just didn't look up, apparently? This thing is called the Jagrafess, and Satellite 5's true purpose is media manipulation and controlling the human population to make them the Jagrafess's slaves. Satire that was way ahead of its time. Alex uses his new fancy hole to interface with the Matrix, whilst also allowing all his memories to be read by Simon Pegg, who quickly learns about the TARDIS and plots to steal it. But this woman from earlier uses her hole to help the Doctor and Rose and fight back, destroying Floor 500. The Doctor, Rose and Adam, see I remembered his name that time, I promise I won't ever forget that again, all leave and the Doctor is furious with Adam, taking him home and leaving him there, never to be seen again, for God's sake! Also his mum finds out about his hole and is a bit freaked out. This episode is very meh, whilst it does set up a few things for the rest of the season, both plot-wise and thematically, this is still just an episode that I would always skip on rewatch and I can really see why. It's not fun or good or really even that interesting, and it's my least favourite episode so far. Episode 8, Father's Day. We start off with a flashback and a lot of exposition of Rose and her mum talking about her father, Pete Tyler, and his untimely death when Rose was just a baby. Pete Tyler died as a result of a hit and run whilst on the way to a wedding in 1987. Rose's mum wishes that he didn't die alone, and Rose then asks the Doctor if she could go back to be that person, being with her father as he dies. The Doctor obliges and shows some genuine concern for Rose. This makes him a lot more likeable to me than the uncaring character he's mostly been portrayed as so far. Like, unless Rose is in grave danger, the Doctor doesn't seem to really care, so it's nice to see this more caring aspect of his character. Look, he's even holding her hand as they watch Pete die. It's genuinely a really sweet scene, and played super sincerely. Rose doesn't go to her dad in time, so they decide to try again. Except also now having to hide from the other Rose and the Doctor. You know, the ones who were just here. So how are they going to hide from them whilst also reaching Pete before he dies? But it doesn't matter anyway, as Rose simply can't handle watching her dad die again, and runs out and saves her dad's life causing the other Doctor and Rose to blink out of existence, and this is where we have our first paradox of the show. And it's called the Grandfather Paradox, 
And that is a very famous paradox that usually works with someone going back and killing their own grandfather, which would then mean that that person no longer exists, so they can no longer go back in time to kill their grandfather and prevent their own existence, thereby creating a paradox. This is very much a case of an inverse of that, where what Rose has done is actually saved her father. And as a result, that now means that because her father is alive, that she now never had the grief of losing him, so never had the need to go back and save him in the first place. Rose goes with her dad to his house, as the doctor just keeps staring at her like a disappointed mum, hearkening back to what happened with Adam in the previous episode. The Doctor really does not like people using time travel for personal gain. The Doctor soon storms off and Rose's dad tries flirting with her. What, a pretty girl like you? If I was going out with you... Stop! Right there! I'm just saying. I know what you're saying and we're not going there. Some mysterious unseen force then starts killing a load of people and the Doctor finds the police box is now just the police box. As it seems, time has gone deeply wrong and the car that was supposed to kill Pete keeps blinking in and out of existence. Rose and Pete go to the wedding and find Jackie and baby Rose. We then learn that Jackie and Pete didn't have as perfect of a marriage as Rose liked to imagine, and a lot of arguments ensue. But this is soon interrupted as a young Mickey comes running up to the church shouting about monsters. The doctor then comes running up to the church also shouting about monsters. And indeed the monsters soon show up. These demon things called reapers appear in the sky and begin eating everyone. So all the survivors hide in the church as the doctor explains the reapers are here to fix the paradox. Pete realises that Rose is his daughter in a pretty well acted scene. The doctor also gets a nice scene where he comforts the terrified bride and groom and this is I think the turning point where the doctor becomes the doctor for me. Every new Doctor has a moment where everything finally clicks into place and you accept that they are the Doctor. And I think this is it for me. Comforting these random people and promising to try and save them is the moment where I'm no longer watching Christopher Eccleston, I'm watching the Doctor. Mickey shows up again and Jackie says, God help his poor girlfriend if he ever gets one. As though that's supposed to be dramatic irony, Rose has already had like 1.5 boyfriends since Mickey. The Doctor and Rose make up, and the Doctor admits he doesn't have a plan, in a really sweet scene. This episode is absolutely dripping in pathos, and every character is just so much more likeable here. The Doctor tries to use the TARDIS key to pull the TARDIS back into reality, as Pete asks Rose if he becomes a good dad. So Rose tells him some lies about a life they spent together, and Pete immediately realises that that's not him, and the car was actually supposed to kill him. Pete tries to prove to Jackie that Rose is in fact their daughter, causing Rose to touch herself, teehee. And this is enough of a paradox for the Reapers to break in, kill the Doctor and stop the TARDIS. Pete then walks out into the path of a car that's still blinking in and out of existence, sacrificing himself as Rose stays with him as he dies. This fixes the paradox, bringing everyone, including the Doctor, back and Rose got her wish of being with her dad as he died. So, a happy ending, I guess? This was an episode I would usually skip over when I was young, but bloody hell, this episode is fantastic, and might just be my favourite one so far. Episode 9, The Empty Child. We start this episode with the Doctor and Rose following something dangerous through time as it heads towards London. They land and immediately start searching for the object. The Doctor asks in this jazz bar if anyone has seen an object fall from the sky, and as the audience laughs, he realises he's landed in World War II. Where, uh, a little history lesson for you, um, a lot of things fell from the sky. And then everyone leaves the jazz bar as an air raid siren goes off. Meanwhile, Rose is off following this kid in a gas mask who's calling for his mummy. He's just here chilling on a roof, so Rose tries to help him. She climbs up this random rope attached to a zeppelin to reach him, and the zeppelin begins ascending above London. The Doctor returns to the TARDIS to find his phone is ringing, despite it not being a real phone, as this girl called Nancy appears to tell the Doctor not to answer it. The Doctor ignores this advice, and hears the voice of a boy on the other end, still calling for his mummy. Are you my mummy? Who is this? 
The Doctor then follows Nancy as she and a bunch of kids help themselves to the food left on the table by a sheltering family. And the Doctor asks for more if they've seen the object with possibly the worst drawing I've ever seen. And then the boy in the gas mask shows up, once more looking for his mummy. Nancy warns the Doctor not to let the kid get too close to him, but again the Doctor just doesn't listen and opens the door to find the boy is now gone. This guy notices Rose dangling from the Zeppelin and catches her in his tractor beam as Rose falls, pulling her into his spaceship. This is Captain Jack Harkness, an ex-time agent from the 51st century, played by John Barrowman. He heals all the rope burns on Rose's hands using these tiny robots called nanogenes, then they both drink champagne and dance on top of Jack's ship. The Doctor realises the little boy is connected to the object he was chasing, and Nancy admits she knows where the object fell. But before she takes the Doctor to it, she takes him to see a doctor at a hospital where all this weirdness first started. Jack is also boasting that he knows the location of the object as it belongs to him. He also knows that a German bomb is going to drop on top of it, destroying it in only two hours. The Doctor meets the other Doctor, Dr Constantine, in a hospital filled with unconscious people wearing gas masks. The Doctor learns that every patient here has the exact same injuries, and Dr Constantine explains a boy was brought here and caused everyone to end up like this. This boy, as it turns out, is Nancy's brother, and Dr Constantine transforms into one of these creatures in a horrific scene. Definitely the scariest moment in Series 1. Rose and Jack show up at the hospital just in time for all the gas mask people to wake up and come after them, as every last one of them calls for their mummy. And the episode ends on a cliffhanger. The following episode, The Doctor Dances, begins with The Doctor telling all the gas mask zombies to go to their room, taking on the role of an angry mum. And surprisingly, they all oblige. Captain Jack then explains to The Doctor that he in fact sent the object in The Doctor's path, it being an old space ambulance, as bait in order to try and get The Doctor and Rose to buy it, before then letting it get destroyed by the bomb so that The Doctor and Rose never find out what they've bought. It's admittedly a pretty convoluted plan. And I'm not sure it makes 100% sense. But anyway, we'll move past that because all of them are now investigating the room where the boy was first brought to. Here they find a tape recording of a boy asking for his mummy. And they soon realise the tape has already ended and the boy is there with them having gone to his room. They escape using Jack's sonic blaster. And Jack and the doctor argue over what's better, a sonic blaster or a sonic screwdriver. I mean, at least a sonic screwdriver doesn't seem to run out of battery immediately, as is the case here which does feel a little bit like a plot contrivance. Like, you've just given the characters a way to escape, they use it exactly twice, and then out of nowhere they just can't use it anymore. So they all find themselves trapped in this little room, as all the gas mask zombies try to get in. Jack then teleports them all to his ship, and what, he could have done that the whole time! That's frankly even more ridiculous and contrived. So Jack flies them all to the crash site, and Nancy is also there, having broken into where the space ambulance crashed, in order to try and find out exactly what happened to her little brother. But she quickly gets captured, and is guarded by this guy who's also been infected. As we learn, the infection turning people into gas mask zombies is now becoming airborne. Nancy sings to him to make him fall asleep, as the doctor shows up to help her escape. But oh no, all the gas mask zombies are now coming. The Doctor investigates the space ambulance, and he explains that it was full of nanogenes. Remember nanogenes, those things from earlier that helped heal Rose? Well, they first came across the dead boy and used him as a template. And as a result, are now trying to turn everyone into these gas mask creatures because it thinks that they're healing them. Oh, also that German bomb is about to drop on everyone, in case everything else wasn't enough already. The Doctor realises that Nancy isn't the boy's sister, but is in fact his mother, and makes her tell the boy that she's his mum, thus allowing the nanogenes to study her and fix their template, repairing him and everyone else. And Captain Jack uses his tractor beam to capture the German bomb as it falls, meaning... Everybody lives, bro. Just this once! Everybody lives! Which, I'll admit, is a pretty damn cathartic moment. As there have been so many deaths this series, it's nice to get just a single episode where no one dies. Okay, maybe not no one dying, as Jack is unable to dispose of a bomb, so has a drink as he accepts he's about to explode. But hooray, the TARDIS shows up and saves him just in time. Much bigger on the inside, you better be. Oh, and the Doctor dances. This two-parter is absolutely one of the highlights of the series, and definitely the scariest. I think this episode led to a whole generation of kids being absolutely terrified of gas masks. Boontown is a sequel to the Slovene two-parter, and takes place six months after that story. 
we find out that this Slovene, Blomfell Foch Pasimir Day Slovene, or Margaret to her friends, survived Downing Street and is now Mayor of Cardiff. I remember back in primary school, I thought I was so cool for learning how to say her name. Sure, everyone else was off learning how to say Raxacorica Fallopatorius, but that wasn't nearly nerdy enough for me. Mickey comes to meet Rose in Cardiff, as the TARDIS is there to charge using the Rift, because that's something it does now. The Rift, by the way, is that thing the Gelf tried to get through a while back, and apparently the TARDIS can nibble that up. This episode is a nice little cosy episode, and for a lot of it, there's really not much threat. It's just everyone hanging out. The Doctor also finally explains why the TARDIS looks like a police box, saying that it was disguised as a police box in the 1960s, but then the chameleon circuit got stuck, and the Doctor just never bothered to fix it. Back to Margaret Slovene, and everyone's celebrating the announcement of a new nuclear power station. But a woman quizzes Margaret on the many, many accidental deaths surrounding her, and is worried about the safety of a nuclear power station. Margaret goes with the woman to the bathroom, and is ready to kill her, but has a surprise change of heart when the woman tells her that she's pregnant. Meanwhile, the doctor recognises Margaret on a newspaper, and they go to her office to confront her. Margaret climbs out the window. She's climbing out the window, isn't she? Yes, she is. And everyone chases her down. This scene is great, as it's purely played for laughs. Again, it's refreshing to have a relatively low-stakes episode. She tries teleporting away, but the Doctor just keeps bringing her back. Our heroes soon work out that Margaret's plan is to use the nuclear power station to blow up the rift and use a force field device called an extrapolator as a kind of surfboard to get away. What? These evil plans are getting way too convoluted. The Doctor tells Margaret that he's going to take her back to Raxcogra Fallopatorius to be tried for her crimes, and Margaret says that if she goes back there, she'll be killed, to which the Doctor says is not his problem. Oh, also this is a good time to note that the nuclear project is called Blygjul, which is Welsh for Bad Wolf. Two words that have appeared randomly in pretty much every episode of this series. And now even the Doctor's starting to notice that that's a bit weird, before immediately shrugging it off as a coincidence. They take Margaret back to the TARDIS, but it's not done charging yet, so they're stuck with her as their prisoner until morning. Rose and Mickey have a nice conversation about missing each other, and interestingly Rose doesn't mention Adam, but gets incredibly jealous when Mickey mentions that he went on a date with someone else. The Doctor takes Margaret out for a final meal, and sure she tries to kill him a few times, but they mostly just have a conversation where we get to dig around in these characters' psyches, as Margaret pleads with the Doctor for mercy. And it's a really well written scene. But of course we've got to have some action, so the rift begins opening, and Cardiff nearly gets destroyed by the extrapolator. As it turned out, Margaret had planned all of this. The extrapolator was a trap, and Margaret is about to escape, but then the TARDIS rips open, and Margaret sees into the heart of the TARDIS, looking directly at the deus ex machina, which magically regresses her into an egg. They stop the extrapolator and drop the egg off on Raxacorica Fallopatorius to give Margaret a second chance at life. Rose goes back for Mickey, but he leaves finally realising that Rose doesn't really care about him. I think this episode is really interesting and is definitely unfairly looked over. This was one of the episodes I'd often rewatch if I just wanted to hang out with the characters, without needing to get invested in a big high stakes story. Although I will say that my one criticism is I don't really know if Margaret's second chance is fully deserved, like I'd like to have seen her redeem herself just a tiny bit, like if she had sacrificed herself to close the rift and that had been what had caused her to turn into an egg, then I feel that maybe that would have been better. Or maybe not, moving on. Episode 12, Bad Wolf. Whoa, there's those words again. Spooky. And this episode starts off by being an episode of a totally different show. Remember how I said about Russell T Davies liking to insert other shows into his scripts? Well, never is that more apparent than right here, as this literally begins as an episode of Big Brother. Except this episode of Big Brother has the Doctor in it. And don't worry, the Doctor is equally confused. And he's not the only one, as Rose has woken up on another TV show, The Weakest Link. A pretty famous UK quiz show that used to be hosted by a woman called Anne Robinson, or in this case, the Android. And finally, Jack wakes up on the TV show What Not To Wear, a show where these two people, Trini and Susanna, gave people makeovers. And what is pretty cool about this is that all the presenters of these shows are making cameos voicing robot versions of themselves. In the Big Brother house, the Doctor meets this woman named Linda with a Y and starts to remember exactly what brought him here. Basically, this white light got into the TARDIS and teleported everyone away, which kinda doesn't make sense, but we'll get into that later. 
Those in charge who are operating these shows seem equally confused that all these people have just randomly shown up in their shows, and especially that Rose isn't scared. She is absolutely cracking up and loving the idea of being on The Weakest Link, but soon learns the error of her ways when she sees another contestant getting disintegrated. Meanwhile, someone gets evicted from the Big Brother house and is equally disintegrated. I feel these scenes are really effective in showing how our main cast begin to slowly realise the seriousness of this predicament. That all these games involve people competing for their lives. Oh, also Trini and Susanna plan to continue making over Jack by cutting him into pieces and giving him a dog's head. But Jack literally pulls a gun out of his ass and shoots them. The Doctor starts damaging equipment to get himself evicted, but doesn't get disintegrated, knowing that someone brought him there on purpose and wants him alive. So the Doctor then breaks out, taking Linda with him, and quickly realises that this is Satellite 5. Remember from the long game? Someone's been playing a long game. Oh, I get it now. Except it's been 100 years since then, and it's not called Satellite 5 anymore. It's now called the Bad Wolf Corporation. Turns out the Doctor shutting down all the news channels last time he was here made an even more dystopian future where everyone is now forced to watch and compete in these game shows. Jack builds a big old gun out of the Trini and Susanna robots and goes to find the Doctor. All of them then go to save Rose just in time to see her lose the weakest link and get disintegrated. Everyone then gets arrested before immediately escaping again. I'm not too sure what was the point of that scene. And they go to floor 500 and the Doctor demands to know who's in charge. Little aside here, there's this great bit where the Doctor points the gun at everyone, then just gives them the gun. Like, just perfectly encapsulating the show's ethos that the Doctor really just doesn't need a gun. Jack finds the TARDIS, and we learn that the Doctor was brought here by the Controller. This woman who was so scary to me as a kid, but looking back, it really was just a woman with contact lenses, some gel, and tubes taped to her. I don't know, maybe I was just easily scared, but sh she is quite freaky, right? And the controller's not even evil. She brought the Doctor here to help her. To stop her masters, the ones who are actually in charge of the game shows. Jack figures out that the disintegration ray is actually a teleporter and that Rose is still alive. And right here, on a Dalek ship. Ah. The controller informs the Doctor on how to find her masters before then being transported to the Dalek ship and exterminated for being a traitor. And the Doctor sees that it's not just one Dalek ship, but a legion of 200 ships with half a million Daleks on board. The Daleks threaten the Doctor using Rose as their hostage, and the Doctor says no, admitting that he has no plan, but he's still going to stop them anyway. Watching this episode now, nearly 20 years after its broadcast, you can feel just how dated this episode is, referencing shows that just don't exist anymore. But also I do feel like that kind of plays into its favour. With this episode being so campy and comedic and weird, it really does catch you at the end, where it all just switches to really high tense action with the Daleks showing up. And as a result, these two juxtaposing things really work well together and set up a great finale. The series finale, The Parting of the Ways, starts with the Doctor flying the TARDIS onto the Dalek ship and landing around Rose and a Dalek. Jack kills the Dalek using his big fancy gun like it's nothing, and then proceeds to never use that gun again. Our heroes step out of the TARDIS to confront the Daleks, using the extrapolator from Boomtown to shield them. The Doctor asks how the Daleks escaped the Time War, and here we meet the Dalek Emperor. Turns out a single Dalek ship survived carrying the Emperor, and now he's using the humans from the games to create a new army of Daleks. Our heroes head back into the TARDIS and leave, and in this small moment here, we learn so much. The Doctor really doesn't have any plan, and he knows he's not getting out of this. And all that is expressed to us without a single word said. Now, remember that bit in Bad Wolf where we found out they were teleported out of the TARDIS? Well, obviously that was Dalek technology doing that. So my question is, why don't the Daleks just teleport them back out of the TARDIS? And yes, I know now they've got the extrapolator, but then they all go back to Satellite 5, which the Daleks are in control of. So why are the Daleks not just teleporting them from there? You know, back onto the Dalek ship and just exterminate them. I guess if the Daleks did that, we wouldn't really have a story. So anyway, they all travel back to Satellite 5 and the Doctor tells everyone that he's going to use the satellite to transmit a thing called a Delta Wave but will wipe out the Daleks. But it will take a few days to create. And the Daleks are already on their way to Satellite 5 and they're going to reach it in about 22 minutes. Jack says his goodbyes knowing there's no way they're going to survive this and kisses both Rose and the Doctor. 
He then travels to the bottom floor of Satellite 5, where the survivors are being kept to look for volunteers. After getting like five people, he tells everyone else to stay quiet, as the Daleks should only be heading for them on floor 500. The Doctor suddenly gets an idea and tells Rose he can do some sciencey stuff that'll fix everything. He just needs Rose to get in the TARDIS and hold down a switch and oh no, the Doctor's making that face again. It turns out that was all a lie and he sends Rose home. A hologram tells Rose that he's definitely going to die and that she should have a good life. The hologram then turns and looks at Rose and oh, I just cry a bit every single time. Jack asks the Doctor if the Delta Wave is nearly ready and the Dalek Emperor explains that the Delta Wave could easily be made ready but it would destroy the Earth as well. Rose is now back with Jackie and Mickey as they all just sit and eat chips and Rose is forced to endure the most mundane conversation I've ever heard. Have you tried that new pizza place on Mint Row? What's it selling? Pizza. Oh, that's nice. Rose admits that she can't go back to living her life like this and runs off. Rose then notices the words Bad Wolf are written everywhere and knows this is some kind of sign telling her to go back. And to do that, Rose decides to tear open the heart of the TARDIS, like what happened in Boomtown, so she can communicate with the TARDIS. Mickey tries pulling it open with his car, but it's not enough. But luckily, Jackie shows up with a big old tow truck. The Daleks arrive on Satellite 5 and predictably start killing everyone, and they even go down to the bottom floor because they just love killing that much. They also start bombing the Earth and blasting down the door to get Linda with a blowtorch Dalek. This blowtorch Dalek is so cool and we never get to see another one. Surely a blowtorch is more practical than a plunger. Although it seems there wasn't really any point to a blowtorch Dalek, as a Dalek shows up outside the window and though we can't hear it through the glass, you know exactly what it's saying. That Dalek shoots through the glass, killing Linda with a wire, and then the Daleks kill Jack as well, and finally reach the Doctor as he finishes the Delta Wave. The Dalek Emperor dares him to use it, but the Doctor just can't bring himself to do it, admitting that he'd rather be a coward than a killer. But meanwhile, the TARDIS opens up its heart and Rose sucks up all the Deus Ex Machina energy, piloting the TARDIS back to Satellite 5 and basically becoming God. She sends the words Bad Wolf all across time and space as a message to herself, which brings us to our second paradox. Which is known as a predestination paradox. In the case here, Rose has travelled back to Satellite 5, taken the words Bad Wolf, sent them back into the past, which then leads herself back to Satellite 5 to send the words Bad Wolf back, causing a sexy little causal loop. Bad Wolf Rose then turns every single Dalek to dust and brings Jack back to life. But oh no, the power is killing her, so the Doctor finally kisses Rose and absorbs all that time energy. The TARDIS leaves without Jack and the Doctor tells Rose that he's dying. Well, not exactly. Time Lords have a trick to cheat death, but it means he's going to have to change. And change he does, regenerating into David Tennant with a brand new set of teeth. And that was series one of Doctor Who. A series that looking back I do think did take a few episodes to really get going, which was probably by design in order to introduce new audiences. But once you hit Dalek at episode six, the show just gets amazing. Maybe excluding the long game, that episode wasn't very good. But every other episode is just one great episode after another at that point, culminating in a fantastic finale showing the true power and cruelty of the Daleks which many people would argue there's never been a better Dalek episode. And, I mean, we'll have to see just how true that claim is, but there's no denying that that was a fantastic Dalek story and just an amazing finale all round. But can this new Doctor, David Tennant, or whatever his name is, really be as good as Christopher Eccleston? I mean, how many shows recast the lead actor after one series? I don't know, but before we find out how good the next series is going to be, we're going to take a quick little intermission. Let's take a brief tangent now to look at the Doctor Who DVDs. Except when I first watched series one of Doctor Who, it wasn't live on TV or on DVD. No, I watched series one exclusively on Vs, UMDs, stupid little plastic tiny discs that would only play on the PlayStation Portable. After getting these on Christmas Day 2005, I ran upstairs, stuck on the episode Dalek and was immediately hooked. 
And thinking back, it was actually pretty clever of my parents getting me them on UMD, as around this time we moved house with my new house now being 45 minutes away from my school, which meant that pretty much every day I'd watch Doctor Who in the backseat of my car, over and over again, twice a day, on the way to school and back, and then sometimes at school too. I remember me and my friends would often sit in the playground huddled around with our blazers over us so that we could see the tiny dim screen and the speakers on a PSP are terrible, so we couldn't hear it either. I mean, it didn't matter, we knew the episodes off by heart. Also, I think I accidentally took my best friend's copy of Volume 2, as I have double of them and I'm missing Volume 1, so if you're watching this giant, let me know and you can have it back. Then, when Series 2 came out, they stopped releasing them on UMD, as I guess it had already died as a medium by that point. So I started getting them on DVD. But weirdly, they released Series 4 Volume 1 on UMD, like, they did all of Series 1, and then the first part of Series 4, I never understood that. And of course, it's super rare and expensive now. Anyway, when I moved over to getting them on DVD, I still had to get them at like two episodes at a time, as they were still releasing them in volumes. They were charging like £20 for this, and it didn't even have any special features. Sure, months later they'd release a complete series set with all of that for a more reasonable price, but I'd already wasted all my money by that point. I did eventually get the Series 1-4 to box set a few years later with all of the bonus features, which I'm not going to go too much into, but I do want to mention how all the UMDs and DVDs start off with the 2 Entertain logo, and I've made a whole video about how unnecessarily terrifying I find this logo. Turn it off, turn it off. I should probably just mention Doctor Who Confidential here, as this was a spin-off show that would air straight after each new episode of Doctor Who on BBC3, and give a detailed breakdown of how they made each episode, with behind the scene interviews, and it was really interesting. Episodes of Doctor Who Confidential were really long too, they initially started out as 30 minutes, but for series 3 onwards they increased to 45 minutes, which is just as long as the actual show, so they really had time to go in depth. I mean, there's not really much to say about this other than if you're re-watching the show, I recommend giving these a watch, as they are really interesting. And they do a really good job of showing you exactly what goes into making an episode of Doctor Who. So, before we take a look at the Christmas Invasion, there was actually an episode that came out before this. A seven minute long episode called Born Again aired as part of BBC's 2006 fundraising event Children in Need. So yeah, a lot of people, even possibly you, haven't even seen the first true episode with David Tennant. So let's take a look. This episode follows directly on from the ending of The Parting of the Ways and the newly regenerated Doctor is checking that everything is still there as Rose just stares baffled by what the hell just happened, confused by this man who's just swapped places with the Doctor, even going so far as to ask if he's a Slovene. This man proves he's still the Doctor by telling Rose how they first met, but it's just not good enough, and Rose asks if he can change back, which, um, he can't do. So the Doctor decides to take Rose home to Christmas Eve, and the Doctor's new body starts going all wrong, still leaking time vortex energy as the Doctor starts going all mad, crashing the TARDIS. And that's it, there's not really much in this little episode, although it does have some really nice moments of pathos in it, which help to convince Rose and also the audience that this man is still going to be the Doctor. And I don't know, but I think he might be quite good. The Christmas Invasion is the first of many Doctor Who Christmas specials airing on Christmas Day 2005. It begins with the TARDIS crashing into Christmas Eve. Both Mickey and Jackie come running after they hear the sound of the TARDIS and are confused at who this man stepping out of the TARDIS is. I mean, surely it's not the Doctor. But Rose confirms that it is in fact him. So they all take this brand new Doctor to Rose's flat to rest up as he keeps leaking out regeneration time energy. So this is where we get to both the best and worst thing about this episode. The Doctor just spends most of it asleep, which whilst giving all the secondary cast a chance to shine, as well as building up an almost infinite amount of anticipation to see the new Doctor in action, I do kind of just watch most of this episode and think, just get to the bit with the Doctor. Oh, also Harriet Jones is Prime Minister now, which is nice. Mickey begs Rose to just have a nice Christmas together without any mad alien stuff, and then 12 seconds later, some mad alien stuff happens with robot Santas attacking everything. The pair run home to find even more mad alien stuff in the form of an evil Christmas tree. But luckily the Doctor wakes up, if only for a minute, 
and immediately saves the day, confronting the robot Santas who quickly teleport away. The Doctor explains that something has detected all that energy that he's been leaking out and wants to use him as a battery and that an even bigger threat is on its way before then, you know, falling unconscious again. Meanwhile, Harriet Jones is sending up a space probe and it happens to find whatever's coming, broadcasting this across the news. Harriet Jones and unit, the alien army people, locate a spaceship that's heading for Earth and then receive another message from them, revealing that they're called Sycorax and warning the Earth to surrender or they will die. Harriet Jones asks unit if the doctor has been located, which he hasn't, and to get Torchwood on the phone, whoever they are. Christmas morning arrives and the Sycorax possess one third of people across the world, making them climb up to the top of buildings ready to jump. Turns out that probe they sent up contained blood samples of A-positive blood, and everyone with that blood type is now under the Sycorax's spell. Harriet Jones does the Queen's Christmas Day speech as the Queen's on the roof, and pleads for the Doctor's help. All the glass across London then shatters as the spaceship hits the atmosphere and appears above London. Without any better ideas, Rose and the gang take the Doctor and hide in the TARDIS, and Jackie makes some tea. The TARDIS then gets teleported to the Sycorax ship, as well as Harriet Jones and her lot. The Sycorax are all scary and turn some men to bones, but then the Doctor finally wakes up, ready to save the day. Nearly a full hour of anticipation, and oh, it was so worth it as the Doctor just owns the rest of the episode, chewing all the scenery and just frankly being a big ball of charisma. The Doctor presses the big red button making everyone jump off the edge, except they don't, because the Doctor knows that blood control is just like hypnosis and can't make people kill themselves. The Doctor quotes the Lion King for a bit. Sorry, that's the Lion King, but the point still stands. Then challenges the Sycorax leader to a sword fight. During the fight, the Sycorax leader cuts off the Doctor's hand, but the Doctor's still regenerating, allowing him to grow another. He finally beats the Sycorax, who tries to stab him in the back, but the Doctor ain't having none of that and sends the Sycorax falling to its death. The Doctor tells the Sycorax that Earth is defended, and they teleport home as the Sycorax ship runs away. Harriet Jones commands Torchwood to blow up the spaceship, which sets the Doctor off, ruining her political reign with only six words. So much for that three consecutive terms he mentioned earlier then. The Doctor changes clothes in the only other room of this TARDIS that we ever see, and has Christmas dinner with Rose, Jackie and Mickey, showing a good bit of growth from the Doctor who refused to have dinner with Rose's family and instead ran away only a few episodes earlier. And the episode ends with a bit of snow, except it's actually ash from the exploded spaceship, and Rose and the Doctor continue adventuring throughout the universe. I really like this episode. Russell T Davis was really good at doing big earthbound stories with a massive alien invasion. The only problem is, there wasn't enough David Tennant there. Like, he's the new main actor of this show, and yet you spend most of the episode with him asleep. This episode ends up amounting to one big prick tease with a pretty good ending. And I've got a feeling that this new Doctor is gonna be pretty good. But the Christmas Invasion wasn't the only Doctor Who content that we got on Christmas Day 2005. As once the episode finished, you could press the red button to play a special interactive adventure called Attack of the Grask. And if you're a regular viewer of this channel, then you'll know that I love me some red button content. So let's check this out. So the Doctor goes all POV and stares right into my soul as he tells us that he's dropped Rose off in 1979 to see an ABBA concert. And as such, we now get to be the companion. So the Doctor transfers his sonic screwdriver into our TV remote and we then use the TARDIS to look into people's homes, whilst ignoring all the dark implications raised by this. I mean, is the Doctor watching you now? Sitting there in your pants eating your crisps and not having moved in over an hour now? So let's just hope for your sake that he's not. So you use the TV remote to explore the house and find out who the imposter is. Then you have to select who you think that person is. And in this case, it's the mother. You can tell by the eyes. And it turns out that this thing, called a Grask, is possessing her. And starts possessing her husband as well. So, next thing to do is to fly the TARDIS, and we even get to learn what some of the different TARDIS controls are. We land in 1883, and have to locate the Grask in Victorian London. The Grask then possesses this kid, and disappears again. Now we follow the Grask all the way back to its home planet, and complete some puzzles on the way. Here we find all the Grask's victims, including a Slovene. The Grask spots you and fires, but misses, freeing the Slovene. You then get the most important choice that you're going to get in this game. The choice to send all the victims home or freeze everybody here. 
If you do decide to teleport everyone back, you get the good ending with everyone celebrating Christmas as Rock and Roller Christmas by Gary Glitter plays in the background. Hmm, maybe not the best ending then. Whereas if you choose to freeze everyone, everyone then stays grassified and Christmas is ruined. Although, ironically, no Gary Glitter this time, so swings and roundabouts. The Doctor then either congratulates you or scorns you and tells you to get out of his TARDIS. Though, there is a risk that if you switch to ITV tonight, the galaxy may implode. So... And that was Attack of the Grask, a game which really had massively higher production values for what it was. Like there was a whole Victorian set with snow, and all the CGI on the Grask's home planet, as well as the CGI Slovene. And the fact that they designed a new alien and the costume just for this game. I remember they eventually put this game up on the Doctor Who website, which is where I first played it. And me and my friends would take turns playing this game so often during break time at school. I don't think a playable version of this game has been archived anywhere, but playthroughs are available on YouTube. So you can still check it out if you're curious. Okay then, onto the proper start of Series 2 now with New Earth, where we finally get to see our first alien planet. Russell T Davies wanted to ease audiences in with Series 1, and as such we only got to see Earth and some space stations. But now the lid is fully off and we can now visit New Earth. Well, it's a step in the right direction. The year is 5 billion and 23, and those little spider things are back, once more being controlled by Cassandra. Okay, so not a lot of new stuff here then. Turns out the Doctor was summoned here by a message on his psychic paper, and so Rose and the Doctor go to this hospital to find out who sent it. Also, the hospital is run by cat people. Rose and the Doctor quickly get separated as Rose bumps into Cassandra, who managed to survive their last encounter by using a different piece of skin. She also has this little clone assistant guy looking after her now, which she created based on someone she once met. Cassandra then forces her consciousness into Rose and goes to find the Doctor. Meanwhile, the Doctor finds out who summoned him, the face of Bo, who's now dying of old age after millions of years, and is ready to impart his final message to the Doctor. But that's all gonna need to wait, because the Doctor notices that the hospital is curing diseases that shouldn't have cures yet, and so goes to investigate. Except first, Cassandra Rose chews off the Doctor's face for a little bit. Still got it. Once they're done with that, the pair soon find a secret area full of clones, infected with every single disease to act as lab rats for the cat people to research on. Cassandra Rose then knocks the doctor out as she intends to pump him full of the diseases and blackmail the hospital. But the cat people are all like, nah. So, slight change of plan, Cassandra Rose frees all the test subjects and Cassandra sticks her consciousness into the doctor. Then Rose, then the doctor, then one of the clones, then Rose again. It all gets a bit confusing. Although I do think they do quite a good job of showing a bit of humanity in Cassandra, as after being in one of the clones, she learns how alone they all feel. The Doctor sticks a load of medicine in the sprinkler systems and cures all of the clones. Sure is lucky slash convenient that none of these clones had diseases that didn't have cures for them yet. So all the clones are now free and all future medical research is kaput. The face of Bo decides not to die today and tells the Doctor that they'll meet one more time where he'll finally reveal his secret. And Cassandra agrees to leave Rose instead possessing her little clone man who's dying anyway and the Doctor takes her back to the past where she meets her younger self, telling her that she looks beautiful as she dies and here we get our third type of paradox. This is called the bootstrap paradox. Google it. So, with the bootstrap paradox, Cassandra had the idea for Chip because she had seen someone who looked like Chip many years before when she was still, like, not skin. So, she becomes Cassandra, makes Chip, goes into Chip, and then goes all the way back into the past so that she then meets herself and gives herself the idea for Chip, which raises the question of where did the design for Chip come from in the first place? Episode 2, Tooth and Claw. Now I'm going to level with you, I've always hated this episode. There are a few widely hated episodes in this series that we'll get to, but this has always been my least favourite, and as a result, I barely remember anything about it. Rose and the Doctor land in Scotland in 1879, where David Tennant gets to flex his genuine Scottish accent. And surprise, surprise, they immediately run into Queen Victoria. 
Rose gets so little to do this episode that she's mostly relegated to a single running joke of trying to make Queen Victoria say we are not amused. And even that's better than a lot of the characters get, it's just so dull and uneventful and boring and I hate it. Sorry, sorry, gotta give it a chance. So they all go to this big house called the Torchwood Estate and they find a telescope and there's some talk of werewolves. Rose and some staff at the house get trapped with a man who may or may not be a werewolf, no, no wait he is. But of course it's not really a werewolf, it's in fact an alien who can transfer its consciousness into the humans it bites. So that's our second story in a row now where the villain's trying to possess people. So this is our third story in a row now where the villain is trying to possess people. Fourth if you count Attack of a Grask. All written by Russell T Davies as well. He must have really had a thing for possession around this time. I don't know what possessed him, I'm, I'm sorry. And in this case the werewolf wants to bite and possess Queen Victoria. There's a lot of chase scenes, then the Doctor uses a diamond to focus the moonlight onto the wolf with the telescope, which in turn kills it. Queen Victoria then knights the Doctor and Rose, then banishes them for being weird, and finally says, I am not amused. Yes. And Queen Victoria sets up the Torchwood Institute in order to deal with weirdos like the Doctor. And that's it. It's not good. It's not even that bad. It's just nothing. The way more hated episodes of this series are at least memorable, but this episode is just... Ugh. Episode 3, School Reunion, starts with the Doctor being a physics teacher. He asks his class some questions and finds one kid is inhumanly clever. Rose also seems to be working at this school as a dinner lady. And it turns out they're both investigating this school after Mickey found a load of reports of UFOs here, as most of the people working at this school suddenly got replaced. And yep, something weird definitely is going on. I mean, look at this lesson. That's not my maths. That's not even cool maths games. But forget all that for the moment, because this woman is also investigating the school. Her name is Sarah Jane Smith, and the Doctor recognises her immediately. Turns out Sarah Jane used to be the Doctor's companion during the 70s, meaning this is the first proper link between the classic series and the new series. All of them go to check out the school at night, and Rose and Sarah Jane have a bit of a jealous rivalry. Also, all the teachers are bats. I repeat, all the teachers are bats. Sarah Jane shows the Doctor K-9, a robot dog that he used to have. How long, K-9? Insufficient data. Yeah, you never fucking know the answer, but it's important. And K-9 analyzes some of the oil from the school's food and says the bat people are crillitanes and are feeding the oil to the kids to make them intelligent. Sarah Jane and the Doctor have a conversation about how the Doctor just left her one day and never came back, and Rose asks if that will happen to her too. But the Doctor tells her that he won't age like Rose and so won't be able to stay with her forever. Rose and Sarah Jane then bond over their shared experiences, becoming friends, but oh no, all the kids get locked in the school and are all made to work on breaking the Skasis paradigm, a maths equation that will allow the Krillotanes to reshape the universe. The Krillotanes ask the Doctor to join them, promising that they'll bring back the Time Lords if he agrees, but the Doctor goes nah. Mickey then drives his car into the school with K-9, and K-9 fights off the Krillotanes. The Doctor realises that the Krillotanes are allergic to their own oil, so K-9 sacrifices himself by exploding the oil over all of them. Then the whole school blows up? How powerful was that oil? The Doctor offers to take Sarah Jane with him in the TARDIS, but she declines. Although, Mickey does ask if he can come, much to Rose's dismay. Rose is just not very nice, is she? Sarah Jane and the Doctor say their goodbyes, and we find out that the Doctor has rebuilt K-9. So, happy endings all round. Unless you're Rose, of course. I always used to really like this episode, mostly because, well, it was set in a school, and I used to play Doctor in school, and it made it really easy to pretend that all the teachers were Krillotanes, and it delves a little bit deeper into Rose and the Doctor's relationship. I don't know, I really like this one. I think it's great. Episode 4, The Girl in the Fireplace. The Doctor, Rose, and Mickey all land on a spaceship 3,000 years in the future. The ship is empty, but the Doctor notices that a load of energy is being used for something. And that something turns out to be an old fireplace with a little girl in it. Her name is Renette and she's from 1727, as it turns out the spaceship is using all that power to rip a hole into the past. So the Doctor goes through to check it out. Here the Doctor finds a broken clock. Which is weird as we can hear the sound of a clock ticking in the background. Just like in Stephen Moffat's previous story, The Doctor Dances, there's a noise that we don't notice until it's too late. And just like The Doctor Dances, it's something in a freaky mask. The Doctor fights it and we learn it's made of clockwork, but it quickly teleports away. 
The Doctor then travels back through the fireplace, except now time has moved on a good few years and Renette is now an adult, and not just any adult, the King's mistress, known as Madame de Pompadour, and she wastes no time in smashing her face against the Doctors. Rose and Mickey start finding a load of human bits in the spaceship, like a camera with an eye in it and this beating heart, whilst the Doctor finds even more doorways and meets a horse. What's a horse doing on a spaceship? Mickey, what's pre-revolutionary France doing on a spaceship? Get a little perspective. More doors, more clockwork droids, and we learn that the droids are in fact repair droids, who butchered their crew in an attempt to repair their ship. But they still need one more part, Renette. But she's not ready yet. So in order to try and find out some clues as to why Renette's not ready yet, and why the droids even want her in the first place, the Doctor links with Renette telepathically. Oh yeah, that's just something the Doctor can do. And he learns that the droids want her brain when she's 37 years old, as it'll be the same age as their ship, and then they can plug her brain in to control the ship. The Doctor and Renette then go and dance, drink and fall in love, as Rose and Mickey get chopped up for parts. Okay, not really, a drunk doctor shows up and saves them. Except, the droids have now found the right doorway to when Renette is 37. They invade a ball and try cutting off her head, but the doctor smashes through a time window on his horse. It's stupid, ridiculous, and cool as hell. Unfortunately, as the doctor's now smashed the time window, he severed the link to the spaceship, which also causes the droids to malfunction and then stop. But it also means the doctor is trapped here. Except, maybe not because due to a tiny little plot contrivance, Renette still has the fireplace and the Doctor is able to get back through it. The Doctor offers to take her with him in the TARDIS, but when he returns for her, it's too late. Time passed and she died. I've got to say, the music in this scene, and in fact throughout this whole episode, is great. Murray Gold wrote all the music for the show, and every episode and character and villain all got their own scores and motifs, and here the gentle piano really gives this episode a contemplative melancholy. Although I obviously can't play it here, but just trust me, it's great. Our heroes leave in the TARDIS, and we find out that the ship was called the SS Madame de Pompadour, explaining why the droids wanted Renette in the first place. All round fantastic episode, and one of the best. Episode 5, Rise of the Cybermen. I wonder what this one's going to be about. The episode begins with the TARDIS crashing out of the time vortex, across the void and into a parallel universe. And there's Zeppelin, so you know it's a parallel universe. But the TARDIS is now completely kaput. All apart from this one little power cell, which needs to charge before they can use it to go home. But why would they want to go home? Rose has just discovered that her dad is alive here, and rich. Curiosity soon gets the better of Rose, and she runs off to find her parallel parents. With the Doctor going after her, leaving Mickey as an afterthought as always. Mickey decides to go off to find his grandmother, who died five years ago, but is still very much alive in this universe. But during their reunion, he gets grabbed and chucked into the back of a van by some vigilante group that his parallel universe self is a part of, as in this universe, Mickey is London's number one most wanted criminal. Mickey soon meets this version of himself, a very angry version of himself called Ricky, who's currently trying to take down something called Cybus Industries. Cybus Industries is a company run by this guy, John Lumick, played by Roger Lloyd Pact. You know, the guy from Vicar of Dibley and Only Fools and Horses? Well, in this universe, he doesn't star in those shows. Instead, he's been doing some weird stuff with earpods controlling people and stealing homeless people off the street to cut them up and turn them into metal men. Meanwhile, Rose and the Doctor sneak into Parallel Jackie's birthday as waiters and find that Rose does exist in this universe, except here she's a dog. Mickey and his team are also keeping an arm of the party because of Pete's connection to Cybus Industries, and then Cybermen show up to crash the party. Remember that thing we saw in Dalek? Well, these are them. That's what the homeless people were being turned into, having their brains removed and put into these robots and their emotions taken away. The Cybermen tell everyone that they need to be upgraded to be like them, or else they'll be deleted. When everyone refuses, the Cybermen unsurprisingly start killing everyone, and the Doctor, Rose, Pete, and the Mickeys all find themselves surrounded by Cybermen. The following episode, The Age of Steel, starts with the Doctor using the TARDIS's power cell to blast the Cybermen, and they all escape in Ricky's van. We learn that Ricky might not be as cool as we first thought, as it turns out that he's London's most wanted for unpaid parking tickets. Meanwhile, John Lumick activates all the earpods, controlling everyone and making them go to his factory at Battersea Power Station to be upgraded. 
but Lumix's assistant doesn't want to be upgraded and so attacks him. The Cybermen quickly dispose of him, but John Lumix was gravely injured in the attack, so the Cybermen decide it's time to upgrade him. Our heroes decide to break into Batsy Power Station and Ricky gets killed by the Cybermen. Everyone splits into groups with Rose and Pete using fake earpods to blend in with the crowd, entering the factory where people are being cut open and their brains harvested. One of the Cybermen recognises Pete, as it turns out that this Cyberman used to be Jackie, which was a pretty disturbing moment for me as a kid. The Doctor and this woman break in underground, travelling down a tunnel of empty Cyberman suits. But it turns out that they aren't empty, and they start waking up. They escape through the tunnels just in time for another Cyberman to show up, and the woman, you don't need to learn her name, hits it with a bomb. The Doctor opens the Cyberman up and starts digging around inside to find a load of flesh and a damaged emotional inhibitor. As the emotional inhibitor no longer works, the Cyberman begins to regain its personality, asking where her fiancé is and reveals that she's supposed to be getting married in the morning. The Cyberman then starts repeating that they feel cold in another really disturbing scene. And then Bomb Woman gets killed. Told you that you didn't need to learn her name. Then the Doctor gets taken by the Cybermen for analysis on account of his two hearts. I've been captured, but don't worry, Rose and Pete are still out there, they can rescue me. Oh well, never mind. And the Doctor, Pete and Rose all meet John Lumick, who's now the Cyber Controller. Hey, yeah, Dave, you can sit here, I'm going. Mickey and this CBBC presenter go to the control centre in a Zeppelin, strangely guarded by a couple of humans rather than Cybermen. But there is one Cyberman on board the Zeppelin, whom Mickey tricks into smashing the earpod transmitter, causing everyone to regain control, with some people regaining consciousness mid-conversion. Again, Cyberman's stories are really disturbing. Mickey then discovers the code to deactivate all the Cybermen's emotional inhibitors and texts it to the Doctor, who transmits it to every Cyberman. The factory starts exploding, because of course it does, and everyone heads for the roof, with the Cyber Controller chasing after them. They start climbing onto the Zeppelin, but oh no, the Cyber Controller is also on the ladder. Pete uses the sonic screwdriver to break the rope, sending the Cyber Controller to a slow motion fiery grave. Rose tries telling Pete that she's his parallel daughter, but he freaks out and leaves. Mickey then tells the Doctor and Rose that he's decided to stay here and look after his gran, knowing he'll never see Rose again. Rose and Mickey say their tearful goodbye, and then Mickey decides to go to Paris, seemingly completely forgetting about his nan. All in all, I feel that was a pretty good reintroduction to the Cybermen, and a pretty good couple of episodes as a whole. And the great thing about setting this in a parallel universe really does mean that you can go as crazy as you want. You can have the stakes really high. You can basically destroy anything you want, kill anyone without too many consequences. But also, they had a parallel universe and all they really did was add some Zeppelins. I mean, come on, guys. And I've got to say, I just love the new Cyberman designs. I think they're so cool. Aren't you? Yeah. yeah. The Idiot's Lantern. It's 1953, the Queen's coronation, and everyone wants the next big thing, a television. Except these TVs are sucking people's faces off. And so cue the Doctor and Rose on a moped to fix everything. Including this family who are having a bit of trouble. You can tell by the numerous Dutch angles making everything seem a little bit off. These problems include a faceless nan and an abusive father who the Doctor gets into a shouting match with. I am talking! And I'm not listening! The men in black soon show up, take the nan and knock the doctor out. The doctor chases after them and soon finds a lot more faceless people locked up in cages. Meanwhile, Rose notices something weird going on with the television, so goes to the television shop where she meets Mr. Magpie and an entity called The Wire, who wastes no time in sucking Rose's face right off. So the Doctor goes to take down the wire before it can plug itself into a broadcasting tower and suck off everyone's face who's watching the coronation, eventually managing to trap the entity in a Betamax cassette. The wife from earlier throws out her abusive husband and Rose convinces the son to follow his abusive father to seemingly continue the endless cycle of abuse. Great moral there, Rose. Good job. A pretty middling episode in all honesty, but I've got to say, why was every shot in this episode a Dutch angle? Is this a homage to something? Just get the camera and there we go, isn't that better? This episode is what I would call the absolute definition of a skippable episode. I don't know anyone who goes out of their way to watch this one. It's just so bland and nothingy. The Impossible Planet. The Doctor and Rose land on a base on an alien world 
and find some writing in a language so ancient that even the TARDIS can't translate it. Then a load of these aliens show up, but it's fine because they're actually really nice. They're called the Ood and they're servants on this base, a slave race who crave to be ordered about. But there's not only the Ood as there's also people here too, and it turns out the planet that they're on is orbiting around a black hole, and it does that by emanating some kind of gravity field from a big old energy source underground. Which is why the base and these people are here in the first place, to drill down to find out what the energy source is. An earthquake then causes some of the space station to fall into the heart of the planet, and guess where the TARDIS was. Meaning that now the Doctor and Rose have no way home. Meanwhile, this man on the base called Toby is working as an archaeologist studying the ancient writing from earlier, and he starts hearing voices, a voice coming from behind him, telling him that if he turns around he'll die. Toby turns around and now the writing is all over his skin, and then, yep, he dies. Not only that, but the Ood now seem to be saying some very strange things. The beast and his armies shall rise from the pit to make war against God. I'm sorry? The Doctor and Rose discuss the fact they're stuck here together in a scene full of underlying unrequited love hinting to the idea that once they leave this planet they'll get a house together somewhere and perhaps even start a proper relationship. Then Rose receives a creepy text saying he is awake, so they check out the Ood and find them all repeating it, saying he is awake and you will worship him. Toby's back, he's found just chilling on the planet's surface without any air, and then he telepathically destroys more of the spaceship and kills this woman named Scooty in the process. Everyone finds Toby, who seems back to normal, and Scooty, who's definitely dead. The drill finally reaches the centre of the planet, and the Doctor volunteers to accompany this person called Ida to check out whatever's down there. The pair reach the bottom and find evidence of an ancient civilization, as well as an ominous hole in the ground that starts opening. But back on the surface, Toby goes all evil again and sends all his evilness into the Ood, who start killing everyone, as the planet goes all shaky again, wobbling out of orbit. The following episode, The Satan Pit, starts with everyone escaping the Ood. Well, most of them escaping the Ood. And Rose stops everyone from shooting Toby. I sure hope she doesn't end up regretting that decision. And even the Doctor feels something is wrong, so he decides to retreat and not go down into that big hole. Then that voice comes back, speaking through the Ood, announcing that they are in fact the devil, the actual devil, of every single religion from before the universe, and it knows stuff. It knows the Doctor killed his own kind, and it knows Rose is going to die very soon. Everyone starts freaking out, and the Doctor does his best to calm everyone down, but the cable to his capsule snaps, meaning that the Doctor and Ida are now stuck down there, without any communication, and only an hour of oxygen left. So Ida and the Doctor then use the broken cable so the Doctor can abseil down the pit. Because, I mean, what else are they going to do? The Ood start breaking through the doors, but the crew find that there's a way to transmit a telepathic signal that will knock out all the Ood. But they'll need to get to the other side of the base to do it. So they climb through the ventilation shafts as the captain pumps air through the different sections, and here come the Ood. We lose another member of the crew, but the rest reach the transmitter just in time to knock out all the Ood. Whilst Ab's sailing down the pit, the Doctor runs out of cable, but he can't just give up now, he's way too curious. After all, that thing said it was from before the universe, and he needs to find out if that's true. The Doctor tells Ida that if she sees Rose again, to tell her that he lie, except he doesn't finish the fort. Simply saying that she already knows. Before then cutting the rope and falling into the abyss. The crew begin evacuating the base, but Rose refuses to leave without the Doctor. So they just knock her out and drag her onto the escape rocket anyway. Turns out the Doctor somehow survived the landing, even now being able to breathe down here. He finds cave paintings of people trapping the beast, and then the Doctor finds him. Chained up, the actual devil, with horns and everything. The Doctor tries talking to it, but it's just a body without a voice, because its mind is still inside Toby. Again, well done Rose for stopping him getting shot. You really have been making some bad decisions lately. The Doctor works out that if the beast were to escape, the planet would fall into the black hole. This being a foul safe created by the people who originally trapped him. So the Doctor decides to free the beast, causing the rocket to also be pulled into the black hole. Toby goes all devil again, breathing fire, but Rose shoots the rocket's windscreen. Do rockets have windscreens? Anyway, it sends Toby flying off into the black hole, properly killing him for good this time. The Doctor finds the TARDIS, rescues Ida, and pulls the rocket back on course. Now, this was a very weird episode. Like, as much as they try to leave it ambiguous, 
The Doctor met the Devil. He fought and beat the Devil. Like, Dalek, Cybermen, sure, but the Devil? Where do you go from there? Well, let's talk about a little episode called Love and Monsters. The punching bag of the Doctor Who fandom, and maybe the most hated of all the episodes. This episode is the first of many Doctor Light episodes. Due to the hectic filming schedule with Doctor Who, they came up with the idea of having an episode each series from someone else's perspective with very little presence from the main cast, meaning you'd theoretically be able to film multiple episodes at the same time. And this episode stars Mark Warren as Elton, a man who's documenting his run-ins with the Doctor, starting here in this Doctor Who-style Scooby-Doo parody. I mean, I already made this joke with the Slovene episode, but this is just so much more overt, so alright, let's do it again. Happy. So Elton stumbles upon the Doctor and Rose fighting a thing called a Hoix, and whilst that's not important now, it will be on the test later. But yeah, the Doctor and Rose fight the Hoix, and Elton runs away. He explains to us that this wasn't the first time he met the Doctor, as he'd previously met him as a child when he found the Doctor in his house, just standing there, being ominous. He also talks about being present during the Auton invasion, seeing the Slovene ship crashing into Big Ben, and Christmas Day with the Sycorax. And it really does a great job of making this world feel lived in. And Mark Warren does an even better job of selling that he's just some normal person, just vlogging his experiences. Elton then goes on to meet Ursula and a few others who are also interested in finding the Doctor. They form a group called London Investigation and Detective Agency. Linda for sure. And we spend some time getting to know them all and really care for all these characters. And I gotta say, up to this point, this is a really, really good episode. It's unique, charming, I'm invested in all the characters. But then he shows up. Peter Kay playing this bombastic weirdo called Victor Kennedy who doesn't like being touched. He's also investigating the Doctor and makes himself the leader of this group, determined to find the Doctor by any means necessary. Also, Bliss, this girl from the group, soon disappears. Victor gives Elton this picture of Rose and tasks him with finding her, which brings him to Jackie, who quickly starts flirting with Elton and immediately drags him back to her flat. Also, Bridget, this woman from the group, disappears as well. Jackie and Elton drink, get pizza, and are about to get it on, but then Jackie finds the photo of Rose in Elton's pocket and tells him to go. Elton tells Victor off, saying that the group isn't fun anymore, and that he and the other remaining members are quitting. Then later, Elton and Ursula return to find Victor hiding behind a newspaper, because he's a thing called an Absorbaloff, and he's absorbed all the other members of the group. Look, I'm not saying that some of the hatred for this episode isn't warranted. I mean, just look at it. It looks like it was designed by a child. Well, that's actually because it was. The Absorbaloff was originally designed by a nine-year-old William from Essex as part of a Blue Peter competition. The Absorbaloff then absorbs Ursula. She tastes like chicken. Okay, okay, look. A lot of the hatred for this episode is warranted. I mean, he's wearing a thong for God's sake. So, the Absorbaloff goes to absorb Elton, but then the Doctor and Rose show up. The Doctor convinces all the faces to fight back. And Elton smashes the Absorbaloff's cane, causing the Absorbaloff to be absorbed into the ground. I'm saying absorb too much, it's losing all meaning. The Doctor tells Elton the reason he was in his house as a boy, because he was fighting a shadow that had killed his mother, something that Elton had seemingly repressed. Then the Doctor manages to bring back Ursula. Kind of. Where she now gets to spend the rest of eternity being a face in a paving slab. I've even got a bit of a love life. Oh, let's not go into that. Okay, most of the hatred for this episode is warranted. Look, I'm sorry, I don't hate this episode. There's a lot to like here. I like the different perspectives of the Doctor Universe. It is just unfortunately brought down by the Absorbaloff, which is a fucking terrible design. And also there's the whole thing with the paving slab and the oral sex. And uh, it's just, it's not good, is it? I'm sorry. Fear Her takes place in the far off distant year of 2012. It was announced around the time of this episode that the Olympics would be coming to London in 2012, so this episode capitalised off of this by making a pretty safe prediction of what six years in the future would be like, and some not so safe predictions, like X Factor winner Shane Ward still being relevant. Although, actually, he last released an album in 2015, and starred in Coronation Street for three years. What? Alright, my apologies Doctor, I won't question your predictions ever again. 
Also, this episode has the best TARDIS landing ever. Ah. So there's this street and children are going missing and this girl, Chloe Webber, is the cause. As she's trapping everyone in her drawings, she also scribbles out one of the drawings which causes a scribble monster to appear in the real world and attack Rose. The doctor kills the creature and analyses it, discovering it's made of graphite, or pencil lead, like a child's drawing. So they visit Chloe. Now, the biggest criticism most people have with this episode is just how obnoxious Rose and the Doctor are in it. They've slowly been becoming more cocky and arrogant throughout Series 2, and this is the height of it. Like, how are we supposed to find tension and drama in the plot if the Doctor and Rose are too far up their own asses to care? Okay, I'm exaggerating a bit, but look, the Doctor just sticks his hand in this family's marmalade. There's too many asides and wisecracks which suck up any sincerity here. I mean, what is this? A Marvel movie? Thank you, thank you. Chloe has also been drawing pictures of her dead abusive father, who also tries attacking Rose. So the Doctor speaks to whatever entity is inhabiting Chloe Webber, and it turns out that it's a creature called an Isolus, but got split up from its family and fell to Earth. The Doctor also reveals that he was once a father in a throwaway line. Easy for you to say, you don't have kids. I was a dad once. What did she say? And they locate the Isolus' spaceship. But oh no, Chloe draws the Doctor and the TARDIS, trapping them in a drawing. So Rose has to retrieve the spaceship on her own. And this man says council a lot. You just took a cancel act from a cancel van, and now you're picking up a cancel Rose! <gasps> I'm reporting you to the cancel! Chloe draws the Olympic Stadium, trapping everyone inside, and then starts drawing the whole world. So Rose axes down her door. Here's Johnny! <laughs> Through the drawing, the Doctor tells Rose to put the spaceship into the Olympic torch, and the Isolus leaves, bringing all the drawings back to life. Even the drawing of Chloe's dead dad. And then the episode gets a bit weird. Chloe, I'm coming to hurt you! Chloe's mum sings to her, calming her down, which makes the dead dad monster disappear. And I'm kind of surprised that Rose wasn't on the side of the abusive dad this time. Then the Doctor takes the Olympic torch and lights the flame, starting off the Olympic ceremony. And because of this scene, I'm still annoyed that David Tennant never carried the Olympic flame. And they instead got future Doctor Matt Smith to do it. Which, you know, it should have been David. The episode ends with the Doctor going all ominous and saying that a storm's approaching, teasing the finale. So, just like Boomtown in the series before, it does seem like the episode just before the final they try to make a bit comedic, but... Uh, I didn't find this one too funny. The characters are just too obnoxious, too mean-spirited... And uh, I didn't like this one. I, I don't like it at all. And I don't think many people do. Especially when you try and play off comedy with also really real abusive fathers. Uh, it's not good. Army of Ghosts, part one of a great big finale of series two, starts with Rose ominously talking about how she died while standing in this afterlife plane. Maybe it's heaven. I don't know. But it's a bloody good opener and it's got my attention. So back in the present, Rose goes home to visit her mum and look at the character development here. The Doctor and Jackie are absolute besties. Jackie tells them that Rose's grandfather is coming to visit, despite being dead. And then he does, he shows up as a ghost, as do a load of more ghosts. Turns out these ghosts have just been showing up for months. And so, in classic Russell T Davies style, let's watch some TV. And here we have some cameos from TV shows like Trisha, Most Haunted and EastEnders. These ghosts show up at specific times working on shifts that are controlled by the Torchwood Institute. Remember that thing Queen Victoria set up? The people who shot down the Sycorax? Well, they're in charge of the ghosts, and they've also got this big sphere, which isn't too important right now. But we will get back to it later. What is important right now, though, is this woman called Adiola, who works for Torchwood and has a secret boyfriend called Gareth. They both sneak off to an out-of-bounds area and run into a Cyberman. That's right, the Cybermen are back. Meanwhile, the Doctor goes all Peter Venkman and busts one of these ghosts. Who are you gonna call? Yeah, I hate little ghosts. Discovering its point of origin in the process. The Doctor goes to find it and utters the first use of his new catchphrase. I don't see. Believe me, you'll be hearing that a lot. Look sharp, Rose Tyler, Alonzi. And that would be really brilliant if I met someone called Alonzo, because then I could say Alonzi, Alonzo, every time. Also, Jackie just happens to still be here. They arrive, the Doctor steps out of the TARDIS and receives a standing ovation. I mean, after all, the place was set up because of him. 
Also, these two are now back, and they've got some fancy new earpods. They start bringing others to the Cybermen where they've set up their own little factory. The Doctor and Jackie are given a tour of the place by this woman, Yvonne Hartman, and are shown all kinds of alien tech, including these magna clamps and the sphere, which the Doctor identifies as a void ship. A vessel that exists outside of time and space, designed to travel between universes through a place called the Void. We learn that the sphere turned up through a gap in reality, and then the ghost showed up after. So Torchwood decided to build a skyscraper around the sphere, also known as Canary Wolf. The Doctor explains that the universe is cracked, and letting the ghost through is dangerous. Too many ghosts. And surprisingly, Yvonne listens to him, stopping the next ghost shift. But our ear-potted friends start it anyway. The Doctor tries stopping them, but it's too late. So he tracks the signal in the earpods to the Cybermen, who make a nice little reference here to their 1967 story, Tomb of the Cybermen. Meanwhile, Rose grabs some psychic paper and goes exploring, finding the Void Ship. And that's not all she finds, as look who's working here, Mickey. But then, oh no, the void ship begins opening, but Mickey is ready for whatever's inside. Cyber leader, cyber king, emperor of the Cybermen, whatever it is, he's dead meat. The ghosts start coming through all the way, revealing that they were Cybermen all along, showing up everywhere, all over the world. Except for the void ship, because that doesn't contain Cybermen, no. It contains something far worse, something that made my nine-year-old self scream with excitement. Daleks, and there's even a fancy new black one, which admittedly had been spoiled a few months earlier on the BAFTAs. Oh my god, what a cliffhanger. You've got Daleks, you've got Cybermen, you've got Mickey coming back. Oh, this is just set up for such a good finale. Granted, not much actually happened throughout the course of this episode, but that cliffhanger just saves it. I oh, so, so good. Okay then, on to Doomsday, the series finale, and Rose is back chatting to us from the afterlife, reiterating that she's definitely gonna die. The Daleks go all exterminate but Rose stops them, telling them that they have information on the Daleks and the Time War, and if they kill them, then they'll never find out what it is. Also, the Daleks now have this thing called a Genesis Arc, whatever that is, but they seem pretty excited about it. Meanwhile, the Cybermen demand global surrender, starting war against humankind. The Daleks kill this guy, sucking out all his knowledge, and the Cybermen go to see what's going on. And then, for the first time in 40 years, the Daleks and Cybermen meet. A very exciting moment for me as a kid, or as Mickey describes it, It's like Stephen Hawkins meets the speaking clock. The Cybermen propose an alliance, but the Daleks decline, killing the Cybermen with ease. It would have been nice if they were a bit more evenly matched, but no, the Daleks are just way better. Jackie and Yvonne get taken for upgrading, Poor Jackie, getting upgraded twice in one series. Nah, not really. She escapes really easily. Jake, the CBBC presenter, shows up, now having a teleporter that allows him to hop between universes. And he and the Doctor travel to Parallel Torchwood, where they meet Pete, who explains how the Cybermen all escape from their world into our world, and asks the Doctor to close the gap between them. So they all head back, and the Doctor surrenders to the Cybermen, and they team up to fight the Daleks. The Daleks reveal that the Genesis Arc was created by the Time Lords, and tell Rose that they need her handprint to open it, the one thing a Dalek can't do. Rose goes to do it, but then instead decides to boast to the Daleks that she killed their Emperor, and they decide to exterminate her. But then of course the Doctor shows up, recognising that these are in fact a secret order of Daleks called the Cult of Scarrow, and they even have names. Dalek Fay, Dalek Sec, Dalek Jask, Dalek Khan. Which I always found interesting that in the Doctor Who trading card game Battles in Time, messed up the name for Dalek Jast and called him Dalek Rabe. Who the hell is Dalek Rabe? Get out of here, Dalek Rabe. Then the Doctor blows open the doors and the Cybermen start attacking the Daleks, again, not killing a single one. Oh, and because the plot needs it, Mickey just happens to slip and touch the Genesis Arc anyway. Our heroes escape, finding Jackie on the way, and Jackie and Pete have a nice little moment. Whilst, yes, obviously the main stars of the show are the Daleks and the Cybermen, it's nice that we get these little character moments as well. Okay, fine, back to the action, and just take a look at some of these background CGI Cybermen, because they die really dramatically. Look at them go! The Doctor sneaks in and nicks the Magna Clamps from earlier, and the Daleks take the Genesis Arc to the skies as it opens, firing out millions of Daleks who start killing everyone. As it turns out, the Genesis Arc was bigger on the inside, and a Time Lord prison ship. 
But the Doctor is ready and finally explains what's up with the glasses that he's been wearing the last couple of episodes. The glasses see void stuff. Anything that's travelled between universes is contaminated with void stuff. The Daleks, the Cybermen and our heroes. So the Doctor intends to open the gap between worlds which will suck back in all the void stuff, including the Daleks, the Cybermen and our heroes. Which is why the Doctor tells Rose and the others to go to the parallel world whilst he stays, hoping to hold on to the Magna Clamps to stop himself from getting sucked in. Rose obviously refuses and comes back, despite never being able to see her family ever again. You will never be able to see her again, your own mother! I made my choice a long time ago and I'm never gonna leave you. The Cybermen come to stop the Doctor's plan, but Yvonne Cyberman stops them, somehow still having her emotions and even being able to cry. I mean, it's a cool image with the teardrop, but it doesn't really make much sense. So the Doctor and Rose open the gap and all the Daleks and Cybermen get pulled inside, except for Dalek Sec, who teleports away just in time. But oh no, the gap begins to close again, so Rose lets go of the Magna Clamp to reactivate it, but in the process she gets pulled into the void. Oh, wait, no, no she doesn't. Pete shows up to save her, that's what I meant to say. He takes Rose back to the parallel universe, separating the Doctor and Rose forever. A little while later, Rose starts hearing the Doctor calling to her in her dreams, so she follows the voice, all the way to this beach in Norway called Bad Wolf Bay, where the Doctor is able to project himself through a tiny little gap in reality to say goodbye. The Doctor tells Rose that she's legally dead in our universe, so a bit of a cop out, only technically being dead. Rose tells the Doctor that she loves him, and the Doctor is about to say it back. Rose Tyler. But the gap closes, leaving the Doctor alone. Except wait, no, not alone. Catherine Tate in a wedding dress is here, and the Doctor says what a lot. What? And that's it, that's the end of series two. Series two was the first series that I ever watched live, and whilst there certainly are a few episodes in this series that I just don't like, overall I can't help but just love series two. And I fully admit that I am completely nostalgia blind. Like, watching it back now, I can totally see that Rose and the Doctor's relationship was not healthy, and Rose was becoming a little bit unbearable towards the end but I still can't help but choke up a bit during her goodbye. Like, out of all the David Tennant series, I think this one's by far the weakest, but it's still bloody good. 2006 was a pretty weird time. We were still a couple of years away from the iPhone revolution, so phones still look like this. Phones were also starting to connect to the internet, mostly just to download terrible ringtones or wallpapers, or be scammed into subscription services like Jamstar. That... Damn, Frog tricked us all. Well, Doctor Who also released some stuff. I remember downloading sound clips of a Dalek saying exterminate through WAP and just listening to them on a loop. Not only that, but with Series 2, the BBC also released something called TARDISodes, something that I used to have to download from the Doctor Who website, plug in my old Nokia N91 into it, and then copy the file over, all so I could watch a minute-long prologue to the new episode airing that week. It was a stupidly tedious process in retrospect, but it was worth it for the new footage recorded specifically for these TARDISodes. And they'd often give these episodes a little bit more context. I mean, you could also text the number and download them directly, but it was super expensive, and I only had a £10 top-up card once every blue moon. Get adventure you won't see on TV with the latest TARDISode. Available now. Just text TARDIS to 81010 or go to bbc.co.uk slash Doctor Who. So let's check these out. There's not too much to say about these, so I'll just go through them in order. We get an advertisement for New Earth Hospital, there's one with the werewolf attacking some guy, and I think that's a new CGI shot made specifically for this Tardisode, which is pretty impressive. This one has Mickey looking up UFOs online and finding out about the Krillotane school. Okay, so this one's legitimately pretty good because we get to see the actual crew from the ship in Girl in the Fireplace before the clockwork droids began butchering them. And this one's really not bad. They must have had to hire all these actors specifically just for this Tardisode. Here's a little random explanation of what Cybermen are, mostly using footage from the episode, so this one's pretty lazy. As is the next one, which is an explanation of Lumic and Cyber Industries. Also pretty lame. This one for the Idiot's Lantern gives us a bit more backstory as we actually get to see the grandmother getting her face sucked off. Here's a woman talking about the impossible planet and sending a man named Captain Walker off to investigate it. But he wasn't in the episode, so are we just to assume that there was a previous failed mission there? Because that's not at all what was stated in the episode. 
I don't know, but it's still one of the better ones with a whole new set and characters. The next TARDIS episode is actually a follow up to the last one where we learn that Captain Walker died and then this guy gets all beastified. So this is the same mission and Toby wasn't the first person to be possessed, which puts a totally different spin on the episode. Why was none of this mentioned in the Impossible Planet or Satan Pit? Why when they saw Toby get all possessed they weren't just like, oh yeah, this has happened before? This one has the Absorbaloff tracking Linda and then absorbing his maid. Uh, seems like the Absorbaloff was doing pretty well for himself. Here's a fake documentary looking at all the kids who went missing in the episode Fear Her, and I like how they put in the most fake phone number ever. Yeah, because you don't want your kids phoning a real number and getting charged. Get it? Because that's literally what the Tardisodes were. Here this journalist is investigating Torchwood, and then gets taken by a Torchwood. And, I don't know, presumably killed. Then, the last one is the only one I actually remember, as I must have watched it a hundred times. It's a news broadcast about the Cyberman invasion, using footage from the episode, and then a Dalek breaks in and kills the presenter. This one was my favourite purely because we got to see the briefest little glimpse of a Dalek. Well, that was the Tardisodes. I'm guessing they weren't all that successful, or maybe it was just that touchscreen phones were starting to become popular with proper web browsers, so this kind of thing just became outdated. Not too sure, but they were certainly a fun little distraction for me as a kid to keep me hyped for the next episode. Do you remember that game show that they parodied in the episode Bad Wolf called The Weakest Link? Well, if you're not from the UK, that reference was probably lost on you, but I think it's pretty fair to say that at the time, this was a very popular show in the UK. So popular, in fact, that there was a Doctor Who special featuring the stars of the show taking part. And it was fine. I mean, it was still a game show, but... I remember that David Tennant kept cheating and helping everyone with his Doctor Who knowledge, which was pretty funny. In electronics, the device used by Nick Briggs to convey the voice of the Daleks is called a ring what? Modulator. Did you help him? No. <laughs> I'm deaf in my right ear. Are you pretending you helped him? <laughs> Time's up. Overall, it was just fine, but I only really recommend looking for it if you're really desperate for Doctor Who content and you've run out of everything else. Following series 2 of Doctor Who, the show was massively popular. And so there was demand for more Doctor Who content. And so that's exactly what happened, in the form of two spin-off shows. With the first of these being Torchwood. Yeah, like Torchwood, the people who caused all the Cybermen and Daleks to show up. Well, the word Torchwood is what Doctor Who was originally labelled under during production to stop people from stealing and leaking it, as Torchwood is in fact an anagram of Doctor Who. Whoa, I know, mind blown, right? So, Torchwood was a spin-off starring John Barrowman as Captain Jack Harkness. After Rose revived him in the Series 1 finale, The Parting of the Ways, we never really got to find out what happened to him, but all that is about to change with this show. The show was aimed at a more adult audience than Doctor Who, airing on BBC Three, but that was also kind of the problem with it. I think it tried maybe too hard to be adult, and as a 10 year old when the first season came out, I remember watching the first couple of episodes and going, yeah, this isn't for me, and noped my way right out of there. Then a few years later I eventually sat down and watched the whole of series one properly, and still didn't like it. So let's see if my opinions on it has changed all these years later. So let's crack on then and check out episode 1, Everything Changes. Where we're quickly introduced to Gwen Cooper, a police officer working in Cardiff who's investigating a murder. But then a special ops unit known as Torchwood shows up, headed by this familiar face in a long coat. Gwen spies on them and watches as they temporarily bring the victim back from the dead. They ask him who killed him, but he didn't see. Then Jack asks what he saw when he died, and the man says there's nothing. So, a pretty cheery way to start the show. We're then introduced to Gwen's partner, who seems really nice, and Gwen can't seem to stop thinking about what she just saw. The next day, Gwen sees Jack at a hospital, and follows him, but instead finds this thing, which then brutally murders this man. See all the blood spraying out right here? Yeah, that's the kind of thing you wouldn't see in normal Doctor Who. Jack rescues Gwen, but then drives off as Gwen continues following him to the centre of Cardiff, but soon loses him. She asks at a nearby pizza restaurant if they ever deliver to Torchwood, which they do, and so goes to visit them, pretending to deliver a pizza. 
and she gets invited inside where she sees their big sci-fi base, complete with a severed hand in a jar and a pterodactyl. Turns out they've all been watching her this whole time and Jack explains everything, showing her that thing they now have locked up, telling Gwen that it's an alien called a weevil. And then we get introduced to the rest of the Torchwood team, including... Actually, I'll just let Jack do it. Owen Harper, Gwen Cooper. Doctor Owen Harper, thank you. Toshiko Sato, computer genius. Susie Costello, she's second in command. And this is Yanto Jones. Yanto cleans up after us and gets us everywhere on time. I try my best. Jack and Gwen take an invisible lift back to the surface, and Jack explains that the original Torchwood was destroyed after all that stuff with the Daleks and Cybermen, so they set up a new base in Cardiff, as it's where the Rift is. Remember the Rift, that thing that the TARDIS used to charge that time? Well, aliens and other spacey things often slip through the Rift, such as the Weevils, which therefore makes this a great place for Torchwood to use as their base. Jack then drugs Gwen with an amnesia pill, making her forget everything when she falls asleep. The next day, Gwen goes back to work and another police officer shows her what the murder weapon that killed that guy at the beginning would have looked like. And Gwen knows she's seen it before, but can't quite remember where. She just knows to go back to the centre of Cardiff, where she then finds Susie, the one in charge of the resurrection glove. Who, yes, has the murder weapon on her. Turns out she was killing people just so she could test the glove out on them. So she then goes to kill Gwen, but Jack was standing on the invisible lift the whole time and saw everything. So Susie then shoots him. Dead. But no, wait, hang on, Jack's alive. It turns out that after Rose brought him back to life, she made him immortal. So Susie then shoots herself, and she is properly dead. Gwen then remembers everything, and Jack offers her a job at Torchwood. I think this was a pretty okay first episode, it had to set up a lot of things obviously. And yes, there were a few extra adulty bits in this, like there was a load of swearing. And there was even this whole subplot that I didn't even mention with one of the Torchwood team, Owen, using this alien aphrodisiac aftershave to get off with all these people. And I don't know, I just feel like some of the adult themes are just a little bit forced. Like, this story doesn't need to be just for adults. It's just all the adult stuff is crowbarred in. And Russell T. Davis has even confirmed that. He said he put in a load of extra swear words near the beginning of the episode just as a kind of warning to parents to not let their kids watch this. I just hope that in future episodes they focus less on the try-hard adultiness and more on just telling a good story. Which, if you've seen episode two, well, let's just get it over with, shall we? Day one shows us Gwen's first day at Torchwood and they're tracking a meteorite that's crashed. Something comes out of a meteorite and possesses this girl, which then makes her bang this guy to dust. <sighs> this was the point I turned it off as a kid. I thought if someone walks in now, I can't explain this. The Torchwood team then interviews the security guard of a nightclub, and we then get to see him masturbating to the footage. Great, that's, that's just fantastic. The following day, the girl is trying to fight off the alien, but ends up trying to bang the postman instead. Luckily, or unluckily, I, I, I don't know, Torchwood shows up and captures her. Turns out the alien feeds off of orgasm energy. Look, I'm not even making that up. Right, sorry, just to recap, you've travelled here to feed off orgasmic energy. There's nothing else out there like it. Oh, and then if that wasn't enough, Gwen starts getting off with it. Do you see what I mean now about this show being unnecessarily adult? Later, a naked Owen is found in the cell as the girl lured him in there and then stole his keys. Jack fights her and tries to stop her escaping, but then she breaks Jack's hand, the one in the jar, and then escapes onto the streets. Owen warns everyone that if they don't find her soon, she'll quite literally explode, and the girl goes off to see her ex-boyfriend, again getting it on with him, sucking out all his orgasm energy, and turning him to dust. And then she heads to a fertility clinic. Where she, what's a nice way of saying this, um, unfriendly sexes this gay guy. And then does the same to the whole clinic. Torchwood shows up and Gwen offers it her body to possess in exchange for letting the girl go. And as it's about to go into Gwen, Owen captures it. And without a host, the sex mist quickly dies. What the hell was that? I mean, that is the absolute low point of the Russell T Davis era. I mean, who wrote that episode? Oh, right. Well, I sure hope we don't hear any more from him. In Ghost Machine, Gwen is chasing down this guy called Bernie, and he gets away but drops this device. Which, when Gwen touches, makes this little evacuee kid appear. Pretty weird stuff. 
Torchwood then used the name around the kid's neck to find the kid in the present day, who's now an old man. And they quickly confirm that that's definitely the same boy that Gwen saw. Just older. So everyone goes searching for that guy Gwen was chasing, Bernie, but they can't find him anywhere. Then the device activates again when Owen touches it, and he sees this woman getting murdered by this guy. So it seems that the device is showing moments from the past. Like when Gwen takes the device home and uses it to re-experience all the happy moments she shared with her boyfriend. Owen goes to the murderer's house as he never got caught and confronts him about what he did, before then getting thrown out. As he leaves, Owen spots Bernie and chases him down. Bernie explains that he's been using the device to find out people's secrets to blackmail them and there's a second half to the device, one that shows the future. Gwen uses this half of the device and sees herself covered in blood holding a knife and saying Owen's name. That old murderer goes to Bernie's house as it turns out he was blackmailing him too. And he now thinks that Owen was working with Bernie and was trying to get more money out of him. He tries to stab Gwen and Bernie but Jack and Owen then grab him and Owen takes the knife away, ready to kill him. But it's okay, he doesn't do it. I mean, not that it matters too much as the guy just runs into the knife and dies anyway making the future that Gwen saw come true. This one was pretty good. It didn't try to be overly adult and sexual, it just tried to tell an interesting story. Let's hope the next episode follows this trend. Oh, for God's sake! In Cyberwoman, we learn that Ianto used to work at Canary Wharf in the original Torchwood, and was there during the Cybermen and Dalek invasion, pulling his girlfriend out of the wreckage mid-conversion. And Deanto's now hiding her in New Torchwood, where she's barely holding on to life. Wait, shouldn't she have been sucked into the void? Maybe it was only the original Cybermen who came through that got sucked into the void. But then, if she didn't get sucked in, presumably neither did any of the other newly converted people in Doomsday? Just how many Cybermen are still out there? Actually, while we're on the subject, someone mentioned recently something about Doomsday which totally ruins the story. And that is, what happened to the TARDIS? because the TARDIS went through the void, but wasn't sucked back in. And as that is the case, why didn't the Doctor, Rose and her family just hide inside the TARDIS? We didn't need all those Magna Clamps or Rose to go to a parallel world, they could have just all stayed inside the TARDIS. Doomsday makes literally no sense now, and learning that has just totally ruined Rose's ending for me. Anyway, Ianto brings in this guy who might be able to fix his girlfriend, but look at her, that's not even how Cybermen convert people. They remove the brain, they don't put them in lingerie. What pervert Cyberman designed this? So this guy does manage to save her somehow. I mean, she's still half Cyberman, but at least she can walk now. Then the rest of the Torchwood team show up, so she has to go back into hiding. And then to thank this guy for all his hard work, she tries and fails to upgrade him, killing him. Leaving Ianto now tasked with removing his body. The rest of the team go looking for Yanto and find all the cyber equipment and the cyber woman, who then knocks out Owen and tries upgrading Gwen. Tosh cuts the power to the conversion unit, but in doing so also cuts all the power to Torchwood, which then puts the base into lockdown, and everyone is then rightfully annoyed at Yanto. But Yanto isn't about to give up on the woman he loves, or at least he doesn't until she tries killing him and everyone else, even successfully killing Jack a few times. Owen and Gwen kiss, fearing they're both about to die, but then Jack covers the Cyberwoman in barbecue sauce and calls his pterodactyl down, which eats her as everyone escapes in the lift. Yanto punches Jack in the face and goes back to try and save his girlfriend, but finds her dead. Except, not really, as she's actually put her brain inside this woman, and everyone shoots her because that's just too messed up. This wasn't a bad episode, and I like the way it really divides the team, but it's just ruined by the design of the Cyberwoman. How am I supposed to take that seriously? The episode Small Worlds has this little girl who's about to get kidnapped, but is then saved by some fairies, who then chase down Nancy Magoo and fill him up with, what is that, petals? Meanwhile, Jack and Gwen are going to this talk by Jack's old friend Estelle about fairies. Well, isn't that a nice coincidence? And it turns out that Estelle used to date Jack's father during the Second World War. Jack explains that these fairies aren't aliens, as they do in fact come from Earth, but they are dangerous. Nancy Magoo goes to the police and admits he's a bit of a wrong'un. He gets locked up, but the fairies get to him anyway. So Torchwood get called in, and they find the man all having been suffocated with petals. Estelle phones Jack, telling him that the fairies are attacking her as well now, and they get to her house to find her dead. 
Here Gwen realises that it wasn't Jack's father Estelle was in love with, but Jack himself. And Jack admits that yeah, he did meet her during World War II. And the pair fell in love before Jack obviously left with the Doctor. So when he showed up again in modern day, he pretended to be his own son in order to still be close to her. Gwen goes home to find that the fairies have ransacked her home also, and it turns out that little girl from earlier is friends with the fairies and starts using the fairies to attack some bullies at her school. And then her stepdad, who admittedly was horrible. And Torch would show up just in time to see the man die. The fairies then try taking the girl away with them and threaten to kill everyone if they don't get her. So Jack just gives the girl to them and the episode sort of just ends with everyone being mad at Jack. Like, he didn't even really try, he just gave the little girl to the fairies. I'm starting to see a pattern here where these episodes just aren't going to have happy endings. I come away from them just feeling kind of depressed and I feel like if they're going to keep doing it and it does become the norm, then these gut punch endings are just going to become a lot less impactful and the entire show as a whole might just become a load of depressing unenjoyableness. Countryside. I have very vague memories of this one, although they are memories of hating it. So Torchwood are investigating 17 disappearances within a 20 mile radius, so they decide to go camping around this area in the hopes of finding out what's going on. Gwen asks everyone when was the last time everyone kissed someone, with Owen saying Gwen. I mean, you did kind of set yourself up with this game, Gwen. Also, Ianto gets all sad because the last person he kissed was, well, that. Owen and Gwen do some angry, hate-filled flirting, then notice someone watching them, and they then find a body stripped of its skin. As everyone comes and checks it out, their car gets stolen. So they all follow the car to this little village and find more skinless corpses. Gwen opens up a door to one of the houses and is immediately shot by some terrified man, who's trying to protect himself from whatever it is that's going on. Owen removes all the shotgun pellets from Gwen, saving her life, and they do some more flirting. Meanwhile, Tosh and Yanto are taken and locked up somewhere underground with a load more body parts. This woman then shows up and takes them to the creatures. Except the creatures aren't creatures, they're people. Maybe they're aliens that look like people? No, 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 they're just people. Yanto headbutts one of them, allowing Tosh to escape, for a bit anyway, as the guy quickly hunts her down. But hooray, Gwen and Owen save her, and then themselves get captured. So, just to reiterate here, this group of people are just cannibals, not aliens, just murderous cannibals. Once every 10 years, everyone in this village just kills and eats people. Then Jack crashes through the wall and starts shooting them all, and Jack wants to finish them off, but Gwen asks to talk to them to find out why they are doing this. And he tells Gwen that they, made me happy. they all just did it because they enjoy it. Yeah, this is a pretty fucked up episode. Oh wait, it's not over yet as Gwen then starts sleeping with Owen. This show is just so unpleasant. It's not even that it's bad or anything, like, it's competently made, the stories make sense, the character journeys and motivations all make sense, I just don't like it. Greeks bearing gifts. Torchwood are called into this archaeologist site to study this body and this weird alien machine, but Gwen and Owen's constant flirting is getting on Tosh's nerves, as it's pretty heavily hinted throughout this series that she has a big crush on Owen. Later, Tosh meets this woman Mary in a bar, someone who has been watching Tosh for a while and seems to know a lot about her. She then gives Tosh a necklace that allows her to hear people's thoughts, and Tosh then uses it to learn about Gwen and Owen's relationship and Dianto's depression and how everyone looks down on her. Then, understandably feeling pretty low, she gets it on with Mary. Later, Tosh overhears this man thinking about murdering his family and follows him, as he then pulls out a gun on his wife and kids, so she knocks him out with a golf club. Showing that maybe the pendant isn't all bad, Mary reveals to Tosh that she's actually an alien, and the pendant is how her species communicate. She also says that the machine that they found at the beginning of the episode is in fact a transporter that she needs to get home. So Tosh brings Mary to the Torchwood base to get it, but finds Jack waiting for them there. He explains that the transporter was meant for two, a guard and a prisoner, and that Mary was in fact the prisoner and killed her guard, and the body they found was of someone she killed and then ate their heart. It all gets a little complicated, but the point is we learn that Mary's a serial killer and eats people's hearts. Mary threatens to kill Tosh unless she gets the transporter, and so Jack gives it to her, except he changed the coordinates on it so that it now takes Mary to the centre of the sun, killing her. Obviously. 
Tosh apologises to Gwen for reading her mind, and Gwen apologises for getting jiggy with Owen. It was nice learning a bit more about Tosh, as up to this point she's been pretty much a background character. But this episode has highlighted another problem I have with this show, and that's that all the characters kind of just hate each other. Like, they're supposed to be a believable team, but they all just despise each other. Which again makes all the characters just that much more unlikable. The episode They Keep Killing Susie has someone murdering this couple to get Torchwood's attention. So Torchwood show up, they find some DNA samples at the crime scene, and find that it contains traces of that amnesia drug that Torchwood's been using. Remember the one that Jack used on Gwen in episode 1? Well, thinking back to episode 1, Gwen has the idea of using that resurrection gauntlet to speak to the victims. The victim reveals that they were murdered by someone called Max, who's part of a group called Pilgrim, and says that a woman named Susie knew Max well. Susie. Not the Susie from episode 1, surely. Well, to find out, the Torchwood crew go through Susie's old stuff to find out if she had any connection to Pilgrim, which it turns out she did. So Gwen then uses the resurrection gauntlet on her, but it works a little too well and she doesn't stop being alive. They ask her about Max and she tells them that she gave him an amnesia pill once a week for two years as he was the only person she could talk to about Torchwood. She then tells them about this club that this Max guy used to go to, allowing the team to find Max very quickly and then lock him up. While they have him locked up, Owen discovers that Max loses his mind any time the word Torchwood is said. Meanwhile, Susie tells Gwen that her father has cancer and she wants to know if he's still alive or not. Susie also complains that Gwen has replaced her, even having slept with Owen just as she had. Owen discovers that the gauntlet is in fact giving Susie Gwen's life force and as Susie grows stronger, Gwen's starting to die. So he goes to tell Gwen this, but oh no, Gwen has broken Susie out to go see her dad. And then Torchwood gets locked down as Max starts reciting a password that traps the team inside the base. Everyone then realises that Susie must have brainwashed Max, programming him to go on a killing spree in the event of her death, so that she'd have to be resurrected. They finally get the base unlocked and chase Gwen and Susie down to a hospital where Susie finds her dad and murders him. Because she just didn't like him, I guess. They finally catch them as Susie's about to escape on a ferry and then Jack kills her in the hopes of bringing Gwen back. But Susie just refuses to die. Jack keeps on shooting Susie but she's just not having it. But then Jack realises that it's the gauntlet that's linking the pair so he orders Tosh to destroy it which does bring Gwen back and kill Susie. This was a legitimately good episode and I did really enjoy it. The characters for once didn't seem like they all hate each other and it kind of had a happy ending kind of. Random Shoes. This is a Torchwood Light episode, much like how Love and Monsters was a Doctor Light episode. And this episode stars Eugene, a man who wakes up and finds his dead body hit by a car as Torchwood are checking him out. So he decides to follow them. We then get a bit of backstory for Eugene, learning that as a boy Eugene was given this alien eye by his teacher, and then as he got older he kept trying to reach out to Torchwood about the eye, but they just weren't interested. Back in the present, Torchwood goes to Eugene's house to tell his mother what happened and to search for his alien collection. Gwen then retraces Eugene's steps and interviews this woman who used to work with him. She tells Gwen that she was going to Australia with Eugene and to pay for it, Eugene was selling his eye on eBay, with it selling for £15,005. Eugene had gone to meet the buyer at a restaurant, but it turns out it was just his friends playing a trick on him. But then it also turns out that someone really had bid £15,000 and his friends had then bid the extra £5 so they could try stealing it to resell it. Not about to let his alien eye go, Eugene swallows the eye, runs away, and that's when he gets hit by the car. And what with the eye being in his stomach, that's the reason that he's still around as a ghost. As everyone attends Eugene's funeral, Eugene pushes Gwen out of the way of a moving car and becomes visible again, just for a bit, before then dying properly. Another pretty depressing episode, although it did seem a little bit more hopeful, but this was a bit of a case of it just being a slightly worse version of Love and Monsters, and no one wants that. Out of time. Torch would go to meet this plane that's landing, except the people inside are from 1953. There's the pilot, Diane, and two passengers, Emma and John, who slip through a gap in time with no way back. We get a few sad scenes of them realising all their families are dead, 
But then Torchwood tries to reintroduce these people back into society, which is pretty fun, as they take them to Asda and they're all confused. It's very much just a scene of look how different things are now compared to the past. But watching it now, it's interesting in a different way because I'm looking back at Asda 20 years ago. But yeah, this part of the episode is really fun and it's probably the most fun and enjoyable this show has been so far. It's just nice that there's like a single tiny bit of lightheartedness before I'm sure it's going to come crashing down any moment. John and Jack both have a drink and bond over the fact that they're both men in the wrong time and he asks Jack to help find his son for him, as there's a chance he's still alive in this time period. Also, Diane and Owen start falling for each other, and Emma is struggling the most with her new life, and so Gwen offers to let Emma stay with her. John finds his son, who's now very old and suffering from Alzheimer's, and yeah, this is when the episode starts getting depressing. Reese finds out that Gwen was lying to him about knowing Emma, and they start arguing, well, if he's not a fan of Gwen lying, he's going to be in for a treat later. Meanwhile, John nicks Yanto's car keys and drives to his old house and tries to kill himself. Yep, there it is. There's that cheery torchwoodiness. Jack tells him he won't get reunited with his family when he dies, as there's just nothing after death. But John just misses his family too much and is still pretty adamant about dying. So Jack stays with him as he kills himself. Jesus. On a cheerier note, Owen and Diane say they love each other and Emma gets a job in London. The next day, Diane leaves to get back in her plane to try to fly back through the time slip, not knowing exactly where she'll end up. Owen begs her to stay, or at least asks to go with her, but she tells him no and flies off, almost certainly to her death. I really need to stop hoping for happy endings with this show. It's just not gonna happen, is it? In combat, Gwen and Reese's relationship is becoming more and more strained, then Jack shows up at dinner, calling Gwen away and causing even more arguments. And so Gwen leaves with Jack to chase down this weevil. These guys then chuck the weevil into the back of a van and drive off. Later, back at base, this weevil from episode 1 starts crying as it can telepathically feel the pain of the other weevil that got taken. They track down the location of where it was taken and find the body of a man who was killed by a weevil. They learn that the man worked for an estate agent, so Owen goes undercover there and meets this man. Meanwhile, Torchwood release a weevil into Cardiff with a tracker in it in the hopes it gets taken too, which it does. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Gwen finally tells Reese that she's been sleeping with Owen, but drugs him with the amnesia pill, so he forgets anyway. And then, surprisingly, that doesn't make her feel any better about the whole thing. Back to Owen now, and the guy from the estate agency takes Owen back to his house, where he then finds the Weevil, chained up and used as a punching bag. In fact, that's what all of this is for. It's all part of this Fight Club. And yep, the episode really does quickly descend into a cheap parody of the film Fight Club, with the estate agent becoming this poor imitation of Tyler Durden spouting faux philosophical nonsense of a loss of masculinity, and then he forces Owen to get in the cage with the Weevil. The rest of the Torchwood team show up and rescue Owen, and then crap Tyler Durden locks himself in the cage with the Weevil to be mauled to death. In Captain Jack Harkness, Tosh and Jack are investigating a haunted dance hall, only it's not haunted. It contains a time slip to 1941, and the pair now find themselves trapped here, with all these men who are shipping out to war in the morning. Jack gets in a fight, but it's broken up by this man named Captain Jack Harkness. Wait, what? Jack, our Jack, reveals this was the man who Jack got his name from. As back in the empty child time when he was running his scam, he just chose the name of a soldier who died. And this is him. They then meet a man named Billis, who has an instant camera which wasn't even invented yet. Something seems awfully suspicious about this man. Meanwhile, in the present, Gwen goes looking around the dance hall and bumps into Billis. In the present day, this Billis character is becoming very suspicious. Owen comes up with the idea to open the rift to bring them back, despite how dangerous that would be. But Ianto manages to talk him out of it. Tosh takes a picture of an equation that can be used to get them home, using Billis's camera for Gwen to find. But it only has half the equation in the picture. So Tosh writes out the rest of the equation in her own blood, as that won't fade like ink, and leaves it here in this tin. Except that dastardly Billis comes along and he scratches out the final few numbers of her equation. Jack learns more about the original Jack, knowing that tomorrow he's going to die, so convinces him to go to his girlfriend and be with her while he can. Except, he'd rather be with Jack. Our Jack, this is all very confusing. Realising that the equation isn't going to work without the final few numbers, Owen decides that the only option left is to open up a rift, 
fighting Yanto to do it. Yanto tries desperately to get Owen to stop, even resorting to shooting him, but Owen manages to open up the rift anyway. The two Jacks dance, but then the rift opens, giving Jack and Tosh a way home, so Jack kisses Jack, and they leave. Here we are then at the series 1 finale, end of days. And a load of stuff is kicking off with aliens and people out of time, all because Owen opened up the rift. So the team are then tasked with capturing all the anomalies, including this Roman soldier, this woman from the 14th century who's infecting everyone with the Black Plague, and a load more weevils. The dead also start appearing to the Torchwood team, including Tosh's mum, Cyberwoman Lisa, and then Billis appears to Gwen, telling her that he's sorry. Everyone starts arguing as all the anomalies start getting worse, and none of them really have a plan. Owen demands that Jack tell them all who he really is, and Jack fires Owen from Torchwood. Really? That's what you're firing him for? All the other stuff that everyone else has done, but asking who you are, oh that's too far. Gwen and Jack find Billis, and learn that he can step between time and see all of history, and he uses this to take things from the past and sell them as antiques in this little shop. Billis tells them that the only way to fix things and send everything back is to open up the rift fully, and he then shows Gwen a vision of the future, where Reese has been all murdered. So Gwen then goes to Reese and knocks him out and locks him in a cell in Torchwood, all in the hopes of saving him. But then Billis shows up and just stabs him up and kills him. Meanwhile, Diana appears to Owen, asking him to bring her back by opening up the rift. So Owen comes back to open up the rift, and everyone kind of agrees with him, mutinying Jack. It all starts kicking off, and Owen shoots Jack in the head. Remember, at this point, Gwen is the only one who knows that Jack is actually immortal, so for all intents and purposes, Owen did just murder Jack. So they do all open up the rift, and then Jack comes back to life. Billis tells them all that now the rift is fully open, its prisoner is free, and its prisoner turns out to be this massive thing that starts killing everything, feeding on everyone's life force. So Jack goes to confront it, seeing how it handles someone who can't die, and yeah, somehow that works, and it dies and brings Reese back to life. But Jack also dies too, and maybe for good this time. Except, nah, it takes a few days, but he comes back, and all is forgiven. But then Jack's hand begins glowing as he hears a familiar noise and chases after it, disappearing. And that's it. That's the end of series one of Torchwood. A very muddled, pretty mean-spirited series that I believe even after 13 episodes is still yet to really find its footing. <gasps> Good, now that's all out of the way, we can get back to watching some actual Doctor Who. So let's check out the Christmas special, The Runaway Bride, which suitably starts with a bride, Donna Noble, played by Catherine Tate, about to get married, when she all of a sudden starts glowing and teleports away, into the TARDIS. Remember? Remember that bit from like ages ago? Well, Catherine Tate being in Doctor Who was a pretty big deal back then as she is a national treasure in England, and uh, not so fondly known in America. But I remember being massively excited for this episode, as me and my mum used to watch a lot of the Catherine Tate show together. Anyway, back to the episode, Donna shows up in the TARDIS and freaks out, and then freaks out even more when she finds out that she's in space, and slaps the Doctor, which finally lets me add to the slap counter. Donna finds Rose's shirt. Why was that just laying around in the control room? Why was Rose taking off her shirt in the control room? Hey, Doctor? Why? Well, either way, the Doctor gets all upset and takes Donna back to the church. Well, not quite. The TARDIS messes up and ends up on the other side of London, and oh, 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 she doesn't say it, but the Doctor does. It's been on the inside, that's all. Oh, that's all. Donna decides to get a taxi, but it's being driven by another one of those robot Santas. So the Doctor, with seemingly no care for who sees, flies the TARDIS after them, telling Donna to jump. Which, after some convincing, she does. They end up missing the wedding, and Donna wishes the Doctor had a time machine. They bond for a bit, and the Doctor finally takes her back to the wedding, where they had the reception without her. You had the reception without me? Donna, what happened to you? You had the reception without me. Hello, I'm the Doctor. 
They had a reception without me. Yes, I gathered. The Doctor does some digging and finds the place Donna works for has connections with Torchwood and finds that Donna disappeared by some ancient technology called Huon Particles, particles that are also found in the TARDIS. So they magnetised to each other and that's how Donna showed up in the TARDIS. Then the robot Santas crash the wedding using another remote controlled Christmas tree and the Doctor uses some speakers to send out a frequency that destroys all the Santas. The Doctor, Donna and her fiancé Lance all head to Donna's work and find a secret basement located under the Thames. Here they find a lab manufacturing Huon particles and a hole to the centre of the earth. Oh, and just for good measure, Donna slaps the Doctor again. Then the alien in control of all this teleports in and it's this massive spider woman called the Empress of Arachnos. And it turns out that Lance has been working for her and has been the one secretly dosing Donna with Huon particles. The Doctor reverses the Huon particles, attracting the TARDIS to them, and they escape, going back in time to find out exactly what's at the centre of the Earth. And what better way to do that than by watching the Earth's creation? So, we basically find out that the Earth was created because a Rachnos spaceship showed up and pulled all the other rocks towards it, forming the Earth and canonically being the actual reason Earth exists. The Empress of Arachnos uses the Huon Particles to pull the TARDIS back to her, but the Doctor uses the Extrapolator, remember that thing, to give them a bit of a buffer. Not that it matters, as Donna is immediately kidnapped and webbed up. The Empress uses Donna's Huon Particles to wake up her children in the centre of the Earth, and then feeds Lance to them. Oh, also the Empress of Arachnos has this big spiderweb star spaceship that starts attacking the Earth. I don't know, it's supposed to be like a Christmas star, it's Christmas, whatever. So the Doctor shows up, saves Donna, kind of. Oh, sorry. And gives the Empress one chance to surrender, which she declines. So the Doctor uses some explodey baubles to flood the place draining the Thames and drowning all the Rachnos children. The Empress teleports to her ship, which almost immediately gets exploded by some tanks, so that's the end of her, I guess. And the Doctor takes Donna home, and makes it snow. The Doctor invites her to come with him, but she says no, although she does invite the Doctor for Christmas dinner, to which the Doctor says yes, but then tries to sneak off, unwilling to open up again. So goodbye to all that character development, I guess. It was a fine Christmas special, with a pretty meh villain, and some very crowbarred in Christmas stuff. But Catherine Tate's performance in it was definitely the highlight. A character who should be really grating and annoying with how she basically just complains for half of it. But somehow Catherine Tate made this character really likeable. And it's a shame that we'll never, ever, ever see her again. Ever. Now then. I think it's time that we spoke about the Sarah Jane Adventures. The Sarah Jane Adventures was a spin-off starring Elizabeth Sladen as Sarah Jane. Remember her? Well, just like Jack, she's getting her own show too, and it started with an hour-long special on New Year's Day 2007. The same exact day that Torchwood Series 1 ended. There was really no lack of Doctor Who content around this time, was there? With Doctor Who being made for general audiences and Torchwood aimed at adults, there was clearly a gap in the market for a series aimed at younger viewers. And that is what the Sarah Jane Adventures was. With new episodes of this show airing first on the CBBC channel. The children's BBC channel. Before then usually airing a week later on BBC One. So with that all out of the way, let's check out this special episode of the Sarah Jane Adventures called Invasion of the Bane. It starts with 14-year-old Maria Jackson moving into a new house with her recently divorced dad. That night she's awoken by some strange lights coming from the house across the street. She follows it and spies on whatever it is that's going on here. Because yes, her new neighbour is Miss Sarah Jane Smith. The next day this girl named Kelsey introduces herself to Maria and invites her to visit a drinks factory called Bubble Shock. Look at that, they've even got their own bus. Maria's dad introduces himself to Sarah Jane, who's a bit rude and standoffish. She then follows Maria to the factory, even having her own sonic lipstick. But she's immediately caught and brought to the boss, Mrs Wormwood. Sarah Jane has apparently been investigating Bubble Shock and asks if the secret ingredient in it called Bane is alien. And Ben is escorted out and nearly killed. I mean, not really, but there was an attempt, I guess. Meanwhile, in this crappy Willy Wonka-style tour, Maria's new friend Kelsey sneaks off and finds this big squid guy. 
Also, there's this kid who's being grown in this factory. Look, there's a lot of stuff going on here. You've got to just go with it. Anyway, he escapes and runs into Maria and then Sarah Jane. And they all escape in Sarah Jane's car. Maria confronts Sarah Jane about that alien last night and Sarah Jane tells her to go home and forget about her. Sarah Jane then scans the boy, finding out he's human, but only a few hours old, and doesn't even have a belly button. Kelsey then shows up at Maria's house again, having got a lift back from the factory by the Willy Wonka guy, and they go to Sarah Jane as Willy Wonka becomes the CGI monstrosity. Sarah Jane blasts it with something, turning him back into a man, and then he just runs off. We're then introduced to Sarah Jane's attic, with references galore. Also, canines in this box stopping a black hole from destroying the Earth. Yeah, they kind of just did that to explain away canine. As around this time, they were also developing a canine spin-off, which we'll get to later. And so they just had to kind of find a reason to get rid of canine for now. And I suppose sticking them in a box with a black hole is as good a reason as any. Also, there's this supercomputer called Mr. Smith, and Sarah Jane uses it to communicate with Mrs. Wormwood, telling her to leave Earth which she obviously doesn't, and instead possesses anyone who's been drinking bubble shock. So our heroes all head back to the factory, and Maria uses her phone to attack the Bane because they don't like signals or something, but it's not enough. Luckily, that boy stole a space phone from Sarah Jane's house and uses that, causing the factory to explode because obviously it does, as every single thing Sarah Jane touches explodes apparently. Sarah Jane then adopts the boy and names him Luke. Who? I like Luke. <laughs> I like Luke. If you like Luke, I like Luke. And it seems that Maria might just enjoy her new life here. The special does feel very piloty, which I guess makes sense it being the first episode and all. And it also has that problem that a lot of kids shows have where all the acting is overacted. But thankfully the worst culprit of this in this episode, Kelsey, who I'm sorry to say just was a bit too obnoxious for me. Well, if that's your mum, you should go on Gemery Carl. She just never shows up in the actual show ever again. Which does give me hope for the rest of the series. Although, the rest of the series wouldn't air until September. A whole nine months after this special. With a whole series of Doctor Who in between. So, we'll have to come back to Sarah Jane Adventures later. <laughs> on to season three now with Smith and Jones, where we're introduced to Martha Jones and her family through a series of phone calls, including her sister, her brother, her mum, her dad, his girlfriend, who are all talking about going to Martha's brother's birthday that night. And that is just way too much exposition to handle in such a short time, but don't worry about all that, as the Doctor shows up and takes his tie off, before continuing on his way. Bit weird. We continue to follow Martha as she goes to a hospital. Yep, that's right, another season opener, another hospital. We learn that Martha's a student doctor who's checking on some patients, including this woman and the doctor. She mentions seeing him earlier, asking if he has a brother, and the doctor says, No, not anymore. So let's just add brother to his family tree. Martha checks the doctor's heartbeats, his two heartbeats, and is suitably freaked out. Then it starts raining at the hospital, just at the hospital, and the rain is going up. Then the entire hospital teleports to the moon. Everyone freaks out, and Martha wonders how they can still breathe, which gets the doctor's attention. So they step outside onto a balcony. Martha guesses it's aliens, and mentions that she had a cousin who worked at Canary Wharf, who never came home. You see, Freema Adjiman, the actress playing Martha, also played the character Adiola only a few episodes ago. And yes, yeah, sure, in this retrospective, that was hours ago. But trust me, Army of Ghosts wasn't that far away from this episode. And it was definitely a little bit jarring at the time. The Doctor throws a pebble, realising there's a force field keeping the air in, and that's the only air they've got, meaning they'll soon all suffocate. Oh, also aliens land, and the Doctor recognises them immediately as Jadoon. And apparently they were named that purely because David Tennant struggled to maintain his English accent when saying words with oo in them. Jadoon platoon upon the moon. Meanwhile, you remember this patient from earlier? Well, she's been drinking people's blood with a straw. I've even brought a straw. A plastic straw? Think of the turtles, you monster! The Jadoon enter the hospital and reveal themselves to all be space rhinos. Or at least they probably are, as it seems they've only made one prosthetic. And all the others just have to keep their helmets on for the whole episode. The Jadoon begins scanning everyone to see if they're human, and the Doctor explains that that's bad news for him, being non-human and all. He also explains that the Jadoon are police, and brought the hospital here using a H2O scoop. 
which is why it rained upwards. This guy hits one of the Jadoon with a vase that just happens to be in a hospital corridor and is executed. Martha then finds the blood sucking patient called a Plasmavore and her minions chase the doctor and Martha down, but they manage to kill one of them by blasting it with radiation. The Plasmavore finishes drinking all the blood, which allows her to register as human to the Jadoon. But the doctor doesn't, which means more running. The Doctor then kisses Martha so she appears as a little bit non-human to distract the Jadoon while he confronts the Plasmavore, doing his best human impression. The big space rhino things! I mean rhinos from space! The Plasmavore's souping up this MRI machine to destroy everyone and half the world, allowing her to escape in one of the Jadoon ships. She then drinks the Doctor's blood, making her appear non-human to the Jadoon, who swiftly kill her and leave. Martha resuscitates the Doctor with the last of her air, and the Doctor switches off the MRI machine. The Jadoon send the hospital back to Earth, and happy endings all round. Martha then goes to the party, which ends in a load of family drama, but the Doctor's there waiting for her, in order to offer her a trip in the TARDIS through time and space. Martha's sceptical about the TARDIS's time travelling capabilities, so the Doctor proves it by going back to the beginning of the episode, and taking his tie off. So Martha joins the Doctor in the TARDIS, it's big on the inside. Is it? I have noticed. <laughs> the Doctor then mentions Rose and tells Martha that she's not replacing her, despite totally replacing her name in the opening credits. And off they go. I really like this episode and I think it's by far the best season opener of the Russell T Davis era. Martha is a great new addition and a massive contrast from Rose, you know, actually being good and clever and fun. The Jadoon were cool, the hospital on the moon idea was a really fun concept. I just really like this one. The Shakespeare Code picks up where the first episode left off with the Doctor and Martha landing in Elizabethan England. And Martha asks some questions about affecting the past and stepping on a butterfly and slavery. This is why I always like Martha. She asks proper good questions and is just generally a lot smarter than Rose. They visit the Globe Theatre. You go home, you can tell everyone you've seen Shakespeare. Dave, I could get sectioned. Where they see the real life William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare announces that he'll premiere a new play tomorrow night, except this is going to famously end up as Shakespeare's lost play. So curiosity gets the better of the Doctor, and he sticks around to find out why the play gets lost. Also, there's these witches that are killing people with voodoo, which is probably going to be important at some point. Anyway, the Doctor and Martha stay the night in this inn and have to share a bed. And then the Doctor starts going on about Rose again. Get over her already! The witches possess Shakespeare to change the ending of his new play, and the innkeeper gets killed as Martha watches one of the witches fly away on a broomstick. The next day, the performers begin rehearsing with the new script and accidentally start summoning this demon. Meanwhile, the Doctor visits Superhands, a friend of Shakespeare's who's seen the witches before. But then one of those witches appears and kills him. So long, Superhands. The Doctor fights the witch off using words, as these creatures use words as a weapon, and the Doctor uses the witch's greatest weapon, its name, which is Carrionite which causes the Carrionite to retreat, and the Doctor realises the play is being used by them as a weapon. Shakespeare tries stopping the premiere of the play, but the witches knock him out, and the play continues. Also, there's a bit here where the Doctor explains the stakes to Martha using Back to the Future as a reference point, and I just love that. Back to the Future. It's like Back to the Future. The film. No, the novelisation. Yes, the film. The Carrionites knock Martha out by saying her name, but surprise, surprise, they don't know the Doctor's real name. Oh, wait, I don't think I've actually mentioned that yet. The Doctor's real name isn't actually the Doctor, and only a few people know what his real name is, with the Carrionite not being one of them. So she steals his hair instead, and makes a voodoo doll to attack him. But Martha resuscitates him once again. Is Martha's role in this series just going to be her being a human defibrillator? So, the play continues and a portal opens allowing a swarm of Carrionites through. Shakespeare uses words to stop them with a bit of help from the Doctor and J.K. Rowling. It's the Elders! It's the Elders! It's the Elders! Oh, huh. Wonder what would have happened if he had quoted her Twitter instead. The audience all applaud, thinking it's part of a performance, and the next day the Doctor and Martha leave, but not before Queen Elizabeth I shows up, recognises the Doctor as her sworn enemy, and tries to kill him. Huh. Weird. I'm sure that'll be explained soon enough though, and not take seven years or something. This was always an episode that I used to skip because I thought it was pretty boring, but watching it back now as an adult who gets a lot of these references, it's really funny, and I actually really liked it. Gridlock. 
Martha asks to visit the planet the Doctor's from, but rather than tell Martha the truth about his home planet, he instead describes his planet in great detail, but says it would be boring to go there, so takes her to New New Earth instead. You know, the same place he took Rose. You're taking me to the same planet that you took her. What's wrong with that? Nothing. Have you ever heard the word rebound? Except, unlike last time, now they show up underground in the slums, where all these people are selling mood drugs. They meet this woman who lost her parents after they went on a motorway, and then Martha gets kidnapped and taken to said motorway. As it turns out that cars containing three people gain them admittance to the fast lane. So the doctor follows them onto the motorway, hopping into a car with this couple and their children who are just cats. This woman gave birth to cats. Her husband is a cat. Cats have barbed penises, oh god. Moving on, although I'll tell you who isn't moving on, any one in these cars, as it turns out this couple have been in this traffic jam for 12 years and only moved 5 miles. The doctor asks them to go down to the fast lane now that they have 3 passengers, but they refuse as there's something down there. The doctor realises that they're all trapped down here, never getting out, and then we get an admittedly very touching scene where everyone in all these cars begins singing. The Doctor then opens up the bottom of his car and starts jumping down between the different cars. This is a very cool scene with Murray Gold's overly bombastic score and it's just really fun seeing how they designed all these different cars. The Doctor finally reaches the lowest level and finds giant crabs called Macra at the bottom, who previously appeared in the completely missing 1967 story, The Macra Terror. Meanwhile, Martha and her car are trying to escape said Macra, so turn off the engine so they can't be detected by them. The Catwoman from the last time the Doctor was here then shows up and teleports the Doctor away, to the city where everyone's dead, from a new drug called Bliss. They, uh, they probably could have found a cure if the Doctor hadn't ruined all their experiments. The face of Bo is also here, he's the one who locked everyone underground to keep them safe, but there's now not enough power to reopen it back up. The face of Bo gives the last of his life force to help the Doctor open up the motorway and the Doctor tells everyone to drive up, including Martha's car. The face of Bo then finally dies after billions of years and tells the Doctor his very last secret, saying You are not alone. As they leave, Martha demands that the Doctor tell her what the face of Bo meant and as the city sings behind them, the Doctor admits he lied. His planet is gone and all the Time Lords are dead. This episode is great. Something Russell T Davis could do that no other writer's mastered is making you feel and care about characters after only the briefest bit of screen time. The side characters in his era could not be matched. They were just the best. Daleks in Manhattan. The Doctor and Martha land in New York during the Great Depression where the Empire State Building is still being built. They find a shanty town in the middle of Central Park called Hooverville and then meet this man called Solomon who tells the Doctor and Martha about all the people who have gone missing, taken from Hooverville in the middle of the night. Meanwhile, this guy, Mr Diagoras, is in charge of building the Empire State Building and he's working for the Daleks, Daleks with pig minions and Daleks who, for some reason, need the Empire State finished immediately. So Mr Diagoras goes to Hooverville to hire some more workers including Solomon, the Doctor, Martha, and frickin' Spider-Man. That's right, Andrew Garfield is here. Andrew Garfield, an English actor in an English show, is playing an American character. Even on Doctor Who, he has to be an American. They're all brought down to the sewers to clear out a collapsed tunnel, and the Doctor finds this jellyfish thing. Mr. Diagoras then tells some other workers to stick Dalek bits onto the top of the building, and Mr. Diagoras is brought to see the rest of the Cult of Scaro. That's right, these are the same Daleks from Doomsday. Meanwhile, the Doctor finds a load of those pig things hiding in the sewers, and they take Spider-Man, whilst the rest of them escape into this theatre, where they all meet Tallulah, a woman with the New Yorkest accent ever. Now tell me, you schmucks. What have you done with Laszlo? And she's also played by an English actor. Dalek Sect tells the rest of the Cult of Scaro that they need to become more human to help their survival, but the other Daleks aren't so sure. And then Dalek Sect straight up swallows Mr. Diagoras in a really gross bit of body horror. Tallulah explains to everyone that her boyfriend Laszlo is also missing, and then there's this legitimately good musical number, and the Doctor takes a moment to study that jellyfish, 
discovering it's been genetically engineered. A genetically engineered Dalek. And just look at that face. The Doctor just wanted a nice trip to New York. And now he's got to deal with more Daleks. It's not even a series finale. Martha finds Laszlo hiding backstage, now being half pig, and then some other pigs kidnap her. She then meets Spider-Man again, as all of them are on their way to be turned into pig slaves. So that's the origin of Spider-Pig. The Doctor and Tallulah follow them, hiding from a Dalek on the way, and find Laszlo, who then takes the Doctor to find Martha and the Daleks, just in time to see Dalek Sec become, well, I'll let him say it. I am a human Dalek. Evolution of the Dalek starts with the Doctor checking out this brand new Dalek, before then sonicking a radio speaker so everyone can escape. That's a reference I doubt anyone's gonna get. Anyway, these two Daleks do their best to whisper about their doubts about human Daleks. But you have doubts. Affirmative. And everyone else runs back to Hooverville, as the Daleks and pigs mount their attack. Solomon gives an impassioned speech saying that he and the Daleks are the same, lowering his gun and asking the Daleks to stop fighting. And of course the Daleks just straight up kill him. The Doctor then demands that the Daleks kill him next, but Dalek Sec stops the Daleks, saying he wants the Doctor alive and brought to him. The Doctor agrees on the condition that everyone else is left alone, with Martha staying to help these people. So the Doctor leaves with the Daleks, but gives Martha a parting gift of some psychic paper. The Doctor meets Dalek Sec, and very much to the Doctor's surprise, Dalek Sec agrees that it was wrong to kill Solomon. He then shows the Doctor all these humans that the Daleks stole, humans who had their minds wiped, ready to be converted into human Daleks. The Daleks just need some energy from a gamma strike that's soon going to hit the Empire State Building to Frankenstein these humans into human Daleks. Dalek Sec tells the Doctor that he wants these new human Daleks to be even more human, and this is when the other Daleks start kicking off, mutinying Dalek Sec, allowing Laszlo and the Doctor to escape. Meanwhile, Martha and her team all go to the Empire State Building and find the Dalek bits on the mast, and then the Doctor shows up and climbs up to the top to remove them. But all the other pig slaves aren't far behind the Doctor, and they're on their way up the lift, leaving Martha, Spider-Man, Tallulah and Laszlo to fight them off. Actually, maybe not Laszlo, as his little piggy heart gives out. One man down, we ain't even started yet. The Doctor isn't able to remove all the panels in time and gets electrocuted by the Gamma Strike, as do all the pigs. All the Dalek people start waking up and begin marching through the sewers, and Dalek Sec is made the new leader of the Cult of Scaro. The Doctor calls all the Daleks to the theatre, and the Daleks try shooting him, but Dalek Sec sacrifices himself to save the Doctor. The Doctor then tells the Daleks to let the human Daleks kill him, but they just won't do it, because the Doctor got in the way of the strike, making them part Time Lord and giving them all free will. The human Daleks then kill all the actual Daleks, but then Dalek Khan kills them all remotely anyway. The Doctor finally confronts Dalek Khan, now the last Dalek in existence, offering to help him, but Dalek Khan teleports away. Then the Doctor saves Laszlo's life, and the Doctor and Martha leave, with the Doctor telling her that he'll definitely be seeing Dalek Khan again soon. Always wanted to do this. This is a good episode. Overly hated, I think. In the Lazarus experiment, the Doctor brings Martha home, 12 hours after she left. Not even 12 months this time, the Doctor's getting better. Martha then sees her sister Tish on TV with a man called Professor Lazarus, who's saying he's going to change what it means to be human. The Doctor goes to leave, but just can't resist. No, I'm sorry, did he say he was going to change what it means to be human? So Martha and the Doctor go to the demonstration of Professor Lazarus' machine, and the Doctor finally gets properly introduced to Martha's family. Lazarus gets into his fancy machine, but it begins overloading. Thankfully, the Doctor manages to turn it off as Lazarus steps out, now much younger. The Doctor and Martha analyse his DNA and find that it's mutating. Well, technically the bases of the DNA are remaining the same and the sugar phosphate backbone is mutating, which, sure, might damage the DNA, but won't actually alter the genes. 
I mean, maybe certain genes coding for histone proteins will no longer be expressed, causing more dormant genes to become more active, but that's a stretch. Boy, I really hope somebody got fired for that blunder. The Doctor and Martha then find this woman with her life force all sucked dry, which they quickly conclude was Lazarus is doing, and he's now got his sights set on Tish. Luckily, they find them just in time to see Lazarus becoming this big CGI scorpion monstrosity, which then starts attacking all the other guests. Martha helps everyone escape before going back for the Doctor, who's being chased down by Lazarus. Meanwhile, this man, who works for some guy called Harold Saxon, tells Martha's mum exactly who the Doctor is, and mostly about how dangerous he is. The Doctor and Martha hide inside Lazarus' machine, which Lazarus then turns on. So the Doctor reverses the polarity, sending the energy outwards, and turning Lazarus human again, but also killing him. Martha's mum then shows up and slaps the Doctor because of course she does, and Lazarus comes alive again and hides in a nearby cathedral. The Doctor tries telling Lazarus that a longer life isn't always a better one, and if he lives long enough, he'll end up alone. Then Lazarus tries eating Martha, chasing her and Tish up through the cathedral to the bell tower. The Doctor sends a sonic pulse through the organ, causing Lazarus to fall to his death, and the Doctor and Martha leave to go on some more adventures. This is another episode that I think gets really unfairly hated. Like, sure, the CGI of the monster is not great, but it is still a wacky and out there design. And I think it was really cool getting to learn more about Martha's family, as with Rose, she just kind of had a mum, whereas Martha has a massive family full of interesting character dynamics that we get to explore. Overall, I'm going to say shut up to the haters, I like this one. 42. The Doctor and Martha follow a distress signal to this spaceship, which in 42 minutes is going to crash into the sun, and of course all the heat is being vented into this room where the TARDIS is, meaning there's no way out. So the Doctor, Martha and the crew have to somehow fix the engine ships in real time. The reason the ship is crashing is because of this man who's going all mad and infected with something. And to reach the ship's controls, Martha and this guy Riley need to get through 30 locked doors each one being locked with a different question. And no matter how much they try and justify it, I don't think that's the best way to have a ship. I think even five locked doors might have been pushing it. But 30, that's just unnecessary. Meanwhile, that infected fella wakes up and starts saying burn with me over and over again, before then vaporising this woman, and this woman, and this man, and then nearly gets to Martha and Riley, but they hide inside an escape pod that then gets jettisoned. Martha, now pretty certain that she's going to die, phones her mum to say goodbye, and this shady woman is listening in. The Doctor then happens to find the exact same space suit he wore in The Impossible Planet, and hangs out of a spaceship to magnetise the escape pod back. But then the Doctor makes the mistake of looking into the sun, and realises that it's alive, as it then infects him. The Doctor explains that the ship was using the sun for fuel, which angered it, so Martha tries icing the Doctor, but it doesn't work, so the Doctor tells Martha to dump the fuel into the sun, which they do, and yeah, it fixes everything. Martha kisses Riley, and the Doctor and Martha leave, with the Doctor offering Martha a TARDIS key, and a proper place on the TARDIS. This episode was all over the place, lacking focus, and just all around being messy. This episode is definitely the lowest point of Series 3. Just who wrote this episode? Oh, right, of course. Well, I sure hope he won't be writing any more episodes. Human nature starts with the Doctor, except no, he's not the Doctor, but a teacher named John Smith in 1913. And Martha is his housemaid? Just what is going on here? Well, John Smith has been having some strange dreams. Dreams where he's called the Doctor, but he's not, obviously. He's 100% human, with one heart and everything. Also, John Smith very much has a crush on Joan, the school nurse who he shows his journal to, filled with all the things he's dreamt of, Cybermen, Daleks, Rose, and all these other faces of other Doctors. Including the 8th Doctor, who up to this point it was kind of debated whether or not he was canon, as he only ever appeared in the 1996 movie pilot thing for Fox. But look, there he is, which proves that he was a proper Doctor. Anyway, Martha, unlike the Doctor, very much seems to be more like herself, and really isn't enjoying her life in 1913, what with all the racism and being a woman, and the Doctor falling in love with someone else. This green light then falls from the sky, and this boy named Baines finds it, discovering it's an invisible spaceship full of invisible aliens called the Family of Blood that then possess him. Just look at that low angle, that proves he's evil. 
Martha then goes to find the TARDIS and we finally get some answers as to what's actually going on. The Doctor and Martha were on the run from a family of blood and so to hide the Doctor disguised himself by rewriting his biology to make him human, with all his time lordiness stored in this fob watch. Now all they had to do was hide out for a few months until the family of blood dies. Except now they're here and this kid named Timothy pockets the, well, the pocket watch. Which is starting to complicate things. The family of blood begin using these scarecrow minions to possess more people, including this man, this little girl and Martha's maid friend Jenny. Meanwhile, John Smith continues falling in love with Joan, discussing his life growing up in Gallifrey, which is probably an island, and his parents Sidney and Verity, a little nod there to the original creators of Doctor Who. And then the pair kiss. Martha realises Jenny is evil immediately and goes to open the fob watch, but it's gone. So she resorts to slapping John Smith in the hopes that that will snap him out of it. But obviously it doesn't work. And then Joan and John go to a dance. Martha shows up with the Doctor's sonic screwdriver, but even that doesn't snap him out of it. Then the family of blood show up, start killing people, having overheard Martha's conversation. And then demand that the Doctor turn back into a Time Lord again, or they'll kill Martha or Joan. They do leave the decision up to the Doctor though, so that was nice of them. The following episode of The Family of Blood starts with Timothy opening the fob watch which releases a bit of time lordiness to briefly distract the Family of Blood long enough for Martha to take a gun and enter a good old fashioned standoff. A scarecrow then snatches back the gun but Martha and everyone still manages to escape. John Smith heads back to the school and raises the alarms, arming the students as the family and their scarecrows attack. Timothy uses the fob watch to fight off that little girl, but now the family know that that's where the Time Lordy goodness is, and that now all they need is the fob watch. The headmaster then gets killed, and the family starts searching the school for Timothy. And now they have the TARDIS too. Even Joe now admits that that was in the Doctor's journal, and that everything Martha said might just be true. Joan takes them to the home of the little girl, guessing that it would now be abandoned, for them to hide out. Timothy then shows up with a fob watch and John Smith starts having a breakdown, not wanting to change. But the family start bombing the village, giving John Smith no choice. This is some pretty powerful stuff right here. David Tennant really sells that he's a totally different character, going through a very real seeming existential crisis. John Smith decides to just give the family the watch so that he can stay human and then they'll leave. But then Joan reads the end of the journal and learns that if a family of blood get the fob watch then they'll live forever and continue their path of destruction. John and Joan both touch the watch and they see a vision of a life they could have spent together and then John Smith goes to the family of blood spaceship and offers up the watch, which they take except it's empty as John Smith did in fact do the right thing and this man is the doctor who then immediately blows up the family of blood ship and we're treated to the darkest, most badass bit in all of the 10th Doctor's run, as the Doctor traps the family of blood in a series of darkly cruel eternal hellscapes. Unbreakable chains, a black hole, a mirror, and suspended in time as a scarecrow. The Doctor did give them their wish of eternal life in the most cruel ways possible. The Doctor says goodbye to Joan and offers to take her with him in the TARDIS, but she declines, asking him if he hadn't chosen to come here, would all those people have died? Which, uh, yeah, was a pretty good point. Timothy then says goodbye to Mar from the Doctor, and the Doctor gives him the fob watch for good luck, which one day does save his life from a falling bomb during the First World War. And then in the present day, the Doctor and Martha go to visit him, and I always tear up at this bit. These two episodes were a fantastic bit of television, and probably my top 10 favourite Doctor Who episodes. I guess the only real downside of this episode is, much like the Christmas Invasion, there really isn't much of a Doctor in it. Which seems like a weird thing to say as David Tennant is still the main character in this story. He's just not the Doctor for most of it. Blink is probably the most beloved Doctor Who episode of them all. Despite the fact that the Doctor is barely even in it. As this is another Doctor light episode. And we all remember how well the last one went, don't we? Except this one was written by Stephen Moffat, who has written some of the best episodes from the previous series, including The Empty Child and Girl in the Fireplace. So this one's in pretty safe hands. The episode starts with this woman, Sally Sparrow, breaking into an abandoned house where she finds a message that's been left for her under some wallpaper telling her to duck, which she does as a rock barely misses her head. The message was left by who else but the Doctor. 
So Sally, freaked out, goes to her friend Kathy's house where she meets her brother Larry, who's naked. And Larry also has all these TVs with the doctor on them. But ignoring that for now, Kathy and Sally go back to the house the next day and see that these statues have moved since the last time Sally was here. But of course they didn't, that's silly, statues can't move. Well, then the doorbell rings, and Sally goes to answer it, and is then given a letter by a man who was told to come here at this exact date and time to give her this letter. And okay, now I'm sure that statue just moved. The letter is supposedly from Kathy, but Kathy's gone, as the statue sent her to the past, and this man is in fact her grandson. Sally searches the house for Kathy, and finds a statue holding a key, which of course she then takes. Sally reads the letter and finds out that Kathy led a full and happy life in the past, so Sally then goes to visit Kathy's brother Larry to tell him that Kathy's going to be gone for a while. Sally sees the doctor on the TV and asks Larry what it's all about. He tells her that it's an easter egg on 17 random DVDs, where he's speaking half a conversation. Okay, that was weird. Like, you can hear me. Well, I can hear you. Okay, that's enough. I've had enough now, I've had a long day and I've had bloody enough! And Larry then gives Sally the list of 17 DVDs. Sally decides to go to the police about what happened to Kathy, and it turns out that one of the officers, D.I. Billy Shipman, is also investigating that same house. He shows Sally all the abandoned cars that were left outside the house, and even this old police box. As Sally leaves, D.I. Shipman asks for her number, and then finds a load of those statues have appeared. And then the moment he blinks, he wakes up in 1969. And look, the Doctor and Martha are also here. The Doctor explains that those statues are called the Weeping Angels, and they sent him to the past to feed on all the days he didn't get to live in the present. And then he asked Billy to give Sally a message, although it might take a while to give it to her. So back in the present, Sally gets a call from a much older Billy, who she then visits in a hospital, where he finally tells Sally the Doctor's message, which is to look at the list of DVDs. What an absolute waste of a message. Who gets a list of DVDs and then doesn't look at it? Of course she was going to look at it. Billy also explains to her that he was in fact the one who added the easter eggs to all the DVDs. And then he dies. Sally realises that the list of 17 DVDs are in fact all the DVDs she owns. And so her and Larry head back to the house. She plays the DVD and then Sally starts completing the other half of the conversation. So they can kind of speak to each other, sort of. Or as the doctor explains it... People assume that time is a strict progression of cause to effect, but actually, from a non-linear, non-subjective viewpoint, it's more like a big ball of wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff. Larry writes a transcript of what Sally is saying, so that the Doctor can then answer that in the past. Uh, wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey. The Doctor explains that the Weeping Angels can only move when they're not being looked at, and they want the TARDIS to feed on all its time energy. So the Doctor then gives one final warning, and then the Weeping Angels start coming. Larry desperately tries not to blink as the Weeping Angel keeps getting closer, and they've also locked them in, so the only way out is through the basement, where Sally and Larry find the TARDIS. But then the Angels start turning out the lights. Luckily though, Sally uses the key to open the TARDIS just in time, and they insert the disc into the TARDIS, and it starts dematerialising without Sally and Larry. Except now, all the angels are looking at each other, and therefore frozen forever. A year later, Sally bumps into the Doctor while he's in the middle of another adventure, and she gives him the transcript, and Sally and Larry hold hands. This episode is obviously fantastic, even if it is a big departure from standard Doctor Who, which means that despite most people recommending it as a good starting episode, I really don't think it represents Doctor Who all too well. But that doesn't stop it from being a fantastic bit of television. The way it makes pretty complex time travel concepts easily understandable and how it all weaves together expertly is what makes the writing this episode just pure joy to watch. The episode Utopia picks up from where Torchwood Series 1 left off, with the Doctor and Martha stopping in Cardiff to charge up the TARDIS using the Rift. And Jack comes running after them, grabbing onto the side of the TARDIS as the TARDIS runs away, all the way to the end of the universe, which looks a fair bit like a Cardiff quarry, just saying. The Doctor and Martha step out of the TARDIS to find Jack laying there dead, albeit not for long. And Jack is pretty understandably peeved at the Doctor for being left in the future. Remember in the episode Parting of the Ways where the Doctor just left without Jack? Well, luckily for him, he explains that he had a vortex manipulator on him, which allowed him to go back to the 19th century. 
but then the vortex manipulator burnt out, meaning he was stuck there waiting by the rift for the doctor to show up again. Which does in fact explain the real true reason why Torchwood 3 was built on the rift, as he knew that eventually the doctor would have to stop off there to recharge the TARDIS. Then they all meet this guy who's running away from these feral creatures called the future kind, who are basically just people but with pointy teeth. It kinda seems like the budget had run out at this point. They all escape to the silo where they find this giant rocket, ready to head to Utopia. And then they meet this fella named Professor Yana and his assistant Chanto. Martha then finds Jack's hand in a jar and we finally learn whose hand it is. It was the Doctor's hand, the one that was cut off on Christmas Day. Professor Yana then tells our heroes about a signal that was transmitting across the stars saying come to Utopia and so they're going there to try to survive the end of the universe. But Professor Yana is struggling to get the rocket to work, so the Doctor just pulls a switch and fixes everything immediately. So everyone begins boarding the ship, including this little boy who's very excited to see Utopia. My mum used to see the skies were made of diamonds. Good for her. Go on, off you go, get your seat. And then the TARDIS is brought to the lab. Professor Yana tells the Doctor about the drumming sound in his head that he's had all his life, and also this man needs to fix the couplings in this room to get the rocket working, except then one of the future kind shows up and floods the room with radiation, killing him. So Jack then goes in to fix the couplings, as he can't be killed. The Doctor and Jack chat, and the Doctor reveals that he ran away from Jack at the end of Series 1, as Jack is wrong. Just him being immortal kind of freaks the Doctor out a bit. Which, I don't really know if that's a great excuse, kind of just seems a little bit lazy to me. Anyway, Jack gets everything working and the rocket takes off successfully. Meanwhile, Professor Yana starts hearing voices whispering to him. And he's also got this fob watch. Wait, hang on, that fob watch looks awfully familiar. And it seems that Martha thinks so too, as she then goes to tell the Doctor. The Doctor starts panicking as this means there might be another Time Lord about. You know, just like the face of Bo said. You are not alone. The drums in Professor Yana's head get louder, as do the voices, telling him to open the watch, which then restores all his Time Lord biology. Yana then locks the Doctor out of the lab and lets all the future kind in, before then electrocuting Chantho, telling her that his name isn't Yana, but the Master. With her final breath, Chantho shoots the Master and he stumbles to the TARDIS as the Doctor shows up, recognising what Time Lord he is immediately. The Master then regenerates into John Sim, and the Doctor begs him to stop, but instead the Master leaves in the TARDIS, leaving the Doctor, Martha and Jack to deal with all the future kind. This twist absolutely blew my mind as a kid. I had heard rumours that the Master, a very famous character from Doctor's history, and probably the Doctor's greatest enemy, might be showing up in the two-part finale, but this wasn't the two-part finale yet. I thought this was just another throwaway episode before the finale, so I wasn't expecting this twist at all. And it absolutely exploded my 10 year old brain. After watching this episode for the first time, I was just so excited that I went to my home phone, phoned up my friend's mum, got him, got her to get him on the phone, and then went, oh my god, did you watch the episode? And he was like, yeah, why are you phoning me? You'd never phoned me before. And I was like, yeah, but it was amazing, wasn't it? And he was like, I, I, I guess why are you phoning me? So I then put the phone down and then I think I just ran around the house all excited for a bit. It's a weird kid. The sound of drums starts with the Doctor fixing Jack's Vortex manipulator and our heroes use it to return to modern day, where the Master is now going by the name of Harold Saxon and has somehow become a Prime Minister, with a wife and everything. And the first thing Harold Saxon does to celebrate being Prime Minister is gas his entire cabinet. And, uh, I don't know, but I'm, I'm starting to like this guy's policies. And Tish, remember Martha's sister? Well, she's now working for Harold Saxon as his PA. Our heroes all head to Martha's house, where the Doctor does some digging, and we get some celebrity cameos supporting Harold Saxon. Well, if he's got Sharon Osbourne's vote, he's got mine. Meanwhile, this woman tries to warn the Master's wife, Lucy Saxon, that she's in danger, but it turns out that Lucy already knows everything, and so the Master then kills this woman with the help of his balls. The Doctor reveals that at the end of Utopia, he fused the TARDIS's coordinates so it can only travel between the end of the universe and the present day, and then the Master, Harold Saxon, releases a statement showing off his balls. 
telling the world that he's been contacted by aliens called the Toclophane, and they'll be beginning a diplomatic relationship the next day. The Master then bombs Martha's house with some Looney Tunes looking TNT, and then Martha phones her mum and dad, and finds out they've been arrested. So they all drive to Martha's house, nearly get shot, and are forced to go on the run. The Master phones the Doctor up, and they talk about the Time War for a bit, and how the Master ran from it, hiding as a human at the end of the universe. Oh, also he sent the Torchwood team on a wild goose chase to the Himalayas, so they can't help. The Doctor then gives us a bit of a history lesson on the Master and Gallifrey, and we even get our first look at it. The Doctor explains that children of Gallifrey would go to an academy to become Time Lords, and that's where the Doctor first met the Master. Jack tells everyone about Torchwood, and he learns that that woman from earlier sent Torchwood a message warning them about a new mobile phone network that the Master set up, which consists of 15 satellites which are sending out subconscious messages to the population in order to control them, called the Archangel Network. The Doctor gives everyone a TARDIS key to wear, which puts out a perception filter like the TARDIS, which makes them not invisible, but unnoticed thereby allowing them all to sneak aboard this airship called the Valiant, which is basically the helicarrier from Avengers, where the Master and the President of the United States are about to have first contact with the Toclophane. Here they find the TARDIS and the Master has turned it into something called a Paradox Machine, and then the Toclophane show up and the Master gets them to kill the President. He then captures the Doctor, Martha and Jack, and kills Jack using a laser screwdriver. The Master then reveals Professor Lazarus developed aging technology for him, and so he uses his screwdriver to age the Doctor up. Also, Martha's family are here, which is nice. Finally, the Master brings in 6 billion Toclophane and orders them to kill one tenth of the population. The Doctor whispers something in Martha's ear, and she then takes the Vortex Manipulator and teleports away, back down to Earth, where it's basically the end of the world. The last of the Time Lords picks up one year later, with Martha spending that year travelling across the world, and now she's getting the help from Lucifer, the devil himself. I'm starting to like Martha's odds here. Nah, not really, of course not. This is just some guy called Tom who's currently giving Martha a lift. And apparently, there's rumours going about that Martha knows how to kill the Master. And that sure would be a good thing, as currently the Master is developing fleets of rockets to wage war against the rest of the universe. Meanwhile, everyone else has spent the year being the Master's slaves, still trapped aboard the Valiant. And the Master, presumably just getting bored, decides to age the Doctor a bit more into this Dobby-looking thing. Martha meets this professor who helps her bring down a Toclophane, and they open it up finding this horrific face inside. Even worse though, it recognises Martha as it's that little boy from the future. The skies are made of diamonds. Remember the Doctor made it so that the TARDIS could only travel between present day and the end of the universe? Well, the Master went back there to Utopia, where people turned themselves into the Toclophane in the hopes of surviving the end of the universe. And, well, the Master brought them all back in time to create a new empire, which is why he needs a paradox machine because technically all of these Toclophane are killing their ancestors. Martha tells the Professor about a gun which requires four different chemicals, which when combined can kill the Master. She just needs one last chemical, which is currently being stored in a unit base. So her and Lucifer travel to get it, and on the way Martha tells all these people about the Doctor. And then that Professor lady sells Martha out, telling the Master all about Martha's plan. So the Master then shows up, destroys Martha's gun, kills Lucifer, and takes Martha to the Valiant, so the Doctor can watch her die. He's just about to kill her, but then Martha starts laughing, because the gun was fake. That was never what the Doctor whispered to her. He told her to use the telepathic field created by the Archangel Network, to spread a message across the world to get every person to say the word Doctor at the same moment, which then gives the Doctor deus ex machina powers. Oh, what? You think that all sounds a bit convoluted? Well, don't worry, the Doctor explains it perfectly. I've had a whole year to chill myself into the psychic network and integrate with its matrices. Yeah, that, that was just nonsense, wasn't it? For some reason, the Master can no longer fire the ships, but he can certainly blow them up, destroying the Earth. Although the Doctor knows he would never do that, as that would kill him too. And he's right, and the Master surrenders. Jack then destroys the Paradox Machine, causing time to reverse a whole year to just after the President was killed. Why does he still have to die? Killing the President is still a paradox. Actually, so is that woman. Why didn't it go back even further? Also, only people on board the Valiant can remember what happened for some reason. 
Martha's mum goes to kill the master, but the doctor talks her out of it, but then Lucy kills him anyway. The doctor begs the master to regenerate, but the master refuses and dies. So the doctor burns his corpse and then asks Jack to come with him, coming aboard the TARDIS full time again. But Jack declines, deciding to stay with Torchwood. So the Doctor then breaks Jack's Vortex Manipulator so that future episodes of Torchwood aren't too easy to fix. I mean, pretty much every episode of Torchwood Series 1 would have ended in like 5 minutes if Jack had a Vortex Manipulator. Like that man who literally killed himself just because he wanted to go back to the past. They could have fixed that like that. But no, the Doctor's making things actively harder for Jack because I think he just doesn't like him. Jack also reveals that when he first joined the Time Agency, they called him the face of Bo, which blows the Doctor and Martha's mind. Although, why would someone call him the face of Bo? It makes sense in the future when he's that big old face, but as a person, it just doesn't make sense. Good twist, bad execution. Then, Martha also decides to leave the Doctor, telling him that she needs to stay and be with her family. And then also tells the Doctor that she loves him, but doesn't want to keep pining over him. So she gives him a phone in case she needs to reach him, and leaves. And then finally the Titanic crashes through the TARDIS, and the series ends with the Doctor saying what a lot again. This series was really good, with a lot more mature type storytelling. There were episodes like Human Nature and Family of Blood, which were more of an adult oriented drama than a kids show. And I feel like, unfortunately, we have reached the very apex of Russell T. Davis finales, where he's kind of just run out of ways to fix everything. So he's just gone straight up Deus Ex Machina and just been like, oh, there's some satellites, oh, people can use Power of Prayer, oh, the Doctor's magical space Jesus now. Eh. Overall, though, really good season and probably my favourite of the whole Russell T. Davis era. Now, there was this other Doctor Who spin-off called Totally Doctor Who that aired concurrently with Season 2 and 3 of Doctor Who, coming out on Thursdays and then Fridays. Now, in the process of making this video, I was also going through some old VHSs I recorded, and on one of them I found a trailer for Totally Doctor Who, which I can't seem to find anywhere online, so it might technically be a piece of lost media. Either way, here it is. Adventure. That's totally out of this galaxy. Where you can create your own world. And come face to face. With huge stars. Come on, let's go. Where there's a cosmos of stuff. About the greatest show of all time. Join us and be part of an exclusive journey. Into the world of the Doctor. We're totally Doctor Who. Are you? Starts Thursday at 5 on CBBC One. Previous time travel experience not necessary. This show is presented by Barney Harwood and Liz Baker, and then later Kirsten O'Brien. It was kind of a talk show where they'd have special guests from Doctor Who on it, and there'd be some behind the scenes segments, but the main draw of the show was simply that each episode would end by showing a 30 second clip of the upcoming episode. That's the sole reason I watched it, and I'm sure it was the case for many other kids watching. But, other than just that 30 seconds, the other main draw of Totally Doctor Who during its second series was that each episode would have a short animation consisting of around 3 minutes, but when all smushed together would amount to a fully animated episode of Doctor Who, called The Infinite Quest. So, let's check it out to see if it was any good. And I'm not one to judge a book by its cover, but I'm going to judge this low budget animation by its art style 100%. It looks terrible, like they made Flash animation look even more cheap somehow. And yes, I'm sure the budget for this was so, so small, but still. Also, the voice acting sounds like everyone's speaking into those terrible microphones you get in Poundland. It is at least voiced by David Tennant and Freema Agerman though. Which is something, I guess? Well, okay, look, maybe the story's good. I sure do doubt it, though. So, the Doctor and Martha show up on a pirate spaceship with this Captain Baltazar, voiced by Anthony Head, who previously was the Krillotane head teacher. Anyway, he plans on sending out a ray to turn everyone in the galaxy into diamonds. But the Doctor then rusts his ship and leaves. Wait, hang on, did the animation just loop there? I didn't do that, they just cut to the same clip to double it. Oh, this is... this is already terrible. So, Baltazar's parrot, Kor, takes the TARDIS to its home planet and warns them that Baltazar is now after something called the Infinite, which grants the owner whatever it desires. Kor gives the pair this data chip, which when you have all four, it will show you the way to the Infinite. And it's secretly a tracker that Baltazar is using, so that he can use them to find the Infinite. 
the second ship is on this planet of giant oil rigs and more pirates. I guess it's kind of cool that the animation allows for these interesting planets. I'll give it that, okay? After fighting this skeleton who wants a new body, they find the second chip, as it's this pirate woman's earring. The next chip is on this bug planet, and the Doctor and Martha meet this lizard and this bug queen, who invaded this planet to eat dung or something. The Doctor stops the war and gets the next chip. The final chip is on this icy prison planet, where the Doctor is immediately arrested for a load of outstanding warrants, before then immediately escaping, and getting the last data chip really easily. And then Balthazar shows up and takes them, and Core apologises for betraying Martha, and dies. Balthazar enters the TARDIS and forces the Doctor to show him the way to the Infinite, before then zapping him and leaving him for dead. Balthazar sends Martha into this place to find it, and the Doctor's here. Except it's not the Doctor, it's the Infinite showing Martha her heart's desire. That is the Doctor though and he realises that the Infinite is pretty much dead and only strong enough to show a brief glimpse of what you want, and it shows Balthazar a load of gold. The Infinite then breaks apart, and the Doctor leaves Balthazar here. I'll say this wasn't as bad as I thought it would be, I mean, it's not good, but at least it wasn't boring. I think that's because due to the nature of it being shown in 3 minute segments, pretty much every 3 minutes we got a new location. Which, yeah, helped to maintain my interest I guess. Let's take a quick break now to look at some Doctor Who toys. And by that, I mean we're going to look at the 2007 edition of the Argos catalogue. If you have no idea what Argos is, then it's pretty difficult to explain. Well, it's a shop in the UK, but you don't get to see any of the stuff that they're selling. So what they would do is they'd give out these big catalogues full of all the stuff they were selling. And they were big catalogues, like 2,000 pages in each one. In fact, after the Bible, Argos catalogues were the most common book found in people's homes. And obviously, at its peak, it featured a lot of Doctor Who toys. So, let's look at some of the toys that Argos were selling around the time of Series 3. We've got a big, full-size Dalek-human hybrid helmet. And I remember Argos did a few of these helmets, but one I got was the Cyberman one, which was so cool. Or at least it was until five minutes after I opened it when some random girl grabbed a big tree branch, smacked it into my head and scratched up all the paint on it. We've also got the Cult of Scar action figures where you can get all four Daleks and the Genesis Arc for $29.99, that's a good price. They've got figures from Series 1 and I do actually own quite a few of these. Here we have an original Series 1 Chris Freckleston with so little articulation. Just, he's so stiff and he just can't really move so he's just like in this pose all the time. And he did come with a tiny, tiny, can you see that? A tiny little sonic screwdriver. We've got a rose figure, this is from very early on in production as the, they started off not giving them proper articulation like all Rose can really do is, is just that, she can kind of move her arm like outwards and just spin her wrists which is weird and she can kind of move a little bit forward and back but that's it. Captain Jack from series one in his World War 2 outfit and he can for some reason do the splits. A couple of Autons from series one, we got that pig thing, we got a big old Slovene with its stupid little arm and it's that doesn't have a fart feature but it does have a bum which is nice, a nice crack. There's the Satan Pit set, which everyone remembers from their favourite Chibnall penned episode. We've got some figures from Series 3. Martha Jones, she's got, a, you see, a lot more articulation than Rose Tyler, because they've actually put in some effort with this one. Look, look I can make her just do a little, do a little crab walk. A couple of Jadoon here, one with a helmet, one without, and you'd think the helmet would just be removable, but no, the helmet is like wielded on. I'd actually kind of like to smash this open to see if there actually is anything under here. I bet there's not, I bet it's just solid plastic, you don't actually get to see the rhino head. And these ones, and these ones also came with like loads of tiny accessories, which I'm surprised I haven't lost really. I've got this Carrionite figure, which is... Definitely one of the worst figures. Uh, I don't know how I've ended up with this out of all the action figures I could have got. Look, oh, I don't like J.K. Rowling, you know. Which makes a good point. Got a Scarecrow from Human Nature. And these figures were so cheap. Look at that, £6.64. I mean, a weird price, admittedly, but still a cheap one. There's the face of Bo for £15, and it's got this little bit on top that you can pull back so that you can make his mouth open, kind of. You are not... Alone. 
That's, uh, that's pretty much all you can really do with that, isn't it? We've got a TARDIS, but the figure is not included. So I've also got this, which isn't an action figure, but it does go kind of with the action figures. It's actually a money box. And I think when you put money in, Chris Freckleston would say something, or it would make TARDIS sounds. I don't fully remember. It does have batteries, though, so it probably did something. A Daleks in Manhattan set. We've got the human Dalek. It's pretty cool. Here's a Dalek Fay, and you can tell it's Dalek Fay because it's missing all the back plates. And see, you see how easy that is to take off. That just shows that I can't get it back in. No wonder people are missing these so much. Whenever I'd see any of these Dalek figures, they'd always just be just missing one of these. The arm stalks are fine. They're like stuck in, but for some reason that just slips right out, and I don't know why. A full Cyberman costume. This little alarm clock. These big 12 inch figures, a Jadoon helmet, a little remote controlled Dalek. So here are a couple Daleks, but if you can see here, there's like a little bit of clearness on them. And that's because, well, these were the very first Daleks I got on that Christmas day when my mum tried getting me into Doctor Who by getting me a load of Doctor Who stuff. What's good about these is that they were remote controlled and they could shoot one another so you could get two Daleks to fight each other. And this wasn't a Dalek design that was on the screen. I think they needed two separate Dalek designs to distinguish them. And it's so cool because this one's unique to this set. And, oh geez, I can only imagine how gross the battery compartments in these are now. An LCD game that I actually probably should have got to review on this video. Hmm, I might have to get that for another video. There were the Sonic Screwdriver toys, and they were just the best. Because they weren't just a Sonic Screwdriver, they were also a pen which had invisible ink on it. And you could use the UV light on the Sonic Screwdriver to see the invisible ink. Oh, it was so cool. There was a full TARDIS set, which I did actually own. The only problem was it was mostly made of paper. Like, you'd have to assemble it yourself and slot in all the plasticky bits. But then you'd also have paper which would rip and kind of bend. And then there wasn't really a good way to store it. And it would all kind of just fall apart after a bit. I'll be honest, not a great toy. And then finally, another 12-inch remote control Dalek. This one styled after Dalek Fay. This is the toy that pretty much everyone owned. Just a 12-inch Dalek that was remote controlled. And every single one had the eye stalk snapped off. I bet that if you watching this still own one of these Daleks, or in fact any of the Dalek action figures, then the eye stalk is currently snapped off. Go on, pause the video, go check, I'll wait. Did you check? See? I told you. I've just noticed that it's pretty weird that the Argos catalogue has the Series 1 figures and the Series 3 figures, but not the Series 2 figures. And, well, I got all my Series 2 figures out of storage, so you're just going to have to take a look at them anyway. Gone Ood. It's, uh, it's an Ood. It's gone a bit weird and white and a little bit sticky and gross but it's just just a nude it's got this little ball it's a nude this was the biggest of all the figures i think it was the, the werewolf figure and it's huge like let's put this next to next to the rose figure it's just it's massive in comparison just there were a couple different K9 designs of slightly different size. I think this one was a remote control one, and then this one, the whole thing it could do was clip off its uh, little front bit so that you could see the insides. So yeah, this one though. Whoa. Now, as for the Cybermen, I had quite a lot of Cybermen. I, I like Cybermen a lot. The thing is, they released two different types of Cyberman. Like, there's this sort of type of Cyberman, and then there's this type of Cyberman with the gun on his arm, which was only from Doomsday and Army of Ghosts, which is so weird they'd do that tiny little difference. And this Cyberman seems to have a bit of a charred face as well. Don't know what happened to him. But what's better than all the Cybermen? The Cyber Controller, which I got a set from Toys R Us, which even came with this big Cyber Throne, and you can plug, like, all the little dials into his nipples... It's, it's really weird. We've got a couple Krillotanes, and just saying, it is a bit weird that the only black teacher then turned into a different coloured Krillotane, right? I mean, that was just a disguise, so why was he a different coloured Krillotane? And then finally we've got David Tennant's Doctor, which is, yeah, that's, that's, that's my collection. So back to the Sarah Jane Adventures now. And whilst the pilot special for the Sarah Jane Adventures was an hour long, the actual series consisted of hour long stories that were split in half into two half hour episodes, with one episode airing each week, making each episode essentially a two parter with a cliffhanger in between. 
Therefore, whilst each series would only contain 6 stories, it would contain 12 episodes. So for the purpose of this review, I'm just going to talk about them as one story rather than two episodes as it will make it so much simpler. With that in mind, let's start with the first story, Revenge of the Slovene. It's the first day of school and Maria and Luke soon meet this kid called Clyde, who's just fully replacing Kelsey from the special. Oh, and the teacher's a fat, farty, flamboyant Slovene. Shut up! And the school is weird in general with mouldy food and the smell of metal. Now, let's talk about Maria's parents for a bit. Can we talk about Maria's parents? I've been dying to talk about Maria's parents all day. I think it's really novel how in this show, her dad is shown to be a great, caring father, and her mother is just the worst, like totally rude and uncaring for her daughter, and they establish that she ran off with a judo instructor, and I find that just a really interesting dynamic, which you don't often see, and especially in children's programmes. Like, it's always the mum who ends up with the kids, but not here, this mum just sucks. Oh, yeah, meanwhile, these Slovene teachers who are overacting to the point of cringe are doing something that causes all the electricity to go out. The next day, Sarah Jane goes to check out the school and finds something suspicious about the company that built it. And the Slovene learn that Luke is a genius, so they use him to help fix up their machine, which is used for storing energy. Clyde, Maria and Luke all stick around after school to find the Slovene unmasking. A Slovene also attacks Sarah Jane at the construction company, and Luke discovers the Slovene's secret lab. Oh, also it turns out that this kid is a Slovene, and I just think that's mad that they had to cast an overweight kid to be this Slovene. That poor kid, he must have had it ripped out of him for this. Like, we need a fat kid for this. We need a fat kid, and we need to draw attention to the fact that he's fat. Can we also make him act all flamboyant, please? Of course we can. That poor kid, this was probably his first acting role and this is what he got. No, wait, checking his IMDb page, he was in one thing before this. He was in the 2005 film Charlie and the Chocolate Factory as Augustus' Gloop's double. That poor kid. Not even Augustus Gloop, but his double. Come on. Sarah Jane escapes the Slovene by spraying perfume and the kids escape by using deodorant. They all go to Sarah Jane's house and work out that the Slovene using a load of air machines across the globe to drain all the world's energy. And they then use Mr Smith's computer to find out the Slovene's weaknesses. And hold on a second, Mr Smith has records on aliens including the Beast. How are there records of Satan? Only the Doctor ever got a good look at him, and that was really far in the future. You cannot tell me that Mr. Smith has records on the beast. Anyway, they head back to the school armed with vinegar as the Slovenes start draining the sun, and Maria straight up just murders one of the Slovene. Then Luke destroys their machine, and the Slovene either die or teleport away. I think this is a better introduction of the show than the special, as it has more links to Doctor Who with the Slovene. They have to go through all the similar beats of introducing this world, because Clyde is a new character who has to be introduced to it all. And I just feel this episode is a lot more focused, and the main characters are a lot less fleshed out and likeable. Except, of course, for teacher Slovenes, they're just the worst. I shall smite the Grand Council, crush the Senate, the Blatherine and the Hostrazine will beg for mercy at my feet! But we mustn't get carried away. First things first, we have the equation. Nothing can stop us. Now it begins. In Eye of the Gorgon, Clyde, Luke and Sarah Jane all go to check out this retirement home where people have been seeing strange things. Specifically, a nun. And then this woman with dementia gives Luke this weird talisman, asking him to protect it. Meanwhile, Maria's mum shows up at their house, asking to stay as her boyfriend broke up with her, and then blames Maria's dad for the affair she had. She is truly awful. But Maria finally calls her mum out for being so awful, after she says that Luke and Sarah Jane are a bit weird. Mr. Smith analyses the talisman and Maria and Sarah Jane head back to the retirement home to speak to the woman who starts talking about aliens and something called a Gorgon. You know, like Medusa. Basically something that can turn someone to stone. Meanwhile, some nuns kidnap Luke and take him to St. Agnes Abbey. Our heroes follow, find Luke and the Gorgon. The nun says that they need the talisman to open a doorway to the Gorgon homeworld, keeping Clyde and Luke hostage until they get it. So they go to Sarah Jane's house, take the talisman, and the Gorgon turns Maria's dad to stone. Mr. Smith explains that they have exactly 90 minutes before Maria's dad becomes fully stoned forever. So Maria talks to the old woman again, and Sarah Jane heads back to St. Agnes Abbey to find Luke and Clyde. 
Meanwhile, Maria's mum breaks into Sarah Jane's house because she's just the worst, finds the statue of her ex-husband and opens up to it, finally admitting that she sucks. Meanwhile, Sarah Jane gets taken to the Gorgon who wants to use her body as a new host and the doorway opens ready for the Gorgons to arrive. But then Maria shows up with a mirror she got from the old lady and turns the Gorgon to stone. They then take the talisman and use it to bring Maria's dad back and Maria's mum thankfully leaves. I hate her so much. In the Warriors of Kudlak, Luke is given some vouchers for laser tag by this threatening guy with pliers. Because you see, Plier Man is working for Cockroach Guy, called Kudlak, who wants children. Uh oh. Meanwhile, Sarah Jane interviews a parent of a missing child, and interviews the missing child's best friend too. Apparently there was a weird storm the day this kid went missing, and Mr. Smith confirms that 24 more children have gone missing during weird storms as well. Sarah Jane and Maria then use this machine to learn that the storms are being used to teleport people, and big surprise, the storms are coming from the laser tag place. Meanwhile, Luke feels guilty because he knew the missing kid, and gave him the nickname of Corporal, not knowing that his dad died in Iraq. Jeez. And then worries that he's the reason that the kid went missing. Clyde tries cheering him up by taking him to A, the cinema, B, literally anywhere other than laser tag, or C, laser tag. Yep, they go laser tag, and it turns out that Luke is really good at it. And as a result, Luke and Clyde get to play level 2, which it turns out just means being kidnapped and teleported to a spaceship. Sarah Jane and Maria snoop around the laser tag place and find Plyer's guy, who points a gun at them, but they escape and meet Kudlak who points a gun at them, but they escape again. Luke and Clyde break out of this crate that they've been locked in, and find some of the other missing kids. Kudlak beams up to the spaceship and tells all the kids that they're going to be soldiers in an alien war, which surprisingly the kids aren't best pleased about. Meanwhile, Plyer's guy shows up at Sarah Jane's house, threatening her again, but Maria electrocutes him. They all then head back to the laser tag place and teleport onto the ship. Luke hacks into the ship and finds an escape shuttle, but then they all get captured. Luke then shows Kudlak that the war ended 10 years ago and his AI systems were feeding him wrong information, so Kudlak apologises, everyone goes home, and Luke gets a kiss. Whatever Happened to Sarah Jane is the first of many stories that have Sarah Jane in the title. They'd always have one of these episodes per season, and they were always the best ones, usually delving pretty deep into Sarah Jane as a character. This episode starts with everyone having a good time at a skate park and taking photos as this thing lurks in the shadows. Sarah Jane tells everyone that a meteor is heading for the Earth, but it's fine because Sarah Jane just tells Mr. Smith to bounce it away. Ugh, what would we do without Sarah Jane, eh? Sarah Jane then gives Maria this cube which she was told to give to the person she trusts the most, and that thing comes back and starts wiping all trace of Sarah Jane from existence. Maria wakes up the next day to find Sarah Jane gone, and no one remembers her, with some woman named Andrea living in Sarah Jane's house instead. Also, all the photos from the skate park have now changed, and even now Luke's gone too. So Maria phones Clyde, but he doesn't really know her now either. Maria does some digging at the library, and learns that Sarah Jane died in 1964 after falling off a pier whilst on a school trip with her friend Andrea, the woman now living in Sarah Jane's house. So Maria goes and confronts Andrea, guessing that she was the one who was supposed to die that day, and Andrea throws Maria out as she starts to remember, finding a cube of her own, and summons the thing, which we find out is called the Trickster. We learn that Andrea made a deal with the Trickster to swap places with Sarah Jane all those years ago, and asks it to get rid of Maria and make her forget again. Then a freaking Grask shows up at Maria's house, remember the Grask? From Attack of the Grask on Christmas Day with the Grask? Tell me you haven't forgotten about the Grask. Well, the Grask chases Maria and teleports her away, deleting Maria from existence to everyone apart from her dad, who just happens to be holding the cube at the time. Maria's mum then shows up, confirming that she doesn't have a daughter, and that there's no possible way she'd ever want kids, again confirming she's the worst. And Maria manages to break free from the Grask, and escapes into 1964, where she meets Sarah Jane as her and Andrea head for the pier. Maria tries to warn them not to do it, but then the Grask reappears and drags Maria off into this white void. And, oh look, Sarah Jane's here too. They realise that that meteor that was going to hit Earth is going to hit Earth without Sarah Jane and Mr. Smith. So Sarah Jane confronts the Trickster and finds out that the Trickster did all of this because he just wants to see the chaos of the Earth being destroyed. 
I mean, have you ever thought about just getting a hobby, mate? Stamp collecting or something? Maria's dad confronts Andrea, and she admits that she, in fact, is the one who was supposed to fall off the pier. But the trickster came to her and offered her the chance to trade places with Sarah Jane. The trickster then shows up again and offers to take Maria's dad too, which Andrea agrees to, and here comes the Grask once more. Maria's dad just kind of easily beats the Grask up, because, I mean, come on, it, look at it, it's a Grask. It's hardly the most threatening thing in the world. It's a Grask. Maria's dad ties it up and brings Maria back. Oh, and the meteor is coming. But the only way to bring Sarah Jane back and stop the meteor is for Andrea to break the deal and die. Which, after some legitimately sad scenes, with Sarah Jane explaining that watching her best friend die as a kid is what motivated her to save others, Andrea agrees and dies as a child. Bringing everyone back and together they all stop the meteor. Also, Maria's dad now knows about aliens. This episode is so dark compared to the others. Like, the inciting incident is a little girl who doesn't want to die, but then the moral is that she has to die anyway. I mean, not many shows have the death of kids as a plot point. Well, okay, I can think of maybe one more, and we're gonna get to that show in a bit. But still, this episode was just really dark and depressing. Let's hope that the series finale has a bit of a lighter tone. The Lost Boy starts with Maria telling her dad all about what's happened over the course of the series. And in a surprisingly realistic turn of events, he says, alright, we're moving. This is all incredibly unsafe, which it is. But then literally a minute later, he changes his mind. Meanwhile, this family are on the news talking about their missing son, Ashley, and it's Luke. Even Mr. Smith confirms their DNA are the same, saying that the Bane must have kidnapped Luke slash Ashley. Maria's mum, now solidly in the running for being the worst person alive, calls the police on Sarah Jane, and they take Luke away. Now, a few questions here. One, why did the police bring the parents to a suspect's home? And two, why is no one handcuffing Sarah Jane? If she is a kidnapper, handcuff her. Idiots. Anyway, thanks to Sarah Jane's friends in higher places, the police let her go. Just who are these corrupt, idiot police officers? Meanwhile, Luke isn't enjoying his new life, probably because it's quickly revealed that his new parents are evil. Sarah Jane tries taking her mind off of Luke by investigating a company working on telekinesis and meets this child genius. Mr. Smith then tells Sarah Jane to go back, telling her to steal a telekinesis headset, whilst Clyde goes to visit Luke, but doesn't get past his mum, who gives Clyde some photographic evidence that Luke is in fact her son. Also, it turns out that genius kid is in cahoots with her parents, and they reveal themselves to all be Slovene, and they don't even need to be fat now. Even the kid Slovene isn't fat. Clyde asks Mr. Smith whether or not the photo is fake, and Mr. Smith's like, yeah, it is, because I faked it, revealing that he is in fact super duper evil and zaps Clyde. Maria and her dad break into Luke's house and find some discarded skin, as the Slovene are off taking Luke to the telekinesis lab. Clyde wakes up inside Mr. Smith as Sarah Jane delivers Mr. Smith the headset. Maria tells Sarah Jane that Luke's parents are Slovene, and Clyde communicates with Maria's dad through his computer, warning him about Mr. Smith being evil. Then Mr. Smith starts doing an evil laugh. <laughs> Mr. Smith? <laughs> Human, so inevitably predictable. And try shooting everyone. We learn that the Slovene's plan is to use the telekinesis headset to suck up all of Luke's brain power to sell it, but Luke uses the headset to escape. Our heroes show up to save Luke armed with bottles of vinegar, and it turns out that the Slovene were in fact working for Mr. Smith, who was playing everyone all along so that he could use the telekinesis helmet Sarah Jane stole so that he can use Luke's brainwaves to bring the moon crashing down onto the Earth to free his species that are buried under the Earth's crust. A lot is happening right now. The apocalypse begins as the Earth comes crashing down onto the Earth, killing more people than in any episode of Doctor Who. Through earthquakes and tsunamis, the Master killed 10% of the population and that all got reversed, but this is just like the actual end of the world and people just stay dead. Mr. Smith brings Clyde back and oh look, K9 shows up again, attacking Mr. Smith, allowing Sarah Jane to infect him with a computer virus that wipes his memory and puts the moon back. And then the Slovene leave. And we end on this nice shot of everyone standing together despite so many people having died. Hold up, why does Maria's mum get to be in the final shot? She was the true villain of the series. So that was series one of the Sarah Jane Adventures. I've got to say, I was not looking forward to re-watching this show, not having watched it since it first aired, and I was very worried it was going to be just too kiddie and too cringy. 
But once you get past the teething troubles of some of the early episodes, I found myself looking forward to watching each episode. It's really not bad. Especially whatever happened to Sarah Jane. If you want to test out to see if you'll like this show, then give that episode a watch because it is truly great. So another Children in Need and another Doctor Who mini episode. We had Born Again, then the year after they just showed a clip from The Runaway Bride, and now we have another proper mini episode called Time Crash. Set straight after Martha's exit, suddenly time starts going weird and Pete Davidson shows up. No, wait, that's not right. Peter Davidson shows up, also known as the Fifth Doctor. There's not really a lot of plot to this one, just a whole lot of fan service. Two TARDISes crash into each other, but the Tenth Doctor knows how to fix it, as the Fifth Doctor watched him do it and remembered. This is very much just David Tennant fawning over his favourite Doctor. You were my Doctor. And if you like Peter Davidson's Doctor, then I highly recommend it. Also, there's just the novelty of this technically being the first multi-Doctor episode of The Revival. So, it's worth checking out for that reason alone. Oh, and then of course, the Titanic smashes through the TARDIS again. On to Voyage of the Damned then, the 2007 Christmas special. The Doctor fixes the shields and materialises the TARDIS on board the Titanic. Except this isn't the Titanic that we know, it's a space cruise ship, named after Earth's most famous ship. And this ship is owned by a man named Max Capricorn. The ship also features these information robots called Heavenly Hosts, but they're all starting to malfunction. Sure hope that doesn't become a problem later. Also, Kylie Minogue is here, playing a waiter called Astrid Peff, and the Doctor takes a bit of a shine to her. He also meets this couple who are here because they won a competition, and are about to go on an excursion to Earth. So the Doctor and Astrid join them, with their tour guide being this man, Mr Copper, and all his facts about Earth are just totally wrong. Also, no way, Banner Cafalata is here. Who's Banner Cafalata, you ask? Why, it's Banner Cafalata. That's all you need to know. So, they all teleport to Earth and find it deserted. All apart from this man, Bernard Cribbins, who tells the Doctor that everyone's left London as Christmas is dangerous, and after the past two Christmas specials, it does make sense. Then, after barely arriving on Earth, everyone gets teleported back due to a power fluctuation. Meanwhile, these meteors are passing the Titanic, and this insane captain is magnetising them to the ship, and taking the shielding down. The Doctor does a bit of sonicking and finds out about this, but when he tries to warn the captain, he gets arrested. The captain then shoots this guy called Midshipman Frame, and continues on his path towards the meteors, telling Midshipman Frame that he was offered a lot of money to do it. The meteors hit, and all the people we've met... Astrid! Food! Morbin! Mr Copper! Banner Capalata! Yes! You, what was your name? Uh, Rickson Slade. ...are now tasked with getting to the TARDIS. Wait, no, there it goes, floating away. So the Doctor calls the bridge, and learns that if the ship crashes to Earth, it'll wipe out the entire planet. So that's our new mission. Get to the bridge. Now, as the Doctor and his group make their way through the destroyed ship, we get a lot of fun small character moments, such as Foon entering the competition 5,000 times and spending all their money, Banner Cafalata being a cyborg and asking Astrid out, and Mr Copper faking his degree in Earthonomics. And again, Russell T Davis is just the best at making side characters likeable very, very quickly. The gang soon run into some hosts who start trying to kill everyone, but our group escapes, with the Doctor learning that there's something mysterious on Deck 31. And then Morvin dies crossing this gap, with all these hosts then flying down and attacking everyone. Banner Cafalata uses his cyborg powers to send out an electromagnetic pulse to take out all the hosts, but then dies as a result. Mr Cooper then removes his EMP device to use it as a weapon, and another host then reactivates, but Foon then grabs it and pulls it down with her into the abyss. So that's like three dead characters there in as many minutes. Astrid asks to come with the Doctor in the TARDIS once all this is over, and the Doctor says yes, so she kisses him. The Doctor then heads off to find the hosts, and tells them that he's not a passenger or staff, so they can't kill him, and instead they have to take him to the nearest figure of authority, which is on Deck 31. The hosts agree, bringing him to Deck 31, and Astrid teleports after them. The Doctor finds Max Capricorn there, who's just ahead in this life support system. Turns out Max caused the ship to crash, and is doing all this to get back of the people who ousted him from his own company. Astrid then forklifts Mac over the edge of this pit, and into the ship's engine killing them both. 
The Doctor is now apparently the next highest point of authority, despite him not even being crew, and so the hosts take him to the bridge, where we learn that Midshipman Frame's first name is called Alonzo, meaning the Doctor finally gets his wish from Doomsday. Alonso, Alonso. The Doctor then restarts the engines and stops the Titanic from crashing just as it's about to hit Buckingham Palace. And we get to hear possibly the worst impression of the Queen that I've ever heard. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. The Doctor remembers that Astrid was wearing a teleport bracelet as she died, so he brings her back, kind of, as the ship's too damaged to bring her back all the way. So the Doctor kisses her and then she kind of just floats off. The Doctor then brings Mr. Copper to Earth to start a new life, learning about Earth firsthand, with a good million pounds to start him off, which the Doctor tells him is worth 50 million credits. Which would mean that earlier, Foon spending 5,000 credits, which is apparently the price of two first class tickets, is only worth 100 pound. That's the cheapest cruise I've ever seen. All in all, this was a fun, if very inconsequential Christmas special. But, you know, I liked it. I think it was probably my favourite Christmas special so far. Now, the thing is, Voyage of a Damned is a great episode, but it's completely ruined for me. And because I'm the one in charge of this video, I get to ruin it for you too. You see, Doctor Who magazine once posted an interview with one of the episode's stars, Clive Swift, now, Clive Swift died in 2019, rest in peace, so I do feel a bit bad bashing him for the next few minutes, but I can't not, as this interview which took place in Clive's trailer towards the end of filming the episode is just too bizarre not to discuss. So, he was being interviewed by Benjamin Cook, who apparently isn't the greatest judging by his recent tweets, but he's not the one on trial here. Clive Swift is, and he is hilariously rude in this interview. First of all complaining that the interview is using a tape recorder and doesn't know shorthand, before then straight up saying, why should I do this? I'm not getting paid, am I? Look, I'm just going to read some quotes because it's mad. So, Benjamin Cook asks, could you tell me a bit about your character in Voyage of the Damned? And Clive responds with, you don't need me to tell you that. Have you read the script? That's what I perform. You can tell them about my character. What a silly question. Which, it's like the man doesn't understand what an interview is and thinks he's just getting harassed by this interviewer. But my favourite bit is how the interview ends. Ben says one final question and Clive interrupts and says, I think that's more than enough, isn't it? How many pages are you going to have on Mr. Copper? Ben says, well, I was just going to ask, and Clive interrupts again, saying, there's no reason why I should talk to you at all, so you shouldn't push it. I'm sure you'll write something very nice. I know that you all think that this is a big world, this who business, but it isn't. There are much bigger things than this. Ben says, maybe, but it means a lot to a great many of us. And Clive just says, yeah, yeah, goodbye. Go read this interview yourself. It's mad. It's mad that it happened. It's mad that it got printed. And it is all I'm thinking about whenever I watch this episode now. In the finale Christmas special of the TV show Extras, there's a scene where Ricky Gervais' character Andy Millman gets a role as a slug monster in Doctor Who, which is likely a dig at Peter Kay, and even if it's not, I'm going to pretend it is. And in the scene where Ricky Gervais is playing the slug monster, David Tennant's here and he plays the scene completely straight, as though it's a real episode of Doctor Who. He's totally in character, and it's only a minute long scene, but it's basically a tiny Doctor Who episode. Okay, let's take a little break here to look at some Doctor Who games for a bit. I remember just after Christmas one year, we visited Harrods, and in the toy section, my mind nearly imploded when I saw a Doctor Who game there for Nintendo DS. I picked it up and saw it was a Doctor Who Top Trumps game. I knew what Top Trumps was, of course, but thought, no, this has to be more than just Top Trumps. Because I also know what video games are, and video games have platforming, and levels, and a story mode. And so I spent all my Christmas money on it, and it was just Top Trumps. I was so disappointed. I later found out that there was also a version on PS2 and Wii, and sure, the DS has its limitations, but I bet the PS2 version has- Oh god damn it! You see, if you wanted your fix of actual Doctor Who games around this time, you had to visit the Doctor Who website, something I would check religiously every single day for news about upcoming episodes, and they also had Flash games that you could play, and so using the Wayback Machine, let's relive some of these games, and oh my god, they're so bad! 
these games range from technically playable to a downright broken mess. Like this Waters of Mars pipe game where you literally cannot line up the pipes. There was also this game featuring Jimmy Savile, and this one where Margaret Slovene shouts slag at you over and over. How did I put up with these games when I was younger? Because I remember playing them all and getting excited every time a new one came out. Turns out at that age you could have stuck a picture of an ood on a wood chipper and I'd have dived head first in. I played like 30 games for this and I don't think I was invested in any one for longer than at most a minute. The only passable ones are the ones based on other games like this Breakout clone. And for the most part, the instructions do a terrible job of telling you how to play the game. On the whole, the games are just incredibly shoddily made. If I had to pick some favourites, I guess my very favourite was this Dalek one where you move barrels around, as I actually completed two whole levels before I got bored of it. I also didn't mind this Bejeweled clone, as every time you matched three Absorbaloffs, they shouted Clom at you. And, you know, that's, that's fun. Otherwise, I've got to say all of the rest were just terrible. They can all get in the bin. And if you have any fond memories of playing these games, don't go searching for them to relive your nostalgia as it'll make you sad realising just how awful they were. Honestly, don't do it. It's just not worth it. Less than one month after the Voyage of the Damned, we got Series 2 of Torchwood, beginning on the 16th of January 2008, and started with the episode Kiss Kiss Bang Bang which has this fish just driving around on cocaine and Torchwood chasing after them. Laddie Torchwood. And um, I've got to say, that is a bold way to start a series, and this episode's already feeling pretty promising. So they chase it to this house, and then Jack shows up and shoots the fish in the face. Turns out Jack has been gone for quite a while. Remember when he went off travelling with the Doctor at the end of Series 3? Well, now he's back, and everyone's pretty annoyed at him for just disappearing without telling anyone. And more importantly, now won't even say where he went. Come on, Jack, you declined going on trips with the Doctor in order to stay with these people. Just stop keeping secrets from them. Well, anyway, this guy called John Hart shows up through a portal, and he's played by James Masters. He then quickly throws this guy off a roof and waves some guns around before then leaving a message to Jack, asking to meet him. Jack does, and they kiss, and then start fighting pretty graphically. This is Jack's old friend, or enemy, it's still difficult to tell, but they do definitely know each other from the time agency that Jack used to work for. John Hart tells everyone that they need to find three bombs that someone planted around Cardiff, and we also learn that Gwen and Reese are now engaged. Which is nice, or really unhealthy, depending on the way you look at it. Everyone splits into groups to retrieve the bombs, with Gwen and John finding the first one. John then kisses Gwen, which paralyses her, and he steals the bomb. Tosh and Owen find the second, but also get it stolen by John, who then goes on to shoot Owen. Jack and Yanto search for the last one, and Jack asks Yanto out on a date, to which Yanto says yes. So, um, it was hinted at in series 1 that after Yanto's girlfriend died, Jack and he had some kind of a thing, but here it's explicitly stated. Which is nice, or really unhealthy depending on where you look at it. Oh, and John threatens Yanto and gets to Jack, wanting the bomb so that he can sell it, and offering Jack the chance to come work with him at the time agency once more. Jack declines and throws the bomb off the roof, and so John throws him off the roof. John then heads back to the Torchwood base to do something evil, but everyone else confronts him, even Jack, who isn't dead. John reveals that the bombs weren't bombs, but in fact parts of a map that would reveal the location of a diamond. He activates it, but ironically it reveals itself to really be a bomb that then latches onto him. And it's going to explode in 10 minutes. So John then handcuffs himself to Gwen and demands everyone find a way to stop the bomb. They inject him with a bit of everyone's DNA that then confuses the bomb, making it detach from John, and they then throw it into the rift. John says goodbye and leaves, and as he goes he tells Jack that he found Grey. Whatever that means. But Jack seems pretty rolled up about it, meaning it's probably something that's going to be important later. The next episode, Sleeper, has this couple getting burgled in the middle of the night, before something, probably something alien, happens, resulting in one burglar ending up dead, and the other ending up almost dead. Gwen goes to visit the surviving burglar in the hospital, who says that the woman did it, before then conveniently dying without giving any more information. So Jack interviews the woman, but she doesn't seem to know anything. Owen then tries taking her blood, but finds that her skin is impenetrable, and also all the weevils are scared of her, so there's definitely something weird going on. They then use a mind probe on her, which opens up a dormant part of her brain, revealing all the alienness that's lurking inside her. 
Jack quickly realises that she's a sleeper agent, a kind of fake human created to gather intel on the human race before a full-on invasion. They tell the woman about this and she understandably starts freaking out, struggling to accept that she's not human. They decide to cryogenically freeze her until they can figure out a way to fix her, but then more sleeper agents start activating. Also, this baby dies by rolling into traffic, and if she's an alien, how did she even have a baby? Did she adopt? Did she just steal this baby? I mean, I suppose it doesn't matter all that much now, but still. Back at Torchwood, that woman escapes and goes to visit her husband, and then accidentally kills him. And then all the other sleeper agents go on a big old murder spree, stabbing people, blowing up a petrol truck, all so they can gain access to some nuclear weapons the government are storing. Bloody government and their weapons of mass destruction. Jack and Gwen, together with the woman who's doing her best to help, chase one of the sleeper agents down, hitting them with their car, and then they kill it, saving the world. Hooray! The woman then decides not to be cryogenically frozen, and pretends to take Gwen hostage so that everyone would shoot her. Uh, hooray? Now, having watched the first two episodes of series two, I can definitively say that this series is way more watchable than the last one, as all the characters aren't being actively hostile to one another. If we take the American version of The Office as a quick example, when that show first came out, series one of it wasn't very popular. And then for series two, the creators were told to make the characters a little bit nicer to each other, and well, then it went on to become one of the biggest shows of all time. I don't know, it's almost like watching people hate each other isn't really that enjoyable. Now, you could argue that the growing pains of series one were in fact a purposeful choice to show them growing as a team, but by the end of series one, they still didn't feel like a team. But then in series two, they just suddenly do. So I'm not taking that as an excuse. The point is that series two is pretty good so far. To the last man has the Torchwood team unfreezing this World War One soldier called Tom once a year, every year. Apparently he's needed to help stop a time slip that will appear in a hospital and link 1918 to the present. They just don't know when that will be. So every year they unfreeze him, check him out, make sure he's all fine and then stick him back in the freezer. Like one of those Cornettos that's at the back of a freezer and started going all soft. You know the one, you're not going to eat it, but you're not going to fry it away. Oh, also he and Tosh have this thing and every year they spend the day together. Gwen goes to visit the hospital, and can you believe it, the time slips have started happening. Seems like this is the year they actually need him. What are the chances? So Tom and Tosh are interrupted from their date to help fix it. Tom has to return through the time slip in order to close it, sending him back to 1918. But then he won't be able to see Tosh again. Also, Jack secretly knows that when Tom does go back, he'll then be sent back to the war and die in three weeks. Tom spends his final night together with Tosh, and then he returns to the hospital, and Tom decides that he doesn't want to go back. But then after the smallest, tiniest little bit of convincing, he does in fact do the right thing, returning to 1918 and using this key to close the time slip. A very nothingy episode and super forgettable. Damn it, Series 2, you were doing so well. In the episode Meet, Reese, Gwen's boyfriend, works for a haulage company and hears about one of his lorry drivers getting in an accident, so he goes there to find the driver dead. The van was apparently delivering meat to an abattoir, but there's something awfully suspicious about it, and then Torchwood shows up and Reese sees Gwen working for them. Which is obviously a bit of a surprise for him, as he's still under the impression that Gwen's still a police officer. So Torchwood take all the meat and Owen finds out that it's alien. Have you ever eaten alien meat? Yeah. What was it like? Oh, he seemed to enjoy it. Reese begins following Gwen and the rest of the Torchwood team as they go to check out the abattoir. Reese is then quickly captured and interrogated by all the abattoir people, and Reese starts lying and tells them that his lorry driver told him everything about the operation and asks to pick up where he left off, becoming their new delivery driver. The abattoir people agree and take Reese to see this thing, a massive alien whale that just keeps growing, so they've been harvesting it for meat. Later, Reese confronts Gwen about seeing her at the crash site, and so she tells him the truth and takes him to Torchwood. Reese tells the Torchwood team that he's got a job delivering meat, so he can use that to sneak them all inside, where they can hopefully save the big whale. The plan all gets a bit complicated and Reese and Yanto are caught, and then there's a standoff with everyone. Someone tries shooting Gwen, but Reese jumps in front of a bullet and the whale breaks free. Yanto then goes all Keanu Reeves and takes out all the abattoir men, and Owen kills the whale as mercifully as he can. 
Reese is patched up, and Jack hands Gwen an amnesia pill to give to Reese, but she refuses. So now Reese just knows about Torchwood, which I'm hoping offers up some new and interesting story opportunities as a result. Adam has this random guy called Adam working in Torchwood, who everyone seems to recognise except for Gwen. Well, that is until he touches her and implants her head full of false memories. He then implants some false memories in Tosh, making her believe that the pair have been seeing each other for a year. And today is their one year anniversary. Also, Owen is now pining over Tosh, something that Tosh has been doing pretty regularly over the past two seasons, hinting most episodes that she fancies Owen. But now the roles are reversed, all thanks to this Adam guy. But it seems he's also removed all of Gwen's memories of Reese. So when she finds him in their house, she panics and calls Jack over. Except Jack remembers Reese and tries to convince Gwen that she knows him too. Back at Torchwood, Owen and Tosh have a couple beers and Jack tries to hunt down a weevil, but then runs into a vision of his father. And then Adam shows up out of nowhere. Jack finally gives us a bit of backstory telling Adam about his life as a boy, where one day there was an alien invasion and he lost his dad and his little brother. Owen tells Tosh that he loves her, but Tosh shoots him down, saying that she loves Adam. And Gwen starts to remember Reese. Meanwhile, Yanto realises Adam isn't written about in his journal, so confronts him, but Adam then fills Yanto's head with a load of false memories of Yanto being a serial killer, which Yanto then quickly confesses to Jack about all his murders he's done, so Jack uses this lie detector and sees that Yanto is telling the truth or at the very least, believes he is. Jack finally starts to realise that Adam might not be who he says he is, so he locks him up. Adam then tells Jack that he came to this planet to feed off of all of Jack's memories, and needs to implant himself into people's memories in order to survive. So Jack gets the Torchwood team to try to remember their lives before Torchwood, to help rejig their memories, and we learn that all their lives are pretty depressing and just horrible. None of these characters are people that you'd aspire to want to be. They're all just horrible and sad. Anyway, Jack gives them all amnesia pills so that they forget Adam, which thereby weakens him. Adam then tells Jack that if he takes the pill too, he'll also forget the memories of his family, but Jack takes the pill anyway, and then everyone wakes up having no memory of the past two days. Except for Reese, I guess? They just forgot about him there at the end. Like, surely when he sees Gwen, he's going to remind her of everything that happened. It seems like maybe the writers are the ones who took the amnesia pill and forgot about Reese. Eh? Yeah? 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 <sighs> this video's too long. The episode reset is very much a turning point for the series. It's when I remember starting to actually really like the show. And it all starts with an appearance from Miss Martha Jones. She's now working as a doctor for UNIT and is here to help Torchwood with a load of murders occurring throughout the UK. She tells Jack that UNIT offered her a job after someone put in a good word for her. After a bit of investigating, they find out that one of these victims had previously been cured of diabetes, and then another of HIV. In fact, all the victims were part of clinical trials for some secret cure to incurable diseases, called Reset. And one such person, who nearly got murdered but got away, is this woman, who then explodes a load of mayflies out of her and dies. Because Reset resets people's health but it also fills them with a load of parasites, which grow up to be these alien mayflies. So, uh, it's not really a cure then, is it? Jack and Owen go to visit the creator of Reset, who's threateningly unhelpful. So Martha then goes undercover as a clinical trial patient, wearing these contact lens cameras that allow the team to see and hear everything she does. Meanwhile, Tosh and Owen start talking about Owen maybe having a crush on Martha, and then Tosh asks Owen out on a date, to which he says yes. So finally, after two series of will they, won't they's, it looks like something is happening between Owen and Tosh. Martha goes snooping around the facility that night, finding some more potential murder victims, and then meets a giant mayfly, before then getting tranquilised and locked up. Torchwood uses the information Martha found to stop a murder, and interrogates the hired assassin. Well, more so tortures him, with a weevil. He tells them that he was hired to kill these people before the mayflies burst out, and then, ironically, mayflies burst out of him. Back at the lab, all the evil scientists have discovered that Martha's immune system has mutated as a result of travelling in time. So they then inject her with Reset to see how her immune system will respond. Tosh straps the assassin's dead body into the front seat of a car and uses it to break into the lab, Weekend at Bernie style. Jack and Owen then confront the evil leader science guy and then Owen uses the device to extract the mayfly from Martha. They all shut down the facility and happy endings all round. Except not quite. 
As the leader guy then shows up and shoots Owen in the chest, Jack then shoots him in the head, but Owen dies. Like, properly. Dead Man Walking starts with Martha conducting an autopsy on the still very dead Owen. Except Jack tells him not to start until he gets back, as he goes off to this abandoned church containing a load of weevils and another resurrection gauntlet. Jack uses the resurrection gauntlet on Owen, and with his final two minutes the team say their goodbyes, and Tosh tells Owen that she loves him. But then, once more, just like Susie, Owen stays alive. Except, unlike Susie, he's not taking Jack's life force. He's just not staying dead. Martha asks Owen what's after death, and he once more tells her that there's nothing. Which is actually the opposite of what Susie said, as when she was dead, she said there was something lurking around in the darkness. Owen then slips back into said darkness for a moment and feels something there with him. Further investigating then shows that Owen is mutating and is only around 40% human now. Owen then sneaks off to a club and then almost gets a handy. Except, well, certain things aren't working now due to a lack of blood flow and then Jack shows up and the pair fight and they both get arrested. Turns out that Owen's digestive system no longer works as, remember, he's dead. And that means there's no way to get rid of all that beer he just drank. So we get probably the grossest scene in all of Torchwood. Oh, that is the single most disgusting thing I have ever seen. Kind of disgusting. Owen asks why Jack brought him back, and Jack admits that he'd hoped for a miracle, and still is. They then head back to Torchwood and find that all the weevils from the church are now chasing them. And it turns out that when Owen blacked out, he was in fact possessed by something. Something that now makes the weevils bow down to him. Owen decides that the only way to stop this evil presence from taking over him fully is to be filled with embalming fluid, which will stop his brain from working. As Martha begins the procedure, the gauntlet starts attacking everyone, grabbing hold of Martha and aging her. Owen manages to shoot the gauntlet, and then whatever force was possessing Owen, leaves. They take Martha to the hospital, and the death entity follows, killing a load of patients and staff. And when it successfully kills 13 people, the entity will be able to rule the earth. So Owen kisses Tosh and goes to confront it, managing to defeat the death entity as it has no power over him. And then the episode ends with Martha returning to normal and Owen still kind of being alive-ish. A day in the death starts with Owen talking to this woman who's about to jump off this building, telling her about his life and death. And more specifically, how he recently got fired as Torchwood's medical officer, with Martha temporarily taking over and running more tests on him, confirming that he's now 100% human again, but still pretty dead. The rest of the Torchwood team are investigating some alien whatever, but Owen is left out, yet still stuck at Torchwood. Owen then accidentally cuts himself with a scalpel and has to be stitched up by Martha, as he won't heal, and he can't even feel it, further showing just how sucky life Death is for Owen now. Owen asks Jack for something to do, but he just sends him home to watch TV. But instead of watching TV, Owen decides to instead have a full-on existential crisis. Back in the present, the woman tells Owen about how her husband died on her wedding day, and this is the anniversary of it, giving a pretty good motivation for why she wants to jump. Tosh then went to visit Owen, and he just starts laying into her. Was looking at me, watching me screw all those other women. You're heartbreaking, and now it's different because I'm safe now, aren't I? And it's all cozy and it's romantic, and isn't it beautiful? Breaking his own finger, then running off and jumping into the sea. Later, Torch would need someone to sneak into somewhere, and Owen volunteers, getting inside and not setting off any of the heat sensors because again, he's dead. He then finds this man who's dying, but this alien device is keeping him alive. Except Owen analyses it and finds that it's not keeping him alive at all, it's just building up to explode. The old man then does start to die, and Owen tries giving him mouth to mouth, but then remembers that he has no breath. Because, yeah, yeah we get it, he's dead. Also, that thing's still going to explode. So Owen decides to hold on to it in the hopes of absorbing all the blast, saying goodbye to everyone, and Tosh tells him that she loves him again. The device goes off, except it's not a bomb, it just sings and does some pretty lights. So what a big waste of time. Martha then leaves, returning to unit, and Owen convinces the woman to step away from the edge and go on living with a newfound sense of hope. And that's the end of the Owen's death free parter. From here on, Owen's still very much dead, and it does get brought up a lot, but it's not really a focus anymore. But I think what we got was still pretty good. 
with us really getting a proper insight into Owen's psyche. And of course, just Martha being here was really nice, even if she didn't really get much to do after her first episode. In Something Borrowed, it's the night before Gwen's wedding. Remember, she's getting married to Reese. Well, she's late to her hen night as she was off fighting this shapeshifter who then bites her. And the next morning, she wakes up heavily pregnant, naturally. As it turned out, the alien impregnated her through the bite. Jack tells her to postpone the wedding, but Gwen says no. Ree says that they'll postpone the wedding, but Gwen says no, again. So all the guests begin arriving, including this very suspicious woman, who then eats this man. Yep, she's another shapeshifter, and she then webs Tosh and the best man up. The ceremony begins, and Jack bursts in, stopping the wedding, and Owen tries extracting the baby from Gwen, like he did with Martha's Mayfly. Jack rescues Tosh, and the pair start chasing down the shapeshifter, but then lose her, because she's now changed into Reese's mother, and takes Gwen's mum hostage. So Gwen then shoots her up. Jack then goes to kiss Gwen, which she seems surprisingly up for, despite it being her literal wedding day. But then it turns out to be the shapeshifter again, and Owen shoots it. Reese is finally able to use Owen's device to extract the baby, and then goes to chainsaw the shapeshifter, but then Jack uses a big old gun to blast it apart. And the wedding goes on, despite everyone just having been attacked by an alien, and one of the guests now being dead. We all just gonna forget about that guy that got eaten then? Gwen's unwillingness to postpone the wedding caused a man to die. A man she was presumably close enough to invite to her wedding. Like, people are dancing and eating cake, and, and a man died. Jack then drugs everyone with amnesia pills, and Gwen says there'll be no secrets in her and Reese's wedding. Apart from, I guess, that whole affair with Owen. But I guess that's all just been forgotten about now. Very much like the man who just got eaten. In From Out the Rain, Yanto takes Gwen and Owen to visit this old cinema, where they're showing some old footage of a circus. Footage which has Jack in it. Meanwhile, these two people have escaped from inside the film and are now stealing souls. Jack tells everyone that he was investigating a group called the Night Travellers, so joined this circus as the man who couldn't die. Which, yeah, that's a pretty good act, I'd pay to see that. The two evil circus people from the film then steal the film in order to bring all the other circus people back, so Jack uses an old camera to film them and then exposes the film to light, which wipes them out. And all of the people who had their souls removed throughout the episode die. Except for this one kid. So, hooray, I guess? And that's it, that's the entire episode. This is definitely the most bare-bones episode of Torchwood I've seen so far. Maybe it's just that it's coming after the Owen's Death Trilogy and a wedding episode, but this one just felt extra fillery. I mean, basically nothing happened. I summarised the plot in like 20 seconds. Adrift has Gwen's old police friend Andy asking Gwen to help him investigate the disappearance of a teenage boy. Gwen asks why Andy wasn't at a wedding, and I don't know, it's probably because he was busy not getting eaten. Well, that's supposedly not the reason, as it's apparently because he actually fancies her. I mean, he certainly dodged a bullet. Anyway, back to that teenager's disappearance, and by disappearance I do mean disappearance. One second he's there, the next he's gone. And Jack was also spotted in the area around the same time, but when Gwen asks him about it, he's awfully evasive. Tosh does some energy readings and realises that things aren't just coming out of the rift, but they're also being sucked into it. Gwen and Andy go to support the mother of this missing kid at a support group that she's set up, and a load of people start showing up, all with kids who've gone missing, probably sucked into the rift too, and yep, all of these disappearances coincide with spikes in rift energy. Gwen tells Jack and he's like, yeah, that sucks, but there's nothing we can do about it. Also, Reese and Gwen are already having marital problems, as Gwen tells him that she ain't having no kids what with her work, and Reese is just generally sick of Torchwood and it constantly ruining his life. Which, fair. Gwen then heads back to Torchwood where she finds Ianto and Jack going at it. Gwen tells Jack that she's going to do something about the disappearances, and Jack says nah. But Yanto then slips her a map leading her to an island. So her and Andy get a boat and Gwen goes off without Andy. She reaches the island and finds Jack and a hospital filled with all these people who've fallen through the rift, including the missing boy, who's now all aged and burnt up. He asks to see his mother, so Gwen goes to tell her the truth. And when she sees her son, she initially can't believe it. But he does finally manage to convince her, and it's all a little bit heartbreaking. Especially when she's then told that she's not allowed to take him home, and then he starts screaming. Which is apparently something he does for around 20 hours every day. As the boy had looked into the heart of a dark star during his time in the rift, and it had driven him mad. 
The mum makes Gwen promise not to tell anyone else what happened to their children, wishing that she had never known the truth. I mean, good episode, but bloody hell, could it have been any more bleak? In Fragments, all the Torchwood gang, apart from Gwen, are hunting down aliens in this building. Except it's not aliens, it's bombs, and the building explodes. And now we get treated to fragments from each character's past. Starting with Jack getting kidnapped by these two women and tortured and killed repeatedly. These two women work for something called Torchwood and are looking for a man named the Doctor. They then offer him a job hunting down another one of those fish people from episode 1. But Jack then quits when instead of sending that fish back to its home planet, they shoot it in its big fishy head. But then this little psychic girl tells Jack that he's not going to run into the Doctor again for over 100 years, so motivated purely by boredom, Jack rejoins Torchwood. Then we flash forward to New Year's Day in the year 2000, and someone at Torchwood has seen a vision of the future, and it's driven him to kill the entire Torchwood team. Except Jack, of course. Whatever he saw must have been pretty bad, but also vague enough where they don't really need to follow up on it. As I guess it could apply to literally anything that's happened in Torchwood. Maybe he saw the rift opening at the end of series one. Maybe he saw that man getting eaten at Gwen's wedding. Back in the present, Gwen and Reese have shown up and are digging Jack out of the wreckage. And now it's Tosh's turn for a fragment. Five years ago, she was stealing some documents from her work, which she then uses to build a sonic modulator for these guys who are holding Tosh's mum captive. They then use the sonic modulator on Tosh and her mum, but luckily Unit bursts in and saves slash arrests Tosh. After some time of being in Unit jail, Jack shows up and offers her a job, and now she's getting rescued too. Yanto's turn, and 21 months ago he met Jack by helping him fight a weevil. Also, he knows what a weevil is. The next day he shows up with a coffee and asks for a job, having worked for Torchwood 1 in London. Jack says no, and then later Yanto comes to him, asking for help chasing a pterodactyl. Some pterodactyl hijinks ensue, and Jack finally agrees to give Yanto a job. And now he's getting saved too. Lastly, we come to Owen, who four years earlier was planning his wedding. Except his fiance has a brain tumour. Of course his backstory has to be the saddest. This guy just cannot catch a break this series. Owen's fiance has surgery to try to remove the tumour, but then Jack shows up and tells Owen the tumour was actually an alien, and it then kills her as well as all the surgeons. Jack then knocks Owen out, and when he wakes up, no one believes what happened, and all evidence of Jack and the alien are gone. Later at his fiance's grave, Owen sees Jack and beats the crap out of him. And then Jack offers him a job. Seems like rather than offering him coffee and credentials that would make you good at being a Torchwood employee, the easiest way to get a job offer out of Jack is just to beat him up. Oh, and then Gwen saves him. So that's everyone now. Jack then gets a message from John, remember him? And he has Jack's brother Grey with him. Okay then, that's a pretty good cliffhanger. And on to the series finale with Exit Wounds which picks up where the last episode left off, with Jack now going to confront John back at the Torchwood base. John tells Jack that he loves him, before then shooting him to pieces. Meanwhile, the rift starts going mad and a load of aliens are turning up and murdering people, including weevils, these reapers who are seemingly pretty weak to bullets, and that thing. You do remember that thing, don't you? I did tell you a while back to remember it, as there'd be a test. And this is that test. So, if you said Hoix, you'd be correct. See? Easy. Certainly a lot easier to remember than this guy's name, which is... Uh, even I don't remember, and I'm not going to look it up. John cuffs Jack with electric handcuffs and tells everyone to go to the roof to watch as John blows up the city. John then takes Jack to Cardiff in the year 27 AD, where John reveals that he's doing all this because someone's fused a bomb to him and is thereby controlling him. But who's controlling him, you ask? Why, it's Jack's brother Grey, of course, who then shows up and stabs Jack. Turns out that when Jack lost him as a child, he was captured by aliens and tortured. So now he wants Jack to suffer too. So he makes John bury Jack underground for 2,000 years, suffocating over and over. John heads back to Torchwood in the present day, now free of the bomb in the hopes of rescuing Jack. And so he teams up with the rest of the Torchwood team to try and find him. But Grey is also here, and he's freeing all the Weevils. And this nuclear power station starts losing power and goes into meltdown. So Owen goes to deal with it, as remember that whole thing about the Weevils bowing down to him, making him basically the only person who can freely travel. Also, Grey locks up Gwen, John and Yanto, and shoots Tosh in the stomach. So, yeah, 
things are looking pretty bad. Now for a little flashback in which old Torchwood from a hundred years ago dig Jack up and then cryogenically freeze him in the morgue to defrost in exactly 100 years. So Jack does indeed wake back up in the present and tells Grey that he forgives him. But Grey is still not ready to forgive Jack, so Jack just knocks him out. John activates a signal that makes all the Weevils come back to Torchwood and Owen and Tosh work together to stop the nuclear meltdown. But uh oh, Owen gets locked in and all the radiation is about to fill the room and he's not too happy about having to die again. Tosh and Owen have a final heart to heart, with Tosh mentioning how she once had to cover for him when he was hung over, pretending to be a medic to examine a space pig, which does explain a long running mystery surrounding Tosh's actor Naoki Mori previously appearing in Doctor Who all the way back in series one. In Aliens of London, look, there she is. So that means that Tosh technically appeared in Doctor Who before even Jack did. So really, Torchwood is her spin-off. Owen tells Tosh that he's sorry that they never got to go on a proper first date, and Owen then properly dies this time, obliterated by the radiation. Ain't no resurrection gauntlet bringing him back this time. Everyone then finds Tosh and she's still bleeding out, and she then dies in Jack's arms. Jack cryogenically freezes his brother, and John leaves to go explore the Earth. So series 2 of Torchwood comes to an end with everyone now being sad, and mourning the deaths of Owen and Tosh. Yeah, this series was a lot better than the last. Don't get me wrong, there were still a few dud episodes here, but on the whole it did seem a lot more focused and a lot less sex obsessed. Like, they actually told some pretty good stories here, and I just hope this upward trajectory keeps up and may improve even more next series. Now, around this time there were a few magazines produced which tied in with the show. There was Doctor Who magazine that had been running for years already and was mainly geared towards adult fans. And then there was the newly released Doctor Who Adventures magazine, with issue 1 releasing at the same time as series 2 started. This magazine was geared towards a younger audience and I've already made a video about this magazine. So today I want to talk about another Doctor Who magazine that came out not long after series 2 ended and is my personal favourite because it wasn't just the magazine, it was also a trading card game. It's here. Doctor Who battles in time. With every issue you get a pack of stunning trading cards. There's an out of this world TARDIS collector's case to store them. A magazine full of secret information and extra cards at your newsagent. Doctor Who Battles in Time. So here it is. Battles in Time, issue one. Uh, for only £1.50, usual price is £2.50, and I think they sold the cards individually for packs which were £1.50 each. And issue one comes with a free bonus pack of cards, which is why we have two. And this one at the bottom feels like all the cards are kind of bent over, so I think that some air's got into this one. I think this one's open slightly, whereas this one seems absolutely fine. So, take this out. And underneath, it advertised the free TARDIS case with part two and three, which, yep, I do have. So this is the magazine that came with it. And on the first page, it starts off with how to play the game. And I think it basically just worked like top trumps where, yeah, it is literally just someone going pick a category and then calling it out. It was a very basic card game. And here it promotes the special cards. Like I remember there was a scratch and sniff Slovene card and some Sycorax, which I think were just shiny ones. There are also some like lenticular ones, but when you move them up and down, they change the picture. We pit two of the coolest exterminator cards against each other for a fearsome face-off. And really, Rose and Cassandra, they're some of the coolest cards. And as it promotes down here, keep an eye out for Cassandra's companions to collect, such as Surgeon 2. So we get a bit of an explanation of who the Doctor is in case you've been bought this and you don't have no idea what Doctor Who is. And then there's a nice little behind the scenes with making of a Slovene. And then onto the big stuff, the pull out part. Again, you probably can't really see this, but it's it's massive. And it just kind of gives a bit of some facts about Daleks and ways to destroy Daleks. But yeah, pretty cool. And it gives a little promotion of all the different Dalek cards, such as Damage Dalek, Dalek Mutant, Hovering Dalek and Exterminate. See, because Doctor would only run for two series at this point, they didn't have a lot of source material to draw off, which is why there were a lot of things like a Dalek, but this time it's hovering, or a Dalek, but this time it's damaged. And then we get a comic. 
And this was always my favourite part of the magazine because it had some actual new kind of art that was made specially for it, where it kind of puts the Daleks in a kind of battle war scenario. And each one was different. And this one starts off with them fighting in London. And look at these little Daleks floating in the Thames. And then we're already at the end of a the magazine. There wasn't really a lot to this magazine. It was all really about the cards. And I remember really loving this comic. I used to have a subscription to it, which was a bit annoying as I'd get like two issues at once and it would only happen like once every month. But yeah, let's go to the main thing. I know what we're really here for. Let's get the cards out from this ancient glue, which, ah, is it blackened? This is impossible to get off and I don't want to break the cards. Ugh. If your pack of trading cards is missing, please see your news agent. Oh, a bit late now. Each pack contains nine cards. The exterminator set is made up of 275 cards in total, 231 common cards, eight in every pack, one rare in every pack. There's 28 rares, 10 super rares, one in every six packs, six ultra rares, one in every 24 packs. And there's also the golden ticket, which is the rarest card of all. There's only one in every thousand packs. That one, of course, being the Super Rose card, which I remember I wanted so badly. And I still kind of want a little bit. So let's crack this open. It's like, what, nearly 20 years old, this pack of cards? And let's find out if I got my golden ticket. So we've got Pilot Fish 1 from the Christmas special. Um, turning over, I don't know why I've upside down. Victor Kennedy, probably the worst card I could have got. Anti plastic. Dr. Constantine. Pilot Fish 2. Didn't we just get that? P Pilot Fish 1. So we've got, so we got two Pilot Fish now. Info Spike Nurse. These are some not good cards. They're scraping the bottom of the barrel for these. Then we've got a Child Auton. We've got the Editor, which was Simon Pegg's character. And then Toby But Possessed, which is the shiny card. Okay, so I'll admit that wasn't a great pack. But let's bust open the other. See if this gets us anything better. Oh my god, these just he's a proper glued in. Ah So look how bent these cards are. They're proper Yeah, these have aged. So psychic paper. Psychic paper. A Cyberman. Okay, this pack is already infinitely better. Some Krillotane oil. Meh. A Dalek Fay. Okay, this is more like it. Scholar Free. A Slovene egg. Mr. Crane. Eh, not great. Danny Llewellyn. Who is excited to get Danny Llewellyn? What child is getting this pack of cards? Oh, bloody hell, it's only Danny Llewellyn. Roderick. Cyberman attack, which is a rare. And then, an whoa, a super rare. <gasps> The Emperor Dalek Guard 1. So yeah, I remember the Psychic Paper card was very interesting because it would always be included in one of the packs in issue 1 and then it wasn't available in any other pack. And it was needed to read some of the cards. Like some of the cards had special like writing on it that you could only see by using the Psychic Paper. And if you didn't get issue 1, then there was just no way to read any of those. And it's like a weird kind of plasticky card. It's not like a normal card. It's... It's weird. Like, for example, take this card, Platform 1. You see, you can't read it, right? And then I place that on top of it. And then you can kind of... If you can see that, you can see some actual words appear, which is very cool. Not readable? Readable. So I grabbed a few cards out of my collection for the Exterminator set, which was the first set that was released, and the cards that I have most of. So let's just flick through some of these real quick. Dalek Fae, Dalek Rabe, remember that one, which shouldn't exist. There's Dalek, Dalek Emperor. This was my first ever Super Rare. I got this in natural pack. I used to get them from news agents after school, and I got so excited when I got this card. Cyber Leader, White Patient. Hmm. Dalek Khan, another Dalek Rabe, Sonic Screwdriver, another Shiny. Info Spiked Adam, we all forgot about this guy, but Battles in Time didn't. The Hoix, also forgot about. 
Dalek Sec, Reaper, Duke of Manhattan, Captain Jack, Pig Pilot, Surgeon One. Magazine was hyping this up to oblivion, and it is, yes, Surgeon One. Mickey Smith, the Android, a chain Dalek, the Empty Child, the Tenth and Ninth Doctor, both were shiny. I think this is what I got in my first ever pack when I first uh, got issue one back when I was a kid. Um, Dalek Guard 2, Arthur of a Horse, School Children. This is just a, it's just a card called School Children. Imagine that. Imagine any other card game in Magic the Gathering. I play School Children. Eddie Connolly, an Absorbaloff, rare card, one of the best cards in the game. Genesis Arc, Cassandra, Tenth Doctor with Sonic Screwdriver, which makes him slightly better. Ood Group, Cyber Controller, Surgeon 2, to go with Surgeon 1, The Beast, and another Absorbaloff. Not long after they finished Exterminator, they did the Annihilator set, which is the second set consisting of 100 cards rather than 275. But the problem is, the only other episode that aired between the two sets was The Runaway Bride. So that's one episode, one extra episode of source material to use. So that meant that this set was the scrapiest barrel scrape in all of sets. So for example, like Trap Slovene, which is actually from Attack of the Grask. So not even an actual episode. This is from Attack of the Grask. Slovene Zapper. Some Cyber Ghosts. A destroyed Dalek. Look at it. Look at it. Look at the guy. Look at him. Uh, Bliss. We needed a new set because we had to make sure Bliss was in it. Martha Jones. And as Series 3 hadn't actually started yet, I think this was just made to promote the new series. As this is the only character we get from Series 3 in this set. Some Bauble Bombs from The Runaway Bride. Cat Nurse Group. Prison of the Beast. A Gas Mask. And Rose Tyler with Fire Extinguisher. Then, after Series 3, they released the Invader cards, which consisted of 225 cards, which mostly focused on stuff from Series 3. So, let's take a look at some of these. Like, Orin Scannell. We all remember him, one of my favourite characters from Series 3. Or, Refugee 1. Scarecrow 2. A Jadoon B Scanning. A Scanning Jadoon. A Vortex Manipulator. A Weeping Angel Attacking. A Macra Grip. Father of Mine. Time Lord 2. Tallulah, sinister woman, just just a woman who's a who's a bit bit sinister. Scarecrow three, Scarecrow group, Weeping Angel in a feral state, feral. Ooh. Weeping Angel one, Carrionite three, Branigan, and this is my only ultra rare card. So these were the ones which were lenticular, where if you moved them, they'd kind of change. And this one doesn't really change much, admittedly. It's just the sun monster from my least favourite episode of Series 3. After this, they did release like a very limited set based on just Daleks and Cybermen, which were kind of just one comic special and you'd get the whole set. And I remember those were my absolute favourite because it was just Dalek and Cybermen cards. And you'd get all the whole set in just this one pack. And it was great and I loved it and I can't find them anywhere. Then after this, they seemed to be pretty much completely out of ideas because they were now going to Ultimate Monsters, which had characters from the classic series of Doctor Who. And this is where I kind of started to fall out with it and stop collecting. So we have stuff like Alpha Century, Stike, the Lucasa, Axon Man, Zephan, Vorus, Pirate Captain. See, I'm not much of a fan of the classic series, so I don't really recognise any of these, I do still need to watch it. And Banner Cafalata. Wait, why is Banner Cafalata in here? It's weird. Okay, The Great One, Cyberman. I have seen that, that's from Tomb of the Cyberman. That is a good episode. Stike, Mechanoid, Cyberscope. And then finally they released a set called Devastator, but I never actually got that one. I think it was mostly based off Series 4 and the Series 3 Voyage of a Damned Christmas special. But yeah, I I had stopped collecting at that point. Okay, let's crack on with Series 4 of Doctor Who now, starting off with Partners in Crime. And hey look, Donna's back. When writing Series 4, Russell T Davis originally created a new companion called Penny, but then Catherine Tate said she wanted to come back, so the original plans got scrapped, and we get a whole series with Donna as the companion. And she's investigating Adipose Industries, a company selling new diet pills. But look who else is here, the Doctor, and both of them just keep missing each other. 
They both get a necklace which is given to each new customer and a client list and then go to visit the people taking these pills. Donna meets this woman and the doctor meets this man. The pills seem to be working but something keeps setting off this man's burglar alarm in the middle of the night. Donna starts fiddling with her necklace which causes the woman's fat to burst off of her into this cute little bundle of horribleness. And then she bursts into a load more. So after witnessing a woman dying in front of her, Donna heads home and we get reintroduced to Donna's horrible mother Sylvia. We even get a little montage of her being horrible. Donna then goes to visit her granddad, Berna Cribbins, who's stargazing. Hold on, isn't that the guy from Voyage of the Damned? So, this was originally supposed to be Donna's dad and some scenes with him were filmed, but then sadly the actor, Howard Atfield, passed away. So they got Berna Cribbins in to play the part of Donna's granddad, Wilfred, instead. Donna tells Wilfred that she's searching for a man named the Doctor and if Wilfred ever sees a blue box through his telescope to shout for her. The next day the Doctor and Donna both return to Adipose Industries with Donna hiding in this bathroom as the woman in charge Miss Foster searches for an intruder and finds this woman what? So this woman is a journalist who's also investigating Adipose Industries and her name is Penny as a little nod to the companion who never was. Penny gets interrogated as Donna and the Doctor listen in and then finally the pair notice each other talking through mime in a great bit of physical comedy. Oh and everyone else has noticed them. The pair run to the roof and then hop onto this window cleaner lift thingy, except Miss Foster has her own sonic device and uses it to cut the cable, causing Donna to dangle for her life. The Doctor shoots the sonic device out of Miss Foster's hand and climbs through the window to go save Donna, off screen, as he's just got her feet, there's no way he can save her in that position. They run into Miss Foster and she tells them that after the adipose planet was lost, she's now using fat to help them grow a new population. The Doctor then holds his sonic screwdriver next to the other sonic device and, well, this happens, allowing them to escape and Miss Foster decides to fully adiposify all 1 million customers currently taking the pills using this machine causing a load of little adipose to be born. The Doctor tries to stop it using his necklace, but Miss Foster doubles the strength. If only he had a second necklace. Oh wait! So the pair save everyone, and an adipose ship shows up to collect all the new kids. The Doctor and Donna wave goodbye to all that fat, and then Miss Foster floats up, and then goes back down. After all this, we learn that Donna already has all her bags packed, ready at a moment's notice to go off with the Doctor. But the Doctor's a little bit unsure about having a new companion after he ruined Martha's life and all, but Donna convinces him. Oh, also Donna meets this blonde woman. Wait, what? The Doctor tries introducing Donna to the TARDIS, telling her that it's... It's bigger on the inside. But she already knows all that. The Doctor asks where she wants to go first, and so they go to see Wilfred. Another really good opener, very fun, very comedic, very fast paced. Also, I like how in these series openers, the threat isn't too bad. Like sure, a load of people would have died, but look at those little adipose, they're fun. Overall, very good season opener, and obviously just having Catherine Tate as Donna back is gonna be brilliant. The Fires of Pompeii has the Doctor taking Donna to visit Pompeii, and her first thought is to confuse the TARDIS translation circuits by speaking actual Latin to someone. Ah, Donna is good. Also, Mount Vesuvius is about to erupt, so they head back to the TARDIS, but find that it's been sold to the 12th Doctor, I mean Cecilius. Donna wants to warn everyone about the volcano that's about to erupt, but the Doctor tells her this is a fixed point in time and can't be altered. Also, Amy Pond is watching them, just how many future characters are in this episode? And she's part of this sisterhood who have a prophecy about the Doctor. So the Doctor finds the TARDIS and they meet Cecilius' family, and then this Lucius guy shows up. And he's ordered this weird circuit looking thing from Cecilius. Also, Cecilius' daughter starts doing all these prophecies, telling the Doctor that she is returning, wonder who that could be, and telling Donna that there's something on her back. On top of that, she's also turning to stone. The Doctor finds out that all these prophecies are coming from Vesuvius itself, and when people are exposed long enough to its vapours, they gain this knowledge. The Doctor sneaks into Lucius' house and finds more of those circuit things. Seems like he's building something. Oh, and he's also turning to stone. The Doctor runs away back to Cecilius' house and this big stone man shows up, but is quickly stopped with a bucket of water. Meanwhile, Donna gets kidnapped by the sisterhood and is nearly sacrificed. Well, at least until the Doctor shows up. 
and then we get to meet the leader of this sisterhood, who is a fully stone woman, inhabited by something called a pyrovial, a creature that's slowly turning her into one of those big rock monsters. So the Doctor fights her off with a water pistol, and they both escape into the volcano. The Doctor fights off some more pyrovials, and learns that their home planet is also lost, so they are now using all their technology to stop the volcano, and use the energy to convert the entire world into pyrovials. So, the Doctor can turn the machine off, but in doing so, he'll cause the volcano to erupt. Donna and the Doctor then pull the lever together, condemning the 20,000 people here to death. Now, a lot of this episode is pretty confusing and convoluted and whatever, but here, this is the only real part of the episode that matters. The part that everyone remembers, and the part which is just so good. Donna wants to save people, but the Doctor knows they can't. He gets in the TARDIS to go, leaving behind everyone, even that family who are begging for help. Donna pleads with the Doctor to just do something, but the Doctor says he can't. He couldn't save Gallifrey, he can't save Pompeii. But Donna begs him just to save someone. So, in a heavenly light, a godly doctor saves Cecilius and his family. So, a pretty middling episode saved by an absolutely phenomenal ending. The acting was just amazing. You really felt the drama and the personal struggles that the characters were going through at that time. It's great. In Planet of the Ood, we get to see a lot more background for the Ood. Remember those guys from the Impossible Planet and the Satan Pit? Well, the Doctor and Donna find themselves on the home planet of the Ood, and it's too cold for Donna. Also, remember how the Ood's were slaves? Well, they're being sold pretty cheap. Now only 50 credits. I mean, if you go by the exchange rate in Voyage of the Damned, extremely cheap. But what's worse is they've started getting all red-eyed again and killing people. So this Bill Murray looking CEO has to be called in for help. Also, his thing is that he drinks a load of hair tonic, but don't worry about that right now. The Doctor and Donna find this Ood who's been shot, and Donna tries speaking into its ball, which is a nice character moment that makes Donna feel a bit more real, like she's trying her best. The Ood dies, and the Doctor and Donna join this Ood tour to find out what's going on. Donna asks this Ood if there are any free Ood, but it tells her that they'd die if they weren't serving people. All Ood are born to serve, otherwise we would die. Which doesn't sound like a thing that's true. So Donna and the Doctor go exploring some more, and find some more Ood getting whipped, and then find all these containers filled with more Ood. The Ood all start saying that the circle must be broken so that they can all sing, and then security shows up, locking Donna in with the Ood, and they chase the Doctor down using this giant claw grabber game. Except Bill Murray wants them alive, so they just get arrested normally. But then all the Ood start attacking, and the Doctor and Donna escape anyway. So there was really no point to that scene at all. They then find the Ood breeding area where newborn Ood are telepathically singing, and the song makes Donna cry. We learn that the Ood have a second brain that they have to hold, and that's what's been encased in their spheres. And then the Doctor and Donna get arrested again, and told that all the Ood are going to get gassed to stop the spread of a red eye disease. But then these Ood make a circle, and sing another song, presumably an angrier song as it makes all the Ood start killing, and the Doctor and Donna are rescued by an Ood. They follow Bill Murray to this warehouse, where he's about to blow up another brain, a big one, that connects all the Ood together. But then this Ood reveals that all that hair tonic he was giving him was in fact a drug that's been slowly turning Bill Murray into an Ood. Kinda silly, very disgusting. The Doctor frees the big brain, breaking the circle, and all the Ood sing. And the episode ends with an Ood ominously telling the Doctor that his song is ending soon. It's nice that we got a proper follow-up to the Ood, which actually explained a bit more of their backstory. It's just a shame that the episode as a whole didn't really do much outside of that basic slavery bad story. The Sontaran stratagem begins with the Doctor's phone ringing. Remember the one that Martha gave him at the end of Series 3? Well, she's now calling him because she needs his help. So the Doctor meets her, and we get this nice little reunion. At the time, this was a huge deal to me, but binging through it again for this made me realise Martha only left four episodes ago. We learn that Martha is now engaged to Lucifer, and is still working for Unit, as we know from her appearance in Torchwood. Well, Unit is investigating this company called Atmos, and the Doctor is still technically employed by Unit, because he used to work there in the classic series. Atmos is a car part that removes all exhaust emissions from cars, but also a load of cars fitted with Atmos have been killing people, so it's probably alien. And it's not long before a couple unit officers run into these aliens, in the form of this weird clone thing in a green vat, which looks a lot like that little baby's ice cream advert. 
You know the one. Also, this other alien shows up called a Sontaran. Meanwhile, Donna does some digging and notices that no one who works for Atmos has ever had a sick day. Martha also tells Donna that she needs to tell her family that she's travelling with the Doctor, as when she kept it a secret, her family got tortured and imprisoned. So Donna goes home for a bit, which is always nice to get some more Wilfred. Wilfred convinces her not to tell her mum and completely ignore Martha's advice. The Doctor goes to meet this child genius called Luke Rattigan who invented Atmos and immediately starts getting under his skin. And then the Doctor finds a teleport pod, which brings him to a Sontaran ship. A Sontaran follows him back, and we finally get a good look at what a Sontaran looks like. It seems that the Doctor knows a lot about the Sontarans, what with him fighting them many times throughout the classic series. Which also means that the Doctor knows their weakness, a probic vent on the back of their neck. So knocks a squash ball onto it and escapes. We then learn that Luke is working with the Sontarans, and then they take control of the car the Doctor's in to try and drive it into the river. The Doctor orders the Atmos Satnav to drive into the river, and in the most childish bit of reverse psychology, it doesn't. Martha gets captured and cloned, with the clone now going off to do some evil stuff. The Doctor shows up at Donna's house, and he gets a proper meeting with Wilf again, where they both recognise each other from Voyage of the Damned. The Doctor studies Donna's mum's car, and accidentally activates all the evilness in the Atmos converter. So the Sontarans begin enacting their grand plan, and start making all the converters pump out poison gas, with Wilf being locked inside the car as it fills with gas. The poison sky begins with Sylvia taking an axe to the car to free Wilf, and Donna and the Doctor use an old taxi not fitted with Atmos to head back to the factory. The Doctor gives Donna a TARDIS key, and she hides inside the TARDIS, as the Doctor warns Unit not to engage the Sontarans in battle, and he also starts to notice something a bit weird about Martha. The Sontarans then transport the TARDIS to their ship, and the Doctor contacts the Sontarans, and hold on, whoa, 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 wait, was that Rose? Nah, it was probably nothing. The Doctor winds up the Sontarans whilst getting a message to Donna, telling her to use her phone, but for what? So, with no way to get in touch with the Doctor, despite the fact that the phone has only had one person call it, and that was Martha. No, that would be too easy. So Donna calls up her mum, and Wilf is sealing up the house, making it airtight. Maybe not the best plan there. Luke tells all his school friends that the Sontarans promised to take them all to a new planet to start a new world, but everyone's like, mate, that's weird. You're a weird guy. And leave. Not that it mattered, as the Sontarans reveal they were just going to shoot them all anyway, and were just using Luke. Meanwhile, the Sontarans begin attacking the factory, slaughtering a load of unit soldiers. The Doctor finally bothers to call Donna, and asks her to reactivate the teleporter to send the TARDIS back to Earth. But there's a Sontaran guarding the TARDIS. So Donna smashes its probic vent with a hammer. Everyone gas masks up, and the Doctor makes a little reference to the empty child. Are you my mummy? And then the Valiant shows up, blowing away all the gas from the factory so that the unit soldiers can start fighting back. The Doctor and Martha go exploring, and find the real Martha, as the Doctor reveals he knew she was a clone the whole time because she smells. Frank, you smell. You might as well want a t-shirt saying clone. He frees Martha, which causes the clone to start dying. Martha starts sympathising with her clone self, and the clone tells her that the gas is being used to convert the atmosphere so that it can become a Sontaran breeding planet. The Doctor manages to teleport Donna and the TARDIS back down to Earth, and then teleports them all to Luke's school. Don't tell anyone what I did. It wasn't my fault. The Sontarans lied to me. If I see one more gun... The Doctor quickly whips up a device to ignite all the gas in the atmosphere, and for a story which is basically an analogy for pollution and climate change, the Doctor sure did just create a whole lot of CO2. The Doctor then goes to take the device up to the Sontaran ship to ignite them all as well. But at the last second, Luke teleports in instead and blows them and himself to smithereens. Then on their way home, the TARDIS gets hijacked and flown remotely and taken somewhere, with Martha still on board. And before we move on, can we just quickly have a look at the credits here? Do you see how high of a billing Billy Piper got in this episode, despite appearing for less than a second? That's mad. Anyway, continuing on. So, this was kind of a middling episode. There were things that they did really well, and things not so well. Like, unit stories. I always find them kind of boring because of the whole army stuff. It just doesn't really do anything for me. But there are things like the character of Luke Rattigan, who I think had a really good redemption arc. Seeing more of Bernard Cribbins and Martha is always great, and I feel that the Sontarans were a fun addition. It's just a shame that the episode wasn't all that interesting to me. 
The Doctor's daughter picks up right where the last episode left off, and the TARDIS lands in the middle of this tunnel full of soldiers. The Doctor then gets grabbed, and his arm shoved into this device which takes a sample of his DNA and uses it to create a genetically modified clone. She's my daughter. The clone, just like all these other soldiers, are designed as a warrior to fight these fish things called the Hath. And Martha soon gets taken by one of them. Wow, Martha really does not share a lot of screen time with Catherine Tate in these two episodes, does she? I'm going to assume that's because they hated each other. The Doctor's daughter then explodes the tunnel, separating everyone, and then Martha saves this Hath, and so is welcomed in by all the other Hath. Meanwhile, Donna names the clone woman Jenny, and they get taken to see General Cobb, the leader in this war against the Hath. A war that's raged for generations, and they're fighting over something known as the Source. The Doctor then finds some hidden tunnels on the map where the Source must be located, and now General Cobb is going to get it and use it to wipe out all the Hath. The Doctor, Donna and Jenny all get locked up, and the Doctor phones Martha, learning that the Hath are also heading for the secret tunnels. The Doctor is all angry at war and doesn't like Jenny's soldier instincts, refusing to accept she's anything like him. So Donna checks her pulse and finds she has two hearts, meaning she is a Time Lord. And the Doctor just has to accept that she is like him. And then they all work together and escape. Martha and this half are checking out what it's like above the tunnels on the surface, and right, it's really weird how they've done this, as Martha can clearly understand the half due to the TARDIS translation circuit, but we the audience can't, it's all just bubbles to us. I want to know what the half are saying, damn it! The Doctor, Donna and Jenny continue their escape with Jenny flipping through these beams, and Donna notices these numbers everywhere, seemingly counting down. Also, the Doctor and Jenny start bonding, with Jenny learning that maybe killing everyone isn't always the best option, and the Doctor even invites her to join them in the TARDIS. Martha falls down this hill and starts sinking in this bog, but the half sacrifices itself to save her. The Doctor tells Donna that he was once a father before, and Jenny reminds him of all the pain of losing them all. And then they all reach the temple containing the source, as does Martha, and all the soldiers. Turns out this is in fact a spaceship, that brought both the Hath and humans here together, before they then divided and started the war. Donna then realised that the numbers are in fact dates, showing completion of when the tunnels were built. Most importantly, it means that this war started only seven days ago, with hundreds of generations of these clones being born and dying in that time. The Doctor then finds the source, which is this terraforming device, and then the Hath and humans all show up. The Doctor explains to everyone that the source is for creating life and not destroying it, so he breaks open the device, freeing all its terraforming energy, and everyone lays down their weapons. All except for General Cobb, who shoots and kills Jenny. The Doctor, Martha and Donna leave with the Doctor realising the reason they were brought here is because his hand in a jar was attracted to Jenny, what with them being genetically similar and all. The TARDIS just bought them there a bit too soon, creating a bootstrap paradox. Martha heads home, and then Jenny lets out some regeneration energy and wakes up, before then stealing a spaceship and flying off to go on adventures of her own, and at that time, everyone watching this, we all thought another spin-off was going to happen, but other than in Big Finish Audios years later, Jenny never appears on screen again. The Unicorn and the Wasp has the Doctor and Donna landing at a 1920s garden party, and then the cast of Cluedo starts showing up, as well as Agatha Christie. The Doctor mentions that today is the day that Agatha Christie famously went missing, and then this man is found murdered. The Doctor finds some alien residue by the body, and realises one of the guests is an alien in disguise, and so the Doctor and Agatha Christie start interviewing each guest. Meanwhile, Donna looks around the house and runs into this giant wasp. That. That's the alien, I reckon. Donna manages to fight it off with a magnifying glass and goes to find the Doctor and Agatha. And then a second murder happens, and the wasp attacks everyone before changing into a human and hiding amongst the guests. Agatha then finds a toolkit of a thief and believes it to be the thief going around by the name of the Unicorn. And then the Doctor is poisoned by cyanide. So the Doctor runs to the kitchen and tries to create a cure, having to play charades with Donna to communicate what he needs. And this scene, much like most of the episode, is just pure comedy, highlighting the great comedic duo of David Tennant and Catherine Tate. Salt! They salt! I need something salty! What about this? What is it? Salt! That's too salty! Oh, that's too salty! The Doctor needs a shock to flush away the last of the poison, so Donna kisses him. That night at dinner, the wasp shows up again, and this woman's necklace is stolen, and this man gets stabbed in the back. So everyone is gathered into the drawing room. Agatha deduces that this woman is the unicorn who stole the necklace, and... Oh, all right, then. It's a fair cop. 
Yes, I'm the bleeding unicorn. I always know I have got some when they start doing the evil voice. <laughs> turns out the woman originally got that necklace in India after meeting a man who turned out to be a wasp and then gave her the necklace and got her pregnant with a little wasp baby. And the reverend is that wasp baby. And the jewel in the necklace absorbed the woman's thoughts as she read an Agatha Christie book and stuck them into him. Which is why all the murders were kind of Agatha Christie based. The wasp chases down Agatha as she drives off with the Doctor and Donna following behind. Agatha believes that as they're linked, if she dies then so does the wasp, but then Donna just throws the jewel into the lake and kills it that way. Way simpler. But it also wipes Agatha Christie's mind of the last few days. And the Doctor goes on to tell Donna that Agatha Christie went on to become the best-selling novelist in all of history. Another comedic episode that I feel like if you liked Agatha Christie, you'd see a lot in this, but as someone who isn't a fan of Agatha Christie, Nah, I didn't enjoy it. Silence in the Library is another episode penned by Stephen Moffat, who I think it's pretty reasonable to say has had a pretty good track record with episodes so far. Well, the episode starts off with this little girl floating around in a giant library when she closes her eyes. Except someone's here with her, in her mind. And wait, it's the Doctor and Donna? So if it's not already clear from a pre-title sequence, this is going to be a complicated episode. So I'm sorry if I don't do a great job of describing exactly what happens, but look, I'm 5-6 hours into this, come on. So let's rewind a bit. The Doctor and Donna land on a planet called The Library in the 51st century. A whole planet full of every book ever written, and the Doctor soon realises that no one else is here. He scans the entire planet and finds that there are only two humanoid creatures there. But when expanding the scan to include non-humanoid creatures, he finds that there are a million million life forms there. So what exactly is here? They then meet this information node with a human face who tells them to run and to also count the shadows. The Doctor then reveals to Donna that they came here after he received a message on his psychic paper and then all the lights start going out. So they both start running and find that girl. Remember her from a bit ago? Except she's not even an actual girl. She's a security camera. Then these spaceship people start showing up, but that's okay because they're nice. With this one being called River Song, who just might be a bit important. These guys are archaeologists who've come to visit the library after it was sealed off a hundred years ago, headed by this man named Mr Lux, whose family owns the library. The Doctor wastes no time in telling everyone to seal the doors and stay out of the shadows. Riversong thanks the Doctor for responding to her psychic paper message and asks why the Doctor is pretending like he doesn't know her. And, well, the reason for that is because he doesn't know her. But she knows him very well as well, it seems. Then a phone starts ringing in the library as well as that little girl's house. The Doctor tries to access where the sound is coming from and shows up in the girl's TV. The Doctor's now trying to figure out exactly what's going on with the girl and basically everything else, but is also distracted by River Song's diary, which looks an awful lot like a TARDIS, but River tells him that he's not allowed to open it. A door then opens leading down a hidden passageway and this woman named Miss Evangelista goes to check it out. Meanwhile, the Doctor learns that 100 years ago, 420 people were saved, but there were no survivors. Bit of a contradiction there. But no time for that, as Miss Evangelista is eaten, reduced to a skeleton, who can still temporarily talk through what's left of her transmitter, except the transmitter starts to loop, repeating itself as it starts to fail. Repeating itself as it starts to fail. Repeating itself as it starts to fail. The Doctor then grabs some food and introduces everyone to the thing that killed Miss Evangelista, something called the Vashta Narada. Living shadows, a swarm of shadows that melt the flesh. And the Doctor soon notices that this man has a second shadow, as the Vashta Narada have now latched onto him. The Doctor tries increasing the shielding of everyone's spacesuits, and Riversong helps with a sonic screwdriver of her own, which the Doctor apparently gave to her in the future. The Doctor then tricks Donna into teleporting her safely back to the TARDIS, except something goes wrong. The Doctor then heads back just in time to find that guy getting all devoured by the Vashta Narada, who have managed to get inside his suit and are now controlling him. Everyone runs away thanks to River's square gun, just like Jack had all the way back in Series 1 in The Doctor Dances. And the Vashta Narada chases them all down. The Doctor realises that Donna never got teleported to the TARDIS, so asks an information node, and it has Donna's face, telling him that Donna has been saved as the Vashta Narada corners them all. 
Forest of the Dead picks up where the last episode left off, with River using her square gun to escape, and then Donna wakes up, having been treated in this hospital for the past two years by this man named Dr. Moon, the same man treating the little girl. She then meets a man named Lee, they start dating, fall in love, get married and have a couple of kids. I am still watching the same show, right? Back in the library, the Doctor demands to know who Riversong is, so she whispers something into his ear and he freezes, making this face. Anyway, something is interfering with the Doctor's screwdriver being signalled by the planet's moon, a giant virus checker called a Doctor Moon. And then this woman gets a second shadow too. The Doctor tints the visor on her suit in the hopes that the Vashtanarada think they've already got inside and so will just decide to leave her alone. And then the old skeleton suit shows up again to chase everyone down once more. Donna receives a letter from a mysterious hooded woman telling her that the world is wrong and to meet her at the park the next day. Which she does, and the woman explains that they're in a dream and reveals that she's what's left of Miss Evangelista. She explains to Donna that her children aren't real, as all the children are just copies of one another. Oh, and Miss Evangelista's face is all messed up, looking like some terrible Snapchat filter. Back in the library, the Doctor speaks to the skeleton suit and asks the Vashti Narada to use the transmitter to speak to him. They tell the Doctor that this is their home planet and they were born from trees, except the trees became the books and that's how they ended up here. And then another person gets eaten and reduced to a skeleton. So the Doctor uses a surprising amount of upper body strength to escape. Meanwhile, River Song laments that this Doctor isn't done yet as he's not the one that she knows. She says that the doctor she knows would turn armies away before heading back to his TARDIS and opening the doors with a snap of his fingers. And then our doctor shows up and says that's not how the TARDIS works, you idiot. Then the doctor realises that when the Vashti Narada hatched and started attacking a hundred years ago, everyone was teleported off, but with the whole world filled with Vashti Narada, there was nowhere safe to teleport them to. So instead they were saved to the library's database. The little girl hears all of this and in some existential anger activates the self-destruct sequence, destroying the planet in 20 minutes. Dr. Moon tries to stop her, but she deletes him too. So our heroes head to the library's database at the centre of the planet where Mr. Lux explains that the little girl is the computer, his grandfather's daughter who was dying, so in order to save her she got uploaded to a computer. The Doctor tries teleporting everyone out of the library computer, but the computer's going to need more memory space, so he's going to have to hook himself up to it. Except before he can do that, he needs to make a deal with the Vashti Narada. They can have the planet if they let the Doctor get everyone off this planet safely. Except they're not up for it. Well, at least they're not until the Doctor tells them that as they're in the biggest library in the universe, they should probably look him up. Which they do, and then immediately surrender. River then knocks the Doctor out and hooks herself up to the machine, about to sacrifice herself to save everyone. She handcuffs the Doctor up and says that this means he always knew how she was going to die and how the last time he saw her, he gave her his screwdriver, took her to the singing towers of Derillium and cried, clearly knowing that this would be the last time he saw her before she went to the library. The Doctor reveals that River whispered the Doctor's real name into his ear and then she dies bringing everyone back. The Doctor leaves River's diary and her screwdriver here in the library, and then the Doctor and Donna leave. Except, wait, the Doctor realises that he had ages to think of a way to save River Song, and that's exactly what he did, backing up her consciousness inside the screwdriver. So he rushes back to the planet's core just in time to upload her and all her archaeologist friends to the library's database. And finally, the Doctor heads back to the TARDIS, snaps his fingers, and the doors open. My god, can Stephen Moffat do no wrong? Every single one of his episodes have just been phenomenal. The villain was cool, the setting was awesome, the whole thing with the dreams in the library's database was really intriguing. As was the setup with River, which if we see her again will be a great payoff. These episodes were another two brilliant ones from Stephen Moffat, and you know what, just, just make him in charge of the whole show. In the episode Midnight, Donna and the Doctor on this resort planet called, well, Midnight, and the Doctor is going on an excursion to see the Sapphire Waterfalls while Donna stays back at the resort to do some sunbathing. The only problem is that the trip takes four hours to get there, so the Doctor is going to be stuck in this shuttle with this cast of characters. But what with the planet being incredibly bright, the shields are going to have to be down the whole way there. 
but it's okay because they've got all of this entertainment, this very obnoxious entertainment, which the Doctor isn't a fan of, so he selfishly decides to break everything, meaning that now the passengers will have to talk and get to know each other instead. And again, this is where Rusty Davis's writing is at its best, making you care for sporting characters so quickly, because whatever happens after this doesn't work at all unless we care for these characters. And you can tell that Rusty Davis knows this, as he dedicates a good portion of this episode just to the Doctor getting to know everyone. And just as we get to like everyone, the shuttle stops. So the Doctor goes to the front to find out what's going on, and the drivers don't know either. The shuttle just stopped. They take a brief look outside, and the driver sees something moving out there. But that's impossible, as the amount of radiation out there means nothing can survive. Nothing. Surely. Nothing. The Doctor heads back, and everyone starts panicking. But the Doctor calms them all down, or at least he does until something starts banging on the outside of the shuttle. This guy then knocks three times on the side, and we get three knocks back, meaning that whatever it is, it's intelligent. And it then gets in as everything sparks and the lights go out. And then in another stupidly short, lazy cameo, Rose shows up. She'll probably get top billing for that. The stewardess then checks the front cabin and finds that the drivers are gone as the front of the shuttle has been ripped away. The doctor checks on this woman named Skye and she's gone all weird. Whatever that alien thing is, it's in her now and it starts repeating everything the doctor says. But not just the doctor, everyone. She repeats everything anyone says. This is one of those things that doesn't seem like it'd be scary, but my god it is. And everyone else starts getting scared too. And then the lights come back on, and then Sky starts repeating everyone at the exact same time as they're speaking, perfectly in sync with them. The Doctor concludes that the more they talk, the more she learns, so they just need to stay away from her and ignore her and not speak. Now, this is the true conceit of the episode. Sky and the monster and repeating and everything is just a catalyst, as the true point of the episode is to play with how everyone always just trusts the Doctor and does as he says blindly. But here, the Doctor's fighting them too, as now they all decide to throw Sky out the shuttle. And they all start turning against the Doctor, even blaming him for what's going on. And then they consider throwing him out too. But then Sky stops repeating everyone, now only repeating the Doctor. And it doesn't take long before she starts overtaking the Doctor, with the Doctor now seemingly copying her. Everyone believes that it's now gone into the Doctor, as he's now the one who can't move, and that Sky is free. Everyone then starts arguing and fighting over what they saw, whether Sky is still possessed and draining the Doctor, or whether the creature's now inside the Doctor. These two then try throwing him out of the shuttle, and it's all very horrible and uncomfortable to watch. But when Sky then says Alon Z, the stewardess realises that that's the Doctor's voice, so she throws herself out with Sky, and the Doctor is freed. And everyone waits for the rescue shuttle in silence. The Doctor finally asks if anyone knows the stewardess's name, but no one does. And the episode ends with the Doctor hugging Donna, and that's it. Totally left ambiguous, and we never find out what that thing even was. This was probably a top 10 episode, and such a mature Black Mirror-esque story, holding a mirror up to the bleakest aspects of humanity. This is how people really can act in a disaster. They can turn against each other, and this episode captures that perfectly. Also, just the difficulty in these actors speaking in perfect unison is commendable. Brilliant episode, and you've got to watch it to fully understand what makes it so brilliantly uncomfortable to watch. So look, the Doctor is great, we all love the Doctor, but what would the world be like without him? Well, that's the question that the episode Turn Left sets out to answer. The Doctor and Donna are visiting Space China, where Donna gets her fortune told by this woman. She asks Donna what led her to meeting the Doctor, and she tells her that it was because of her job. The fortune teller then gets Donna to remember that choice, which involved her mum telling her to interview at a different place. So Donna had a decision to turn left or right, choosing one job or the other. And then the fortune teller starts changing Donna's decision, making her turn right. Oh, and then this thing climbs onto her back. So now we get to see how Donna's life would have turned out if she had taken this other job. Starting off with Donna getting a promotion to personal assistant. So pretty good so far. 
Meanwhile, that big Ragnos ship from Donna's first episode is flying across London and attacking. Oh, and this woman keeps saying there's something on Donna's back. Anyway, the star gets shot down easily by the army, just like it did in the Runaway Bride, posing basically no threat. But then Unit pulls the Doctor's dead body out from under the Thames. Remember how Donna told him to stop? Well, in this reality, he didn't stop, and drowned and didn't even regenerate. Oh, and then Rose shows up, asks Donna what happened, looks at her back, and then disappears again. A little while later, Donna gets sacked from her job as a nearby hospital vanishes, before then reappearing with everyone in it now dead. Well, there was one survivor talking about space rhinos. In case you haven't worked out, this is all a reference to the episode Smith and Jones, so we can assume that Martha is now dead. Although this does then raise the question of who stopped that plasma vore woman from destroying half the Earth. Well, it turns out that Sarah Jane just happened to be there, stopped the plasma vore, and is also now dead. As is Luke, Clyde, and Maria. All dead. Donna watches all this on the news with her family, and Wilf knows that it's them alien lot. And Donna's mum, Sylvia, tells Donna that after getting fired, she's given up on her. Bit much, Sylvia. Rose then shows up again, looks at Donna's back again for a bit, then tells Donna to get out of the city for Christmas, which Donna then does, staying in this hotel with her family, just in time for the Titanic to crash into London, leaving a big nuclear mushroom cloud. After three months in a hostel, Donna's family gets moved to Leeds, as half the country is now flooded with radiation and seven million people need to be relocated. So they end up sharing a house with several other families, including this jolly man, who is just incredibly likeable. I thought this was our house. It's many people's house. It's wonderful. <laughs> Donna's family are stuck living in the kitchen, but it's fine, as Wilf tells us that America is sending Britain 50 billion pounds and, no wait, 60 million Americans are now dead thanks to the adipose pill. Sylvia and Donna share a pretty dire conversation remembering all the people they knew who are now dead and how everything is now pretty hopeless. Then everyone has a nice sing-song. But as we can't get even a moment of happiness, all the Atmos converters start choking the world and this army man nearly shoots Donna because he sees something on her back. Rose shows up again, telling Donna that Jack and the Torchwood team are currently on board the Sontan ship and manage to stop them, of course, dying in the process. Rose tells Donna about the Doctor and how none of this is right and that something is coming and every universe is in danger. And more importantly, she needs Donna's help. Donna initially refuses, but Rose tells her that she'll change her mind in three weeks and then she'll die. A little while later, that jolly man I love so much gets carted off to a concentration camp with all the other immigrants. Jeez. The acting here where he's keeping up the happy facade for Donna before then saluting Wilf and hugging his family, ah, oh, it's just heartbreaking. Then Donna and Wilf are looking through Wilf's telescope and find that all the stars are now going out as the entire universe starts ending. And so Donna finally cracks and goes with Rose to this unit base where they have the TARDIS all wired up and they use it to show Donna what's on her back. And it's this big beetle thing. And the only way to remove it is by sending Donna back in time to make herself turn left instead of right. But when Donna appears in the past, she's half a mile away from herself. So Donna resorts to jumping in front of this truck, which causes a traffic jam and forces past Donna to go left. And then in her final dying moments, Rose shows up again and tells Donna to give the doctor a message. So time gets fixed, the beetle dies and the doctor shows up. He tells Donna that this beetle was part of the trickster brigade, a nice little link there to the Sarah Jane adventures. Then Donna gives the doctor the message that Rose gave her. Bad Wolf. And with that, the doctor rushes back to the TARDIS as Bad Wolf is everywhere and the TARDIS has gone all red, setting us up nicely for our big old bumper finale. Turn Left is a fan favourite and there's no question as to why. Doctor Who hasn't really tackled a dystopian future in like a pretty realistic way and they tackled this in a really adult way, grounded in drama and it's really dark and really brilliant. On to the stolen Earth now and the Doctor and Donna rush back to Earth to find everything is normal. So they head back to the TARDIS and the Doctor explains that if the walls between universes are breaking down then everything is in danger but he's also pretty excited that Rose is coming back. And then when they step back outside the TARDIS, they find the Earth is now gone. The whole thing, just gone. 
back on said Earth, we see Martha and the unit lot reacting to the huge earthquake that was caused by the Earth being moved. Then Jack and the Torchwood team, then Sarah Jane and Luke, and then Sylvia and Wilf. So everyone, all the spin-offs are getting in on the action here. This is basically the Avengers four years early. Even Rose teleports in with a big gun. And then every single one of them looks up at the sky and sees a load of planets. Also, I just want to point out the title sequence, which usually lists the actor playing the Doctor and the Companion, has six names this time, so this is going to be pretty big. But, as this is a Russell T Davis episode, we have to first find out what they're saying about it on TV. And here we get Richard Dawkins and Paul O'Grady, two of our finest minds. Actually, I really like Paul O'Grady, rest in peace. Torchwood and Sarah Jane then do some readings and find out that there are 26 other planets in the sky, with a space station right in the centre. And Luke phones Maria and Clyde, telling them to stay inside and not get to be in this episode. Which seems a bit unfair, Gwen and Yanto get to be here. Then a load of spaceships reach the Earth's orbit, and so as the world ends, each of our heroes tries to phone the Doctor and Donna, but can't reach them. So Martha calls Jack, and they talk about Martha's recent promotion to work on something called Project Indigo. Anyway, the ships arrive, and everyone gets a message. Exterminate! 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 The word exterminate over and over. And this moment is brilliant, as you can see the fear in everyone's eyes who recognises the voice, knowing immediately that they're just going to die now, and hugging the bewildered others who don't know what a Dalek is. Then the Dalek ships start blowing everything up and invading Earth. And we even get a nice new red Dalek, called the Supreme Dalek. Back with the Doctor now, who takes a little trip to the Shadow Proclamation to see if they know what's going on. The Shadow Proclamation basically being a Jadoon police station, and we learn more about the other planets that got taken, including Pyrovilia, Adipose 3, and... Clom? Clom's gone? Who won't Clom? ...home planet of the Absorbaloths. And these planets are being used to create some big engine to power... something. Meanwhile, on Earth, the Daleks take down the Valiant, and then invade Unit as Martha activates Project Indigo. She also is handed something called the Osterhagen Key, and is told that if the Doctor isn't coming, then she needs to use it. Ominous. So, yes, Martha uses Project Indigo, which is a teleporter taken from the Sontarans. Jack fears that without coordinates, Martha's just gonna die using it, which, yeah, makes sense. Where's she teleporting to? Donna reminds Doctor about that thing that she mentioned in Episode 1 of this series, about the bees disappearing, and the Doctor's like, Oh yeah, that's because they're aliens, so they were going home. And so the Doctor then uses their wavelengths to find the Earth, and that is some contrivance right there. They really couldn't have thought of anything better than just following B wavelengths. The Daleks start rounding people up, and Wilf shoots this one with a paintball gun. But the Dalek ain't having it, so it goes to kill Wilf, but then Rose shows up and kills it first. And then Will finally reveals to Sylvia exactly what Donna's been doing with the Doctor all this time. So the Doctor reaches the end of a B wavelength trail, but the Earth isn't there. And so he gives up, as does everyone back on Earth. Until, of course, they get a message from Harriet Jones. Remember her? She links everyone up, well, everyone apart from Rose, as Wilf's computer doesn't have a webcam. And, hey, Martha's not dead. She just teleported home. That was lucky. Everyone then uses their combined resources to transmit a signal to the Doctor's phone, which the Doctor can then follow, but so do the Daleks. They show up at Harriet Jones' house and shoot her dead. Except, Russell T. Davis wrote a poem in 2017 in which he explains that what actually happened here was a trap door opened and Harriet Jones escaped on a motorbike. He also confirmed that this was canon. So, um... Do with that information as you will. The Doctor then patches into the call, but then so does Davros, famous wheelchair user and creator of the Daleks. He reveals that Dalek Khan teleported back into the Time War to bring all the Daleks back, and then went mad doing so. So the Doctor heads to Earth, and Jack teleports over to meet him, as the Daleks invade Torchwood. Sarah Jane heads out to find the Doctor, but gets stopped by a couple of Daleks, and then Rose also teleports to find him. And so the Doctor steps out of the TARDIS, sees Rose, and runs after her. And then a Dalek sneaks out of the shadows, and straight up just kills him. 
Sure, Jack shows up and kills the Dalek, but the Doctor's actually properly dying. So they all take him back to the TARDIS as he starts regenerating. Holy moly, absolute insane cliffhanger that was legitimately front page news for a week in the UK. Was David Tennant really leaving the show and was he actually regenerating? Well, we had an impossibly long week of waiting to find out. Well, now then, on to the Series 4 finale, Journey's End, which starts with the Doctor sending all that regeneration energy into his extra hand and not changing. Mickey and Jackie show up to save Sarah Jane, and that Dalek invading Torchwood gets all frozen as it turns out Torchwood has time stop protection, wherein nothing can get in or out. So Gwen and Yanto are basically written out of the rest of the episode. The Daleks then bring the TARDIS aboard their ship and Sarah Jane, Mickey and Jackie follow. But they can't just teleport there, no, that would be too easy. As the teleporters take half an hour to recharge. So instead of doing the smart thing and just waiting, Sarah Jane has the idea of surrendering to the Daleks in the hopes that they'll bring them to the ship. And then Martha does a bit more teleporting of her own, but not to the Dalek ship, but to Germany. Full of German Daleks, sure. The Doctor, Jack and Rose step out onto the Dalek ship, but Donna stays on the TARDIS, feeling the hand calling to her. And then the doors lock and the Daleks destroy the TARDIS, burning it in the core of the ship. But Donna touches the hand and it explodes, regenerating another Doctor out of it, who then saves them. Jack, all angry about the supposed destruction of the TARDIS, shoots the Supreme Dalek with what looks like a World War II pistol. What happened to that big gun he was using just five minutes ago? Anyway, it does nothing and the Supreme Dalek shoots him. And Rose and the Doctor are then taken to see Davros. That new Doctor tells Donna that he's the result of an instantaneous biological metacrisis, which is all a big load of science-y babble. Basically, he's part Doctor, part Donna. And he's even got only one heart. Back with the old Doctor, though, and he and Rose get locked up, and Davros does some evil monologuing for a bit, before then testing his reality bomb on these prisoners, who include Sarah Jane, Mickey, and Jackie. The reality bomb uses all the planets to reduce the prisoners to nothing. But Mickey, Sarah Jane and Jackie all escape just in time. Davros then explains that he intends to use the reality bomb on everything, every universe, until reality is completely destroyed, leaving only the Daleks. So pretty high stakes then. After being disposed of by the Daleks, Jack escapes and sneaks through the Dalek ship and soon meets up with this lot. And then Sarah Jane reveals that she bought a warp star with her, whatever that is. Meanwhile, in Germany, Martha prepares the Osterhagen key. And even the Metacrisis Doctor is constructing a weapon too, which can kill all the Daleks. So, now with all our weapons ready, Martha calls the Dalek ship, demanding that the Daleks leave Earth, or she'll activate the Osterhagen key, exploding 25 nuclear warheads under the Earth's crust that will literally tear the Earth apart, but also breaking the reality bomb. But wait, Jack also calls the Daleks, having wired the warp star to the ship, ready to blow that up too. Also, Davros recognises Sarah Jane here, remembering having met her in the 1975 story Genesis of the Daleks, which is a nice little callback. Davros then does a whole we're not so different speech to the Doctor, saying that whilst he's made the Daleks into weapons, he's turned these people into weapons. And then we get a montage of some of the deaths that the Doctor's been responsible for over the course of the show. Just in case, you know, the point wasn't absolutely hammered in just yet. Oh, and the Osterhagen key and the Warp Star? Yet yeah, none of that matters anymore, as everyone just gets teleported to Davros. And then the reality bomb is detonated. But wait, we forgot about the Metacrisis Doctor, who shows up just in time with his weapon, and nah, Davros just zaps him. Then Donna grabs it, but is zapped too. But then the reality bomb stops, thanks to Donna, who, thanks to the zapping from Davros, completed the biological Metacrisis, with Donna now having the Doctor's mind, now being part Doctor, part Donna. Donna taps some more buttons, immobilises all the Daleks, frees everyone, and then all the Doctors send all the planets back home. Davros is like, Dalek Khan, you can see all of time. What the f***? And Dalek Khan's like, yeah, you got mugs, son. I decided Daleks are shit and that, and I've been helping the Doctor all along, bitch. The Supreme Dalek then shows up, shoots the controls, and Jack shoots it. Not with a pistol this time, no. Now he actually bothered to get his big gun. And with the controls all destroyed, there's still one planet left to return, Earth. So they'll have to use the TARDIS to fly the Earth home, but not before the Metacrisis Doctor explodes every single Dalek, 
So I guess the controls weren't that broken then? Because he was just tapping the exact same buttons that just got destroyed. What? Anyway, everyone piles into the TARDIS and the Doctor offers to take Davros with them. God, that would have been an awkward journey home. But no, Davros declines and so they all leave as the ship explodes. The Doctor gets Gwen and Yanto to send all the rift energy to him to act as a tow rope and also asks if Gwen is related to the other character Eve Miles played all the way back in Series 1. Then Mr. Smith and K-9 help out somehow. Look, it doesn't matter, just enjoy the cameo. The Doctor then explains that the TARDIS is actually supposed to have six pilots and so gets everyone, not Jackie, to help fly it and Earth home. The Doctor drops Sarah Jane, Martha and Jack off, once more breaking Jack's vortex manipulator for seemingly no reason. And then Mickey leaves too, deciding to stay in this universe and going off with Jack and Martha to seemingly join Torchwood Series 3. And finally, the Doctor heads back to the parallel universe to Bad Wolf Bay where he last saw Rose all the way back in the Series 2 finale Doomsday. The Doctor gives Rose the Metacrisis Doctor as, I don't know, a weird sex doll I guess? There was originally a deleted scene where the Doctor gave her a seed to grow a new TARDIS, but nah. Rose asks the two Doctors what it was that he was going to say to her the last time he was here, and the Doctor doesn't answer, but the Metacrisis Doctor does, whispering it into her ear, and then they start getting it on right there and then. Our Doctor then slinks away, and Donna starts overheating, the Time Lord Metacrisis now exploding her brain. So the Doctor stops it by wiping her mind of all the memories of him and their time together, and he takes her home and tells Wilf and Sylvia that if she ever remembers him, she'll die. And that's the way it has to be, and it can never, ever change, and certainly can't be fixed super easily 15 years later. No, that's it. So the Doctor says goodbye to Donna, and Will promises to remember the Doctor on Donna's behalf. So the Doctor goes off in the rain now all sad, and we don't even get any watts to see us through until Christmas. We were originally going to, so I remember going to pop up in the TARDIS, but nah, this is way more depressing. Jeez, did they get enough in those couple of episodes? They stuff literally everything from Rusty Davis era, cramming it all into these episodes. The only issue is, by the time we get to Journey's End, there isn't too much for those characters to do. Sure, they set up the key and the warp start, but they just get dismissed immediately. Granted, that's to show the power of the Daleks and how hopeless everything is, but still, it would have been nice if they actually did something that mattered. And once more, Rusty Davis finishes his series with a massive deus ex machina where he's written himself into a corner that he just fixes everything like that, and it just leaves me wanting something clever out of a finale, not just the Doctor saving everything magically at the end. But you know, overall, I would say this was another great series, following on from the greatness of Series 3. And I liked Catherine Tate, she was great. All of the actors who were in it were giving it their all, especially Bernard Cribbins, he's obviously the best. And I like how Doctor Who is seemingly tackling more and more mature stories. Believe me, we have come a long way from the farting aliens of Series 1. Music is a big part of Doctor Who. I mean, really big. I used to get the albums and listen to them over and over. My first iPod was pretty much exclusively Doctor Who music. Well, that and the Dick and Dom soundtrack, but that's another video. All the music in Doctor Who was so iconic and the man responsible was Murray Gold, who is still making the music for Doctor Who today, all these years later. Well, his music became so popular that on top of the albums, there was also a concert put on called Doctor Who at the Proms, which took place at the Royal Albert Hall in London, where a full orchestra performed songs from the soundtrack and many special guests from the show made appearances. The concert aired on TV and with it was a special mini episode that aired during the show's intermission called Music of the Spheres. The episode starts with the Doctor composing some music in the TARDIS when a Grask shows up. And he asks what the music is that he can hear, and it turns out that the Doctor is filtering all of space through the TARDIS to make music. Also, it seems that this Grask is in fact a friendly Grask, and it came to warn the Doctor about that. A portal opening in the TARDIS, leading directly to the Royal Albert Hall. And then the episode starts going all interactive, with the Doctor speaking to the audience of the Royal Albert Hall. He then grabs the symphony he just composed and chucks it out of a portal and all the papers flutter down, which is a pretty cool effect. Then the Doctor conducts the orchestra with his sonic screwdriver as they perform the song that he wrote. Oh, and then the Grask escapes through the portal and starts attacking the orchestra. So, not too friendly then. The Doctor teleports the Grask back into the TARDIS and then to the other side of the galaxy. 
The Doctor then does a pretty speech about the power of music, says goodbye, and closes the portal. This was a pretty fun little special. I liked it. The Sarah Jane Adventures is back with Series 2 airing in Autumn 2008, kicking off with the episode The Last on Tauren, where Maria's dad has just got a new job in America, meaning her and Maria will have to move. But that'll all have to wait, as there's been reports of strange lights near an observatory. So our heroes go to check it out and find the place abandoned. This girl shows up saying that something took her dad, so Clyde and Luke go looking for him and find a Sontaran and its invisible spaceship. The girl's dad shows up unharmed but clearly possessed and asks them all to leave, which they do, joining Luke and Clyde at their spaceship. And Sarah Jane quickly sonics it visible, recognising the ship immediately, having first met the Sontarans in the 1973 story, The Time Warrior. The Sontaran then shows up, chasing everyone down and trying to shoot them as they run back to the observatory, where the Sontaran confronts Clyde and Sarah Jane. He explains that he survived the events of Doctor Who Series 4 in an escape pod, and that he's going to make satellites crash into nuclear power stations to wipe out the Earth and avenge the Sontarans. The Sontaran then knocks out Sarah Jane as everyone else escapes. Maria calls her dad and asks him to speak to Mr. Smith to find out the Sontaran's weakness, their probic vent. And Maria's mum breaks into Sarah Jane's house because, again, she's the worst, and finds out about everything. Luke and Maria mess about with the ship, and Clyde rescues Sarah Jane and the girl from where they're being held. Luke does some hacking, stopping the satellites, but the girl was secretly possessed this whole time and restarts it. But Maria's mum shows up and jams her heel into the Sontaran's probic vent, knocking it out. She does not get to save the day, but it's not fair. They all make the Sontaran go home and knock out Maria's mum and tell her it was all a dream. Then Maria leaves, effectively writing her out of the show. Supposedly the actress left because she wanted to focus on her GCSE exams. Which, I mean, if it's between GCSE exams and being in a hit TV show, I know what one 15 year old me would have picked. But I suppose it means that Maria's mum is also written out of the show, so swings and roundabouts. Day of the Clown starts with a new family moving into Maria's house, including this girl called Rani, her mum, and her dad, who's the new head teacher of the school. Because remember, the last head teacher was a Slovene? Oh, and also there are these clowns lurking around and stealing kids. But only kids who have this ticket to a circus museum can see the clowns, which includes Clyde and Rani. So they all go to the circus museum to find future companion Bradley Walsh playing Mr. Spellman, and he makes all these clown robots attack. Mr. Spellman reveals that he was the original Pied Piper and feeds off of fear. But then Rani's phone rings and the electromagnetic signal causes Mr. Spellman to freeze, allowing everyone to escape. They then head back to Sarah Jane's house where Rani is told everything. All about aliens and... Uh, no, that's pretty much it. Sarah Jane reveals to Luke that clowns are her biggest fear after she saw a puppet move during a storm as a child. That's her biggest fear. You watched your best friend fall to her death. But sure, no, a puppet of a clown is far more traumatic. Sarah Jane revisits that telekinesis lab from last series where they have a meteorite that brought Mr. Spellman to Earth and she nicks a little bit of it. Meanwhile, at the school, all these balloons appear and start possessing all the children, making them all march towards the museum, Pied Pipering them away. But Mr. Smith phones all the kids interfering with the signal and setting everyone free, except for Luke, who's taken by Mr. Spellman. But then Clyde starts telling some jokes, the opposite of fear, which weakens Mr. Spellman, and Sarah Jane traps him in her bit of a meteorite. Secrets of the Stars has everyone going to see an astrologer called Mr. Truman, and he knows stuff about everyone, even Sarah Jane and the Doctor. Sarah Jane tries to find out if it's alien, but Mr. Smith confirms it's not. I, I bet it is though. And seemingly so does Sarah Jane, as she goes to see him and he starts zapping her. So definitely alien. Well, it turns out Mr. Smith couldn't identify what's possessing Mr. Truman, as these beings are from before the Big Bang, existing in a universe before this one. Clyde then gets kidnapped and also possessed, and Mr. Truman goes on TV on every single channel, and begins possessing everyone in order of their star signs, starting with all the Geminis. Possessed Clyde corners everyone in the attic with his new zappy powers, and Sarah Jane dares Clyde to kill her, which seems to bring him back. They all go to Mr. Truman and Clyde pretends to still be possessed to get through the guards. Luke then touches everyone and breaks the spell, as he doesn't have a birthday, so no star sign. And that's it, that was pretty much the whole episode. You had beings from before the Big Bang possessing the whole world and you somehow made it so dull and boring.
This episode was just terrible and really difficult to get through. This, this is what I feared this show would be coming back to it. Boring, cringy nonsense, and this episode was unfortunately all of those things. My destiny is now. The mark of the Berserker starts with this kid, Jacob, having an evil alien pendant that allows him to control others. The pendant starts infecting him, and so he throws it away. And then Rani finds it and pockets it. Meanwhile, Luke is having a sleepover with Clyde as Sarah Jane is going away and we finally get to see a bit of Clyde's home life and even get to know his mum. It's strange that it's taken this long to see Clyde's family. What with how well we got to know Maria's family and even Rani's family already. Speaking of Rani's family, her dad is now doing whatever Rani tells her. And then Jacob shows up and warns Rani that the more she uses the pendant, the more it will infect you. He tells her that he found it at school and that it's evil. So Rani decides to leave it at Sarah Jane's house for when she gets back. The next morning, Clyde's dad shows up at his house. And it's been stated many times in the series that Clyde's dad ran out on him and his mum. So this is admittedly a bit of a shock. There's then a pretty heavy scene where Clyde lays into his dad. And Clyde's actor, Daniel Anthony, really sells the betrayal. This kid's a damn good actor. Probably because he wasn't actually a kid. He was in his 20s at the time and way older than all the other child actors on the show. Clyde eventually agrees to spend the day with his dad to talk things out properly. Turns out that Clyde's dad ran off with Clyde's aunt to Germany. And can we get Maria's mum back because I think these two would be a perfect match. Clyde's still secretly desperate for his dad's love and approval, so tells him that he saves the world from aliens and takes him to Sarah Jane's house. I do keep forgetting that in this world everyone knows about aliens, so it's really not too much of a shock to him. Alien? Yeah, right. You mean like those uh, Dalek things? His dad then finds the pendant and steals it, now using it to control Clyde and telling him to forget all about Luke and Rani, which he does. Luke and Rani try calling Sarah Jane, but she's busy fighting whatever this thing is. So they call Maria and ask her dad to help them hack into unit to find out more about the pendant. Maria's dad works in IT and look, if Mickey could hack into unit, anyone can. We find out that the pendant was made by aliens called the Berserkers and if someone uses it too much, they themselves will turn into a Berserker. They track Clyde's phone and Luke, Rani and Clyde's mum go after him finally cornering them at the docks as Clyde's dad goes full on berserker. Sarah Jane then shows up and helps Clyde's dad regain control and take off the pendant. Clyde considers using the pendant to make his parents love each other again, but instead uses it to make his mum forget about what she just saw before then throwing the pendant into the ocean. That was good, that was a good episode, I like that one. It's nice that we finally got a bit of Clyde's backstory. The Temptation of Sarah Jane Smith is the second Sarah Jane episode with Sarah Jane in the title. The last one, Whatever Happened to Sarah Jane, was my favourite episode of last series. So I have high hopes for this one. Sarah Jane is accompanying this boy who fell through a time slip back to 1951, a time she recognises well. She leaves and closes up the time slip, but can't stop thinking about it. As 1951 happens to be the year that her parents died in a car crash when Sarah Jane was just a baby. Sarah Jane eventually gives in to temptation and Sarah Jane and Luke head back through the time slip. Where they soon run into Sarah Jane's parents and no way, Sarah Jane's dad is Mr. Stephen from the Basil Brush show. Believe me, if you were a kid around this time watching the Sarah Jane Adventures, then you definitely watched the Basil Brush show. In fact, when I was at school, one of my best friends bet me £5 that I couldn't find anyone in our year who hadn't watched the Basil Brush show. I asked everyone, and he still won. So, let's start with Series 1, Episode 1, The Date. Basil and Dave are just chilling out on the sofa when Mr. Stephen shows up dressed as a hedgehog. Wait, isn't this supposed to be about Doctor Who? We're going too far off track, let's go back a couple steps, where were we? Sarah Jane. Clyde and Rani go to Sarah Jane's house to find her missing, but that cube is flashing. Remember the cube? Well, they decide to also go back to the time slip, but it's now closed. Except it opens again, and that boy steps out. Except that he's not a boy, he's actually a Grask. Sarah Jane finds out this isn't just the year her parents die, it's literally the same day. So Sarah Jane uses her sonic lipstick to stop the car's engine, meaning that now her parents won't die. With a job well done, Sarah Jane and Luke return to the present day and find the Earth's been destroyed and the tricksters there, with all of this having been a trap. So Luke and Sarah Jane head back to the past to try to put things right. The cube protects Clyde and Rani from all the time getting rewritten and they now find themselves in this new world, wandering through the wasteland where they spy the Grask and follow him to all these slaves. 
We then get a bit of a backstory for the Grask, learning that he was originally supposed to die as his spacecraft was burning up and the trickster offered it a way out in exchange for the Grask's eternal servitude. Clyde and Rani offer to help free the Grask in exchange for a gateway back to the past. So Rani goes back to the past where everything's going to hell. Sarah Jane's parents eventually decide to sacrifice themselves to fix everything and defeat the trickster. And Clyde gives the Grask that cube, setting him free from the trickster. This episode felt a bit too similar to Father's Day for me. So many of the same story beats were there and it ended up feeling just like an inferior version of that episode. In the series finale, Enemy of the Bane, Mrs. Wormwood is back and kidnaps Rani's mum. Rani and Sarah Jane go to the old bubble shop factory to find her and they're all attacked by the Bane. Even Mrs. Wormwood. It turns out that Mrs. Wormwood needs Sarah Jane's help to stop the Bane from taking over the galaxy. And so she asks Sarah Jane to get her a scroll from the unit Black Archives. The Black Archives are where unit stores all its most dangerous alien stuff. So in order to get inside, Sarah Jane goes to see Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart, a character who used to work for Unit and was kind of a pretty big deal in the classic series of Doctor Who. Apparently Martha Jones was supposed to be in this episode, but she wasn't available, so they had to get Nicholas Courtney as the Brigadier back instead. Which was actually pretty fortunate, as Nicholas Courtney died only a few years after this episode, making this his final appearance in anything Doctor Who related. He did show up in a few big Finnish audio dramas after this, but this is his last TV appearance. So the Brigadier helps sneak Rani and Sarah Jane into the Black Archives, whilst back at Sarah Jane's house more Bane show up and try to kill Mrs Wormwood. But then that Sontaran shows up, remember the Sontaran from the last Sontaran? Well that Sontaran is here and he saves Mrs Wormwood, as it turns out they're working together. Then the pair of them take the scroll and Luke. You see, the scroll can open up a doorway to a supercomputer that can control the universe, so standard villain stuff. And obviously Mrs Wormwood wasn't trying to stop the Bane, that was all a lie. Meanwhile, Unit tracked down Sarah Jane and the gang, demanding the scroll returned, but this Jim Carrey looking soldier is immediately beaten by a table. Turns out he's not even a soldier, but another Bane. Not that it matters, as the Brigadier just shoots it in the face of his cane, killing it. That space doorway opens, Mrs. Wormwood attacks the Sontaran and goes all Darth Vader, saying her and Luke could rule the universe together. Then everyone else shows up and the Sontaran pushes Mrs. Wormwood into the portal, saving the universe. And that's it, that's, that's the end. This season definitely wasn't as good as the last, but for the most part it was still fine. I'm starting to see that this show works a lot better when it's not just the monster of the week, but when the threat is intrinsically linked to a certain character, like Clyde's relationship with his dad or Sarah Jane's relationship with her parents and how the alien threat can be used to explore that. I don't know, maybe it's just that I've watched so much Doctor Who stuff lately that the threat of the end of world just isn't enough to get me engaged anymore. In researching for this video, I stumbled upon a piece of officially licensed Doctor Who media that I never knew existed. Somehow, this company called BBV got the rights to use Doctor Who characters and so made a load of these technically licensed low-budget films. And the most infamous of these, and the only one released during the period Doctor Who was airing, is the film Zygon When Being You Isn't Enough. We haven't actually met the Zygons in Doctor Who yet, but they're these shape-shifting aliens who first appeared in the fourth Doctor story, Terror of the Zygons, in 1975. And this film is about those aliens, so let's check it out. The film starts with this man named Mike, who's been having these strange dreams filled with crappy special effects, where he dreams he's a monster and oh, there's our first bit of nudity and we're less than a minute in. I'll warn you now, this film has a lot of nudity. So Mike discusses these dreams with his doctor Lauren and then this man shows up and demands that Lauren help Mike remember who he really is. Cheers. She goes to the police and they tell her that that man is a serial killer called Robert Calhoun and then just say, you know, if you see him again, give us a call. The hospital then says that Lauren has taken too much interest in Mike's case and also she hasn't taken any time off in two years, so her boss makes her take six weeks off. Lauren tells Mike that she can't see him anymore and will have to refer him to a therapist. So he asks her out on a date and we immediately cut him taking her back to his and getting it on in front of all these gnomes. This, um, pretty graphic sex scene is then interrupted by some more crappy effects, but Lauren doesn't seem to mind. 
we are then treated to a montage of their developing relationship, including things like going to lunch, kissing, and whatever is going on here. You know, one of the most important things in a relationship. Doing little hand puppets? Then one night Mike wakes up to find that he's strangling Lauren, which unlike the weird hand stuff, she's not into. So Mike leaves and Lauren discusses all this with her flatmate, but wait, Lauren then finds her flatmate dead, with who she thought was her flatmate transforming into Robert, that serial killer bloke, who then implants this bit of glow on her neck and tells her that Mike is a Zygon like him. And then he turns her into a Zygon too. Lauren then steals this guy and then becomes him, I think. Think, I'll be honest, this is super hard to follow. For a film about people shape-shifting into other people, they clearly don't have the budget to show two copies of the same person on screen at once. Which makes it super confusing as to telling who's who. Lauren, as the man, then has a graphic sex scene with his girlfriend, and then after she's done, puts the guy back in her place. I don't know what the point of any of that was. And then she transforms into her colleague and bangs her boss. Again, don't know what the point of that is. Then Lauren goes to see Mike and she tells him that she's now a Zygon too. And she then phones the police on Robert. But the police officer turns out to be Robert. So Mike and Lauren escape and drive to the police station. But then Lauren gets immediately arrested for the murder of her flatmate. So now she has to transform into this police officer to try and get herself off the hook. And then Lauren and Mike go to a hotel. They fight using their glow powers and Mike leaves. So Lauren then gets naked again because... Of course she does, it's been nearly five minutes without any nudity. And Mike goes to meet Robert so that they can complete their Zygon mission, which is to get this power station to pump out some greenhouse gases so that the planet will get warmer. I mean, that's happening anyway. That's really the major conflict of this film? That's the driving force behind everything that's happening. What? So Lauren then shows up and convinces him not to do it, which again, it's happening anyway, and then they drive away. They go to find the original Robert, who's also naked, and there's also the original Mike here, and whoa, they finally managed to put the same actor twice in one shot. This seems to be where the whole budget of the film went. They free the real Mike and Robert, and then Zygon Robert goes full Zygon, but is beaten up by Lauren in possibly the worst fight scene ever. Like, what just happened there? Was that supposed to be a car crash or something? I literally have no idea what is happening right now. They take original Mike and Robert to the hospital, where Lauren then stabs up her boss and shoots him in the head. Then goes on a shooting spree, except it's not her, it's the Robert Zygon. So Lauren then has to go on the run, now wanted by the police. Except she just goes back to her flat, where Zygon Robert then shows up, turns into a copy of Lauren, and Lauren shoots it. The end. Just... Just what the hell was any of that? I think that was the worst piece of media I've ever seen. Certainly the worst I've ever paid money for. That was £11 to download. And when I bought it, they had the audacity to try and sneak in a donation of them. Honestly, even out of morbid curiosity, do not watch this film. After series four, everyone who had worked on the show for the previous four years was suitably exhausted. And as such, it was announced that after the upcoming Christmas episode, instead of another series in 2009, we'd be getting four specials, sprinkled throughout the year. And that the showrunner Russell T Davis would be leaving after the specials, handing over the reins to Stephen Moffat, the obvious choice for a successor. Then, on October 29th, 2008, Doctor Who won Most Popular Drama and David Tennant won the award for Outstanding Drama Performance. But David wasn't there that night to collect his award, as he was off playing Hamlet. But, as it was currently the interval of that performance, he made an appearance via live video, where he said this. When Doctor Who returns in 2010, it won't be with me. No, don't make me cry. Um, it's... The 2009 shows will be my last playing the Doctor. So this was officially the end of an era. New showrunner, new Doctor. Which meant that these last five episodes would be all that's left of this era of Doctor Who. Speculation went mad over who the new Doctor would be, with bookmakers putting high odds on Peterson Joseph, Sean Pertwee, Russell Tovey and James McAvoy. And the Christmas special titled The Next Doctor played hugely into this hype and speculation of who the next Doctor would be. This episode begins with the Doctor landing in a snowy Victorian street and he soon hears someone calling for him, shouting Doctor. So he goes running and finds this woman, Rosita, 
who's running away from some alien. But this isn't the Doctor she wanted. This is a guy calling himself a Time Lord known as the Doctor, played by David Morrissey. So I guess this is a later incarnation of the Doctor? Or at least that's what we all believed at the time. The pair chase down the alien, which is some sort of cyber creature. Well, they sort of chase it down, sort of. It gets away, but our Doctor is more concerned with why this next Doctor doesn't remember him. So our Doctor calls himself John Smith and starts trying to work out why the next Doctor has lost his memories. Which admittedly doesn't take long as he just says that the Cybermen took them. And it seems that the Cybermen have something big planned here, with a new cyber controller and everything. They're currently tracking the Doctor and have this woman working for them. John Smith follows the Doctor to his house as he's investigating the cyber murder of a man named Jackson Lake, whose body was never found. And then there was a load of kidnappings, and now the newest murder, a man named Aubrey Fairchild, whose house this is. John Smith notices that the Doctor is wearing a fob watch, so he opens it, releasing all his... nothing. Hmm. John Smith finds some cyber info stamps, and the Doctor remembers holding one when he had all his memories stolen. And then some Cybermen show up. John Smith fights them off with a sword, and the Doctor remembers the info stamps can be used as a weapon, blasting the Cybermen. A little while later at Aubrey Fairchild's funeral, that woman turns up again. She's called Miss Hartigan, who worked as head of a workhouse. She admits to murdering Fairchild, then all the Cybermen show up to kill most of the mourners and kidnap the rest. John Smith finds another info stamp among Jackson Lake's possessions, and then John Smith and the Doctor go to visit the Doctor's TARDIS. Which is a hot air balloon? Oh, so he fixed the chameleon circuit then. No, wait, it really just is a hot air balloon. And with that, John Smith has figured it all out. Turns out the Cybermen escaped the void after it was destroyed in the end of Series 4 and ended up here in Victorian England. And the Doctor is actually Jackson Lake, who found an info stamp with info on the Doctor and absorbed it. So then, why didn't he recognise David Tennant? He literally absorbed memories of his face. Oh, and the Cybermen killed Jackson Lake's wife and kidnapped his son. But no time to dwell on that, as all the kids from all the workhouses are being taken by Cybermen to work on something called the Cyber King, controlled by Miss Hartigan. So our heroes sneak inside and free all of the children, including Jackson Lake's son. And then the Cyber King wakes up and starts marching through London. The Doctor, the, the proper Doctor this time, nicks a bit of Dalek tech, takes the hot air balloon and blasts the Cyber King into the time vortex, saving the day. Jackson Lake then invites the Doctor to join in for Christmas dinner and the Doctor agrees. And then the episode ends, meaning that the true identity of who the next Doctor will be is still very much a mystery. Or at least it was for another week. As on the 3rd of January 2009, a special episode of Doctor Who Confidential aired, which revealed Matt Smith was going to be the 11th Doctor. At only 26, Matt Smith was the youngest person to play the Doctor at that point, and people seriously doubted he'd be able to play the role convincingly. Well, we still had nearly a year until we'd get to see him in action, as we still have another four specials with Tennant left. The first of these airing at Easter on the 11th of April 2009, called Planet of the Dead. This episode starts with Lady Christina breaking into the International Gallery to steal this chalice thingy, then escaping the police by hopping onto a bus, and then the Doctor takes a seat next to her, and is eating an Easter egg. And yeah, that's pretty much all the connection to Easter you're really going to get in this Easter special. So the police follow the bus as it goes through a tunnel, and then through a wormhole to another planet. Probably the most impressive thing about this episode is that this isn't fake. They really shipped a bus all the way to a Dubai desert. But as a result, this does play off like a concept episode. An idea that sounds exciting when you pitch it, but then there's really not much beyond that. Just like the desert, this episode is pretty much void of any substance or plot. The bus driver tries walking back through the wormhole and comes out all bones. They need the bus to protect them, you see. So they somehow need to get the bus moving again. We get introduced to all the people on the bus, and don't worry, you don't need to learn anything about them. They don't have much personality or really even contribute to the plot. All apart from this woman, who just happens to be psychic so can supply random plot relevant information when needed, which is handy. Everyone bands together to get the bus working again, and then the Doctor and Christina just decide to explore the endless desert, where they then see a storm approaching. 
So the Doctor calls Unit, who are already at the other side of the tunnel, and one of them is a scientist called Malcolm, played by comedian Lee Evans, who desperately tries to inject some life into this episode. The only problem is, other than spouting some sciencey jargon, there's not really a point to him either. The Doctor and Christina meet this fly alien called a Tritivor, who also crashed here. We learn that a year ago this planet was teeming with life and the Doctor launches a probe into the storm to find out that it's a storm of metal stingrays who had devoured the planet and they're also the cause of a wormhole. Oh, and the wormhole is growing. Oh, and the bus is out of petrol. Luckily though, the Tritivore ship has a power source that can get the bus working again, but it's down this shaft. So Christina using all her burglary equipment goes down to get it. And... <laughs> Lady Christina is so obnoxious of a character, I really can't stand her. Hopefully this stingray that's down here will eat her, but no, she escapes. Although the Tritivores don't escape, they do get eaten. The Doctor and Christina run back to the bus, and the Doctor powers it up. He then flies the bus back through the wormhole, and then Malcolm and the Doctor close it before too many stingrays get through. And then Unit pretty easily shoot the stingrays down. Christina kisses the Doctor and happy endings all round. Malcolm hugs the Doctor, Christina escapes on the bus and the psychic woman warns the Doctor that his song is ending. Not only that, but she also says that it is returning and that he will knock four times. I wonder what that could mean. I'm just going to say it, this was a bad episode. If this was in the middle of a series, it would feel like complete filler. But after waiting months for just this one special, yeah, it wasn't good. So, for the comic relief charity telethon in 2009, we got a Sarah Jane Adventures mini episode. Doctor Who has often done things with comic relief, including the Curse of Fatal Death and the Catherine Tate sketch where David Tennant turns her into a Rose action figure. That one's weird. So let's see if Sarah Jane can keep up that tradition with some quality content. Sarah Jane and the gang are visited by Ronnie Corbett, a very famous British comedian playing an alien ambassador who offers Earth the gift of some red nose headbands. Ronnie Corbett then starts farting, and it turns out he's a Slovene. K9 then teleports in and attacks him, but Corbett clamps him and then reveals all his Slovene-ness. Except they're just reusing one of the child Slovene costumes from the series. So are we supposed to believe that this is a child Slovene who's pretending to be Ronnie Corbett? Or just a really short Slovene? Oh, and those headbands paralyse the gang. Clyde then throws a hat at a switch which paralyses the Slovene instead, and then they teleport him away. That was absolutely pathetic, cringy, and I'm embarrassed that I made you watch it with me. Let's quickly give a little mention of a Doctor Who hardback novel series that released throughout this era. I mean, there was no shortage of Doctor Who books available at this time, but the most popular were definitely these original novels, which did a great job of expanding out the universe. And I'll admit, I read all of the ones during the Matt Smith era, but I never actually read any of these. Luckily, my good friend Alex owns all of them, so I'm borrowing his collection for a bit. And as you may notice, there are a lot. They started putting out six novels a year, but then Martha had like 13 novels, including this one, which goes into detail about what happened during that year in between Sound of Drums and Last of the Time Lords. But I don't know how anyone could keep up with reading all these at that point. The only one I remember reading a bit of is The Stone Rose. I think I was like nine years old and I feel the books were just a little bit too difficult for me at the time to really get into. So I can't really vouch for the quality of any of them I'm afraid, but I'm sure there are some hidden gems amongst them. And hey, Human Nature started off as a novel before it became an episode, so who knows, maybe one day one of these will get adapted too. One book whose quality I can vouch for though is The Writer's Tale by Russell T Davies. This has got to be my favourite book on writing and the ultimate companion piece to the show. It gives really in-depth behind the scenes information of the production of series 4 and the specials and is also part diary with loads of deleted scenes of bits of script including a whole backstory for Davros. It goes over so many ideas that were scrapped like a Star Trek crossover and an episode starring JK Rowling fighting off wizards. Thank god that one never got made. I absolutely love this book, and my favourite thing about it is how it really shows an insight into the mind of an actual writer. Like, we put these people on pedestals, but then you read about Rusty Davis just wandering through Cardiff, struggling with writer's block and having to scrape ideas together in time. It's really good, and if you're the sort of person to watch, I don't know, a nearly 8 hour video on Doctor Who, you should definitely check this out. In 2009, the BBC aired a show called Tonight's the Night, hosted by John Barrowman. 
As part of a show, there was a competition where someone could win the chance to star in a Doctor Who mini-episode written by Russell T. Davies. Which, uh, is what we're gonna watch now. The episode starts with the, I'm gonna say, unfortunate winner of the competition, as he has his face fully hidden behind a Navi's backside. I mean, he won the competition, and you don't even get to see his face. Anyway, he's in the TARDIS and Jack shows up and tries to stop him. But the Avatar R says that he's the Doctor and has regenerated into this. But then when Jack sees he's got a weapon arm, knows he's lying as the Doctor doesn't use weapons. They fight for a bit and then David Tennant shows up. Not the Doctor, but actual David Tennant. Asking why John Barrowman is still on the TARDIS set when everyone else has gone home. David then leaves, reminding Jack that it's his TARDIS, and Jack and the alien continue playing on the TARDIS set. It's... eh. Series 3 of Torchwood was a little bit different from the other two, as it was a mini-series consisting of five hour-long episodes airing over five consecutive nights on BBC One this time. And it was called Children of Earth. And I've got to be honest, I'm really not looking forward to going back and watching this one. Not because it's bad, it's amazing and one of the best pieces of TV I've ever seen. But it's not an easy watch. It's like that episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, The Body, or, or that film Buried. Brilliant stuff that I never, ever, ever want to subject myself to again in my life. But I have to. So the first thing I noticed when researching this season was it doesn't seem to have any involvement from Chris Chibnall, who was the showrunner of the previous two seasons, and instead Doctor Who showrunner Russell T Davies is having far more involvement, writing three of the five episodes. Also, if you remember the end of the episode Journey's End, it was heavily teased that Mickey and Martha were going to be joining the Torchwood team, replacing Owen and Tosh. Well, they were supposed to. But those damn scheduling conflicts got in the way, and so the scripts had to be rewritten to add new characters instead, and look, I'm just putting off actually watching it. Come on, come on, you can do this. Just start now. Day one begins in Scotland in 1965 with a bus full of school kids being driven to the middle of nowhere, so that they can get taken by this ominous light. Back in the present, and all the children are starting to act weird, just staring in silence, and whoa, is that the 12th Doctor? I mean, Cecilius. I mean, Peter Capaldi. So everywhere, all across the world, all the children have just stopped, and then they suddenly restart again. Meanwhile, Gwen heads to a pretty empty Torchwood, what with Tosh and Owen being gone now, and Yanto and Jack are off in this hospital, sneaking an alien egg out of this dead guy, and it's also confirmed that Jack and Yanto are now fully a proper couple. Back to Peter Capaldi now, and he's playing another new character, this time called John Frobisher, who's working in the government at the Home Office. Because, didn't I mention, Children of Earth is also a political thriller. And people say Doctor Who never used to be political. And John Frobisher is currently being told about all the children, who've stopped all across the world. Also, there's this new woman working here called Not Martha, sorry, no, I mean Lois Habiba, and she'll be important later. Actual Martha, by the way, is currently off on her honeymoon, which is why she's not going to be in this show. They don't give an explanation for Mickey, though, he's just not here. Meanwhile, this doctor named Not Mickey, I mean Rupesh Patanjali, follows Torchwood back to their base, just like what Gwen originally did. So Gwen goes to talk to him. He tells Gwen about some bodies going missing from the morgue, and the pair talk about the ramifications of the past few years of everything Doctor Who and aliens, and how suicide rates have increased with people losing their faiths. See, this is what an adult Doctor Who should be doing, looking at the darker ramifications of this universe, rather than just knob gags. And then all the kids stop again, and then start screaming, and admittedly, I do find this really creepy. They all then speak in unison, saying, we are Well, every kid and this one man. And then everyone restarts again. So, like a thirsty nonce, John Frobisher says, Who's got children? Find me a kid, find me a bloody kid, no. As the government goes into full-on panic mode. And then this man tells Frobisher that it's all to do with something called the 456. A signal broadcasting on a certain wavelength. And whatever it is, it's bad news. Gwen realises that all the kids in the world said we are coming in English. And also learns about that one man. So she goes to pay him a visit. Frobisher tells the Prime Minister about the 456 and says they need to wipe their history of Britain's previous involvement with the 456. But the Prime Minister is all like, nah, this ain't nothing to do with me, mate. This is your problem. Yanto goes to visit his sister and his niece in the hopes of nicking his niece to test the frequencies out on her. 
that's cold, Janto. And obviously his sister says no. Jack visits this woman and her kid, and it turns out this woman is his daughter. Wait, what? And he tries taking his grandson to experiment on him. That's cold, Jack. And obviously his daughter says no. So Jack calls up Rupesh like a thirsty nonce and says, I need a kid. Yanto comes out as gay to his sister and then the Torchwood car gets stolen. That man tells Gwen that he was one of the kids on the bus in 1965 and all of the kids were from a care home and told they were going to a new home. And then as the light took them all, he ran away. He tells Gwen his real name is Clement and that she's pregnant. Back at the home office, Frobisher orders all the files on the 456 to be wiped because he ain't about to go down for this. And then Lois sees that there are orders for three people to be killed, with one of those people being Jack. Jack meets Rupesh at the hospital and Rupesh then shoots Jack because I guess he was a government assassin all along. But then Jack's alive again, and now Jack's dead again. Now shot by Rupesh's evil agent boss, who also shoots Rupesh too. A, a lot of death in the last few seconds. But some life too, as Gwen confirms that she is in fact pregnant, and as Jack shows up and congratulates her, they discover the evil agent woman planted a bomb inside Jack. Gwen and Yanto escape, as the Torchwood base explodes, and all the kids start doing that thing again. Now saying, we are coming back. Day two and the Torchwood hub is fully destroyed. We never actually get to see it again. It's just gone. The main hub of the first two series is gone. Also, Gwen gets nearly murdered by these ambulance assassins, but manages to fight them off and drive away in said ambulance. Yanto's a lot luckier though, and just manages to run off. And Frobisher is all like, I said no witnesses, guys. Kill them already. And then that man from earlier shows up with a translation of a 456's broadcast and it turns out that it's instructions for something they want built. Gwen finds out from one of the ambulance assassins that it's the government who's after them, so she gets Reese and the pair go into hiding. Yanto's sister's house gets raided, and he also goes into hiding. Later, Frobisher tells the Prime Minister that the plans to build whatever it is the 4561 are already underway, and the Prime Minister reiterates that Frobisher will be the one to fall when this all goes tits up. Also, Jack is found in the wreckage, well, his arm is, and a bit of his shoulder, and his head. But Jack is just too stubborn to let that stop him, and so starts growing back. Well, pretty slowly. Yanto gets a message to his sister asking to meet her, and Gwen and Reese hide in the back of this potato lorry, which is heading to London, which is the perfect time for her to tell Reese that she's pregnant. Yanto meets his sister at a park, just in time to see all these kids stopping again, now saying, we are coming tomorrow. Yanto's sister gives him a laptop and her car, and he goes after the people who took Jack. Gwen tries phoning Frobisher, but only succeeds in getting through to Lois, who's starting to get a little suspicious that the government might not be very nice. So she meets up with Gwen and tells her that Frobisher is the one who tried to kill them, about the machine they're building in MI5, and where Jack is being held. Meanwhile, Jack is now fully back, so that woman fills up his cell with cement. Gwen and Reese then show up pretending to be Undertakers, here to collect Rupesh's body. Gwen knocks out this guy and then takes out all the cameras, but waits until she's already been seen by the cameras to do so. Gwen manages to find Jack's cell, but it's just a load of concrete, and then all the assassins show up. But then Yanto also shows up and rips the cell from the wall. So everyone escapes and they drop the cell into this quarry, breaking it open and freeing Jack. But more importantly, that thing Frobisher has been building is finally ready, and it's this room. A room containing the correct atmosphere of gases to allow the 456 to show up in person tomorrow. Day 3 and Torchwood are camping out in this old factory as the world waits with bated breath as today's the day. The Prime Minister announces that the schools are closed today and they're doing all that they can. And Torchwood are just like, eh, we're criminals anyway, let's just go on the rob. Stealing people's credit cards and even this man's car. Jack's daughter phones the police trying to find out where Jack is and now the evil agents come after her too. Back at New Torchwood, Gwen comes up with the idea of giving those contact lenses that Martha wore last season to Lois so that they can see what's happening in the government. Yanto learns that Clement has been arrested, so Gwen is tasked with finding him. Then when Yanto starts telling Jack about Clement's history at the orphanage, Jack makes this face and demands to see the other people who were killed the same day he was. And then Jack remembers it all and runs off. Gwen phones Andy, her old police officer friend, and asks him to release Clement for her. Jack's daughter's house does get raided, and she and her son get captured by that assassin woman. And now all the kids are pointing, 
Specifically, they're all pointing towards London, at Thames House, where the 456 teleport down into their special little room. And they begin talking to Frobisher, and it's a pretty creepy scene as we don't properly see the 456 through all this fog, but that creepiness is let down by the fact it keeps vomiting against the glass with these cartoony sound effects. Just undermines it a bit, you know? Frobisher asks what the 456 want, and it tells him that it wants to speak to the world and Frobisher offers to bring elected ambassadors to speak to the 456 on the condition that the 456 doesn't mention the previous encounter that Britain had with them. And the 456 does agree to these conditions. The American army and unit both then have a meeting with the Prime Minister complaining that they weren't told the 456 would be coming to the UK and that the government seemingly is working with them. So the Prime Minister invites them and all world leaders to meet the 456 to which they all refuse. So the Prime Minister says, look, I've got this moron called John Frobisher and he's already talking to them. Let's just let him keep speaking to them. And also, by the way, he's expendable. Jesus, what does the Prime Minister have against Frobisher? So it seems that Frobisher is now the Earth's ambassador. Meanwhile, Jack breaks into Frobisher's house and steals his wife's phone and Clement begins remembering more about that day when all the kids were taken. He also starts remembering that there was a man there too. Uh-oh, I'm starting to see where this is going. Jack calls Frobisher up and asks if the aliens from 1965 have come back, to which Frobisher says yes. Jack then demands to speak to the 456, and Frobisher tells Jack that he has his daughter and his grandson and to stay out of this. Lois then pops in her contact lenses, and the first official meeting with the 456 begins. So first things first, Frobisher asks the 456 to stop using kids to communicate, to which the 456 agrees. An American ambassador makes Frobisher ask why the 456 chose Britain, and it keeps its word and lies, saying, no reason, we just like fish and chips and a royal family and that, don't worry about it. Oh, and then the 456 then asks for a gift of children, specifically 10% of Earth's children. Back at Torchwood, Jack shows up and Clement loses it, recognising him as the man who took the children to the 456 in 1965. And Jack does admit that he was in fact the one who gave the 456 12 children as a gift. Day 4 starts by showing us a bit more of 1965, in which we learn that there's a virus that's beginning to spread across the world and the 456 are offering Earth the cure, in exchange for 12 children. So Jack was the one tasked with giving the kids to them. Well, all except for Clement. And back in the present, Clement shoots Jack for what he did. Meanwhile, at Thames House, Frobisher asks what the 456 plan on doing with all these children, so it invites them to bring a camera into the tank to find out. And here we get our best look at the 456, which still isn't great. But what we do get to see is this. One of the kids from 1965, hooked up to the 456. And then the 456 start broadcasting Frobisher's voice saying to keep their previous encounter off the record. Which, as you can imagine, winds up the Americans no end. The 456 say that the children don't feel pain and live well beyond their years. Then it gives a day for Earth to select its 10% and if it doesn't, they'll wipe out all of humanity. So yeah, America is all like, Prime Minister, you lied to us and hid the fact that you dealt with the 456 before. And then Jack calls Frobisher again threatening to tell the world what's really going on. Frobisher is then called into a meeting with the Prime Minister and some others, where the Prime Minister says they're going to haggle with the 456 and try to make a deal, starting off with an offer of 6,700 kids, with 62 of them being asylum seekers in the UK. All the doctor's black, all the doctor's a woman, all oh, this guy's a bit like Donald Trump, Doctor Who's too political now. The government tried to give asylum seekers to the aliens. Okay, you don't get more political than that. Anyway, the 456 rejects this offer, and then all the children across the UK start repeating 325000, which is equal to 10% of the number of kids there, with each country reading out their own number. Also, there's a little detail they've added where in the government meetings, they refer to children as units, trying to dehumanise them, which, yeah, just makes these scenes feel even more troubling. And then this man, played by Nicholas Briggs, who's the voice of the Daleks and Cybermen, tries arguing that the world is becoming overpopulated and maybe they could spin this as a good thing? Well, of course he's in favour of this, the Dalek bastard. So the next question is how do the government select which children should be selected? With suggestions including randomisation, 
alphabetically every second born per family and whole schools. But the most important thing is obviously that the people deciding are exempt from losing their kids and grandkids and nieces and nephews. And they finally decide to select the worst performing 10% of school kids. Luckily, Torchwood have this whole meeting recorded and can use the footage as leverage. Yanto calls his sister to tell her not to let her kids out of her sight and says the same to all the agents who bugged the phone lines. Frobisher comes up with the idea of telling parents that they're sending their children to be inoculated to stop them from speaking in unison and then when the kids are taken, they can all simply feign ignorance and blame the aliens. This is grim. Lois finally puts a stop to all this and announces to everyone that all of this has been recorded and unless they all do exactly as Torchwood says, all this footage will be released to the public. And oh, that is just one hell of a cathartic moment. Meanwhile, Assassin Lady shows up at the new Torchwood base and Gwen is like, yeah, we've been expecting you. Reese is somewhere ready to send all the videos unless you do as I say. So with free range do whatever they want, Jack and Yanto pay the 456 a visit and tell it that they ain't getting one single child and declares war on the 456. So the 456 responds by sealing the doors and filling the building with a deadly virus. Yanto and Jack try shooting at it, but it doesn't do any good and the virus starts killing everyone, including Yanto. The 456 also transmit a signal that kills Clement and back at Tem's house everyone dies. Yanto tells Jack that he loves him and then passes away asking Jack not to forget him with his final words. And the episode ends with the government agreeing to give the 456 all the kids that they want. Day 5 starts by answering a question you might understandably have watching this miniseries, which is, why isn't the doctor fixing this? Over footage of children being taken from their houses by the government, Gwen says that she believes Sometimes the doctor must look at this planet and turn away in shame. So the government start enacting their plan, with the Prime Minister announcing the inoculations. They've selected 2,600 primary schools and have the army ready to transport them and any soldier who's unwilling to cooperate will have their children taken too. Unit asks the 456 what the children are being used for and the 456 replies that they use the children to get high. You're shooting up on children. Our children. Gwen and Jack go to meet Frobisher and tell him that they're still able to release the footage. But Frobisher just doesn't care. The world's about to go to hell. All they'd be doing is speeding up the process. And Jack actually agrees. So Gwen calls Reese to tell him that Ianto is now dead and it's all over. Gwen and Reese board a helicopter and head home and Jack and Lois get locked up. Meanwhile, Assassin Woman, who's no longer evil it seems, releases Jack's daughter and grandson and tells her what's going on. The Prime Minister asks to see Frobisher privately and this is the second hardest scene to watch in all of the Russell T Davis era for me. The Prime Minister tells him that Frobisher's children will be taken for the inoculations with it being broadcast on TV as a PR stunt. And then Frobisher's children will be part of the 10%. So the government are seen as victims in all of this and just look at how the Prime Minister doesn't make eye contact. Ugh, it's just so horrible. Frobisher says if they do that then he'll tell everyone the truth and the Prime Minister just says Your daughters would know where they're going. Best not. My God, that is cold. Now, you know how a moment ago I said that that was the second hardest scene to watch in all of the Rusty Davis era? Well, it's then followed by the first. As John Frobisher goes to his house, hugs his kids and his wife, and tells them to go upstairs. He then takes out a gun, take note of his hand trembling here, and then he goes upstairs, closes the door, and we hear four gunshots. People say Rose saying goodbye to the doctor was sad, those people know nothing. Now that that's thankfully over with, we can get back to something a bit more cheery. That being Gwen and Andy telling Yanto's sister that her brother's now dead, and all the kids start getting taken. But only around 60% of the kids have even shown up to school, so the army now have to start taking them from their homes. Jack's daughter tells that assassin woman that if she's really trying to protect the world, then she needs Jack. So they bust him out of prison, and Jack gets to work trying to find out a way to fight back. Gwen manages to sneak a load of kids into this old barn to hide as everything kicks off. Jack realises that Clement died because he was linked to the 456, as are all the kids, meaning he can transmit a signal back to fight the 456, but he'd need to use a child to do it, and it would kill the child. So they take Jack's grandson, 
and use him to transmit a signal through every child, which does indeed kill the 456, but also kills Jack's grandson. In the aftermath, the Prime Minister says, ah, we can all just blame the Americans for everything that happened, but Frobisher's secretary is wearing the contact lenses and is filming this too. So up yours, Prime Minister. We then cut to a little while later with a heavily pregnant Gwen, and Jack tells her goodbye. As now too filled up with guilt, he's decided to leave Earth. Gwen gives Jack his vortex manipulator, which was recovered from the Torchwood hub wreckage, and Jack leaves, seemingly forever. If you were a fan of Doctor Who during the mid-2000s in the UK, then you probably visited the Doctor Exhibition, which first opened in Cardiff in 2005 and lasted until 2011, before being replaced by the Doctor Experience, which had some more interactive elements and a virtual adventure featuring the Doctor. The Doctor Exhibition was fantastic because it featured loads and loads of props from the actual show. Like you could go in there and see an actual Dalek that was on screen or an actual Cyberman from the show. It had all the costumes, it had all the props, it had the TARDIS set. That's right, you could really walk on the actual real life TARDIS. They also toured it throughout the UK with me first visiting it in Earl's Court in London in 2008. And it had a good reason for you to keep going back there, as every year it would update it so that it would have all the new stuff from the newest episodes of the show. It was great and I wish they'd bring it back. On to series 3 now, the Sarah Jane Adventures, kicking off with Fugitive of the Jadoon, which starts off with a Jadoon ship crashing to Earth. So everyone goes to check it out, and they soon find a Jadoon chasing down a prisoner. But the prisoner escapes, beating up the Jadoon, and Jadoon blood is yellow, who knew? So our heroes team up with the Jadoon to catch the prisoner, called Andravax, who was arrested for destroying 12 planets. Yeah, that'll do it. Sarah Jane and Clyde find the Andravax hiding inside this little girl, and then it jumps inside Sarah Jane instead. Evil Sarah Jane then does some evil stuff with Mr. Smith, before then going to this lab where they're working on nanotechnology. The Jadoon steals a police car. Attention. Noise exceeds permitted levels. Turn down. And they head to Sarah Jane's house to find Mr. Smith about to self-destruct. But Luke manages to talk him out of it. And then they head after Sarah Jane. Evil Sarah Jane wants to use all these nanoforms to destroy the world and build a spaceship. And oh, also Rani's parents are here. It's not important why. But what is important is more Jadoon start showing up. Again, never taking off their helmets. They definitely only had one proper Jadoon prosthetic. Luke, Clyde and Rani lock the Jadoon in a lab so that they can confront evil Sarah Jane alone without the Jadoon going all killy. Not that it works, of course, and evil Sarah Jane just takes Luke to the new spaceship. All the Jadoon show up, and once more Luke hacks into a computer and fixes everything, stopping the nanoforms and saving the world. It seems like so many of these Sarah Jane Adventures episodes just ends with Luke fixing everything by hacking into a computer. For locking him up, the Jadoon captain sentences Rani and Clyde to being confined to Earth, basically space grounding them. And Rani's parents try telling everyone they've seen aliens, but everyone just gaslights them. Next up we have the Mad Woman in the Attic, and this one's starting off weird. The year is 2059, and this kid finds this old woman in Sarah Jane's attic, and she tells him that her name is Rani. She tells the kid about the adventure she went on, and we also get to see some flashbacks of adventures she wasn't even around for. Come on, Rani, you never met the Slovene. Rani then goes on to tell the story of when she visited the place she used to live to meet an old friend. He tells her about this theme park where kids are going missing and an apparent demon is lurking about. So Rani sneaks in and finds the demon, which is this psychic alien girl called Eve. She explains that there was a war and her planet was exterminated. Well... I wonder what war that could have been. And she was evacuated to Earth. And now she lives in this old theme park with this man and mind controls all the people to infinitely ride these rides. Sarah Jane and the gang then follow Rani here and they soon meet the man and this mirror face. Eve then exploits Rani's insecurities of not being as good as Maria was and Rani angrily wishes that they'd all just leave her alone and then Eve shows Rani, Sarah Jane and Luke their futures and past. And here we get to see some nice clips from Sarah Jane's episodes of Doctor Who. Luke speaks to Rani's friend who reveals that he asked her to come here after Eve read his mind and found out about Rani and her knowledge of alien life. Eve then goes all controlling, making all these rides speed up and possesses Rani except she can't control her powers and starts to die. 
So everyone takes her to her spaceship and it turns out the AI of the ship is what was in that mirror face thing. The AI then helps heal Eve and puts everything right. Also, this ship runs on black holes and needs one to power it, which is pretty lucky actually, because Sarah Jane can call K9 so the ship can absorb the black hole and K9 gets to come home. I guess they managed to work out all those rights issues then. Eve, the old man and Rani's friend all then go off to space together, but not before granting Rani's wish to make Sarah Jane, Luke and Clyde all leave her alone by killing them. Back in the future, it's revealed that this kid is the son of Eve and Rani's friend, and he agrees to change time and bring Sarah Jane, Luke and Clyde back. I mean, I can see what they were going for in this episode, and it wasn't bad per se, but it was extremely muddled with too much going on. Like, I highly doubt that you followed it from my summary. Hell, I didn't even follow it, and I watched the episode. Too much was thrown at the wall, and I think it really should have just focused more on Rani. The Wedding of Sarah Jane Smith is the third Sarah Jane story with Sarah Jane in the name, and if you watched the show when it came out, it's probably the episode you remember most. But we'll get to the reason why in just a moment. So, in this episode, Sarah Jane keeps sneaking off, and Luke, Rani, and Clyde decide to follow her, and find out that she's been dating a man named Peter. Everyone shows up the next day to meet him, and he's normal, with not a Slovene zip in sight. Everything gets a bit chaotic as Sarah Jane receives this package containing an alien and K9 then shows up and Sarah Jane has to try and pretend that she's normal. So Sarah Jane and Luke go to dinner with Peter and Rani and Clyde go to Peter's house to check out this guy and find the house empty. Okay, so maybe not totally normal then. Peter asks Sarah Jane to marry him, to which she says yes, and then gives her this ring that starts glowing ominously and then, yes, as always, it starts possessing her causing her to give K-9 away to Clyde, shut down Mr. Smith, and straight up just quit fighting aliens altogether. A little while later at the wedding, Clyde is still suspicious that something's wrong. And then holy shit, look who shows up. But not just the Doctor, oh no, the Trickster's here as well, and takes Sarah Jane away. And then everyone else disappears too, all apart from Luke, Clyde, Rani, the Doctor, and K-9. As it turns out, the Trickster's trapped them in a single second of time, which also means the TARDIS can't materialise here properly. Sarah Jane wakes up, trapped in a different second, and realises the ring has been controlling her this whole time, so tears it off her finger and goes to search for the Doctor. But everywhere she runs brings her back to Peter. He explains to her that a few months ago he fell down the stairs, but then the Trickster came to him, offering to save his life. So Sarah Jane explains to him that the Trickster used him to get to her, and then she asks the Trickster exactly what it is that it wants this time. The trickster shows her a future where she's happily married and no longer saves the world and tells her that unless she gets married, her and everyone else will remain trapped forever. So basically it just wants the world to end again. The doctor finally explains what the hell the trickster even is. I've known the legends of the Panthers since I was a little boy. I fought your shadows and your changelings. I never thought we'd actually meet. The pair talk to each other for a bit and just watching any scene with David Tennant in it is just the best. He just elevates any scene that he's in. But then the TARDIS appears long enough for the Doctor to get inside, and he's gone again. Ugh, oh well. But Clyde also touched the TARDIS and got blasted full of Artron energy, which he can then use to fight the Trickster. Clyde summons the Trickster, offering to serve it, but then zaps it instead. And whoa look, the Doctor's back! He finds Sarah Jane and tells her that in order to beat the Trickster, Peter has to die. So Peter bravely breaks the deal with the trickster and dies. And everyone returns home and Sarah Jane is now super depressed. But hey, the doctor's back again and shows all the kids around the TARDIS. It really is, isn't it? It's bigger on the inside. They ask for a trip in the TARDIS, but Sarah Jane reminds them that they're still all grounded by the Jadoon, and so they all say their goodbyes. This episode is obviously great purely because David Tennant's in it. It makes it feel less like an episode of the Sarah Jane Adventures and more like an episode of Doctor Who, which obviously is just better. In the Eternity Trap, Sarah Jane and the gang are investigating a supposedly haunted manor with these two scientists, all except for Luke, who's just not in this episode as the actor Tommy Knight was busy doing his GCSE exams. Some spooky stuff happens, the sound of bells, a little girl crying, and a sighting of this fella, an evil magician. 
The professor, called Professor Rivers, no relation, gets taken by the magician, and Rani and Clyde find a secret passageway where they meet the magician. Then another ghost shows up who fights the magician, and there's even a little kid ghost too. Turns out the sword man is searching for his children, who were trapped in a different frequency from him, and then a load more ghosts show up, except none of them are even really ghosts. They're people trapped between dimensions, all controlled by this machine that the magician, who's really an alien, obviously, built to return home. Sarah Jane does some convoluted nonsense to kill the magician, but that also then kills all the trapped people too. This episode sucked. So much of the runtime was just, oh look, things are moving on their own, so there was barely any room for an actual plot. I didn't like this one, moving on. Mona Lisa's revenge has Clyde winning an art competition, allowing his class to go to a gallery to see the Mona Lisa. Except the Mona Lisa is alive and attacks this woman, trapping her in a painting as she is now free. Our heroes sneak around the art gallery to find out what's going on as the police show up, and find that Clyde's painting, yes, this is what won the competition, is missing a gun. And that's because the Mona Lisa has it. And, um, this is how the Mona Lisa is portrayed. I am the Mona Lisa. But then Leo was a bit of a ledge, even back then. I don't know if it was the writer's decision to have her speak like that, or the director's, or the actor's, but it was the wrong decision. Because that is horrible. The Mona Lisa starts trapping everyone in the paintings, even Sarah Jane, who's just shown up. And the Mona Lisa wants to free her brother, who lives in this other painting called The Abomination. But Luke finds the key to free the painting first, and the curator of the museum smashes it. The Mona Lisa then makes Clyde draw another, which she brings to life to free the Abomination. But in doing so, she also accidentally brings a drawing of K-9 to life, who then kills the Abomination, and all the paintings return as they were. Another bad episode. The Gift is the series 3 finale, and starts with business as usual, as Sarah Jane and the gang are chasing down a couple Slovene who want to crush the Earth into a giant diamond. But wait, Sarah Jane can't just turn off their machine with her sonic lipstick, and it looks like the Slovene might actually win this time. Luckily a pair of Blatherines show up, also from the planet Raxacoricophalopatorius, but they're a very slightly different colour. They capture the Slovene, stop the machine, and say that they're big fans of Sarah Jane. To thank the Blatherine for their help, Clyde cooks them dinner, and the Blatherine offer a gift of ragweed, a food source that can be grown in any climate. They ask Sarah Jane to use the plant to end world hunger, and Sarah Jane doesn't know whether or not to trust them, but Rani says not to judge a planet by some bad people. And you know what? I hope these Blatherine don't turn out to be bad. I think this could be a really good thought-provoking story about our prejudices, and the plant's already doing evil stuff, isn't it? The plant spreads its spores, spreading everywhere and infecting Luke, meaning he has to stay home from school and miss a test. A test Clyde is using K9 to cheat at. Mr. Smith confirms that the rackweed will put Luke into an indefinite coma in only a few hours. And then everyone gets infected, end of the world, yada yada yada. Sarah Jane tracks the blatherine to Antarctica and teleports there with a water pistol full of vinegar. But then she gets quickly overpowered and locked up. The Blatherine reveal that Rackweed is highly addictive and they're using the Earth to farm it. And then Sarah Jane manages to escape and teleport home. Meanwhile, Clyde, Rani and K9 find a sound frequency that kills the Rackweed and get Mr. Smith to transmit it through every speaker, which fixes everything. The Blatherine then teleport into the attic ready to kill, but Mr. Smith transmits the sound again, making all the Rackweed in their stomach die, causing the Blatherine to fart splode. Everyone has a picnic, and that's it for another series of the Sarah Jane Adventures. I think this might be the weakest series so far, only really saved by the one good episode, and that was just because David Tennant was in it. This episode just had so many forgettable episodes that I just didn't enjoy. As other shows like Torch would have just been getting better over time, this just seems to have been getting worse. K9 was another Doctor Who spin-off, sort of, as it wasn't produced by the BBC. The Daleks and K9 are both not technically owned by the BBC, and are instead licensed out by the Terry Nation estate and Bob Baker respectively. This is why when Doctor originally relaunched in 2005, they were unsure for the longest time whether they'd even be able to secure the rights to the Daleks. And it's also heavily rumoured that when they did finally reach an agreement, it included a stipulation that the Daleks had to be used at least once every single year. 
So yeah, that's the reason why the Daleks show up so much. But as for Bob Baker owning the rights to K9, that's only half true. As whilst yes, he does own the rights to the character of K9, the BBC owns the rights to the design of the character. So when Bob Baker pitched his idea for a spin-off called K9 the Series, or K9 Adventures, or just simply K9, it had to include a radically different design. The show was originally picked up by Jetix in 2006 for a 26 episode season. Apparently Jetix then became Disney XD, I never knew that. Is that right, Disney bought Jetix or was Jetix always owned by Disney? Either way, the show was picked up and filmed in Australia. And as this show had no input from the BBC, it was legally not allowed to have any connection to Doctor Who. So no cameos, no references, no mention of the Doctor whatsoever. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, I really don't want to watch all 26 episodes of this show. However, according to Wikipedia, it appears that only the pilot episode actually aired during the Russell T Davis era of Doctor Who, so I suppose I can just watch that one episode? The show is set in the year 2050, and you can tell by all the floating billboards and robots hunting down the two main characters, Starkey and Georgie. And they hide in this sci-fi lab place where they find this scientist trying to bring back his dead family from the past. And that is a lot going on in the first two minutes of this show. Starkey then, the boy one, accidentally unplugs the machine, which makes some aliens appear instead. And just what is going on here? Are they at a different frame rate or something? Because the way these aliens move really freaks me out. Like, I didn't know if the video I was watching was corrupted or something, but no, this is just a stylistic choice. Oh, and then K9 appears, looking like his old self, but I literally just explained that the BBC owns the rights to this design, so I don't know how they're getting away with this. On top of that, he even sounds like his old self, as John Neeson, the guy who's been voicing K9 since 1977, is providing K9's voice here too. K9 struggles to fight off all these aliens, so he resorts to self-destructing. Well, so much for K9 then, I guess. But no, wait, this egg from K9 starts floating around and makes a new K9? Sure, whatever. Then the professor's assistant calls the police on that Starkey kid, and he gets arrested again. K9 tells the professor that because those Ninja Turtle looking aliens spat on him, they marked him for death. So they'll be coming after him again. Meanwhile, Starkey is here in sci-fi jail, and Georgie virtually hacks in to tell him that aliens are being all racially profiled and arrested for being aliens, and then those turtles break in. And again, they're just not nice to look at. K9 reveals that he only retains fragments from his past, which is handy as he won't remember the Doctor, or anything else that could get them in legal trouble. And the Professor explains that he's rebuilding a time machine from a crashed alien ship for the government. Starkey gets back to the lab, and then this woman from the government shows up looking for Starkey and K9. And she tells the professor that if he won't bring them in, then he'll lose funding for the time machine. Georgie shows up again, and K9 then gives Starkey a dog whistle, which can be used to summon him, and then the episode just sort of ends. That wasn't good. The story wasn't really anything, and didn't give me enough to care to find out what happens next. But the worst part about it was the acting, and not just from the kids, but everyone sounds like they've been dubbed over. I mean, they haven't, their voices just don't match their faces, it's difficult to explain. Like, the acting they're doing with their face just doesn't match what they're saying. But I tell you what, it really makes me appreciate the actors in the Sarah Jane Adventures even more. That's how you do a Doctor Who spin-off for kids correctly. I don't know, maybe the show gets better, maybe I haven't given it enough of a chance, but for now, let's move on. On the 15th of November, only seven months after the first special, they really didn't space these out well, did they? Well, we finally got our second special, called The Waters of Mars, in which this team are working at Bowie Base 1, a tiny colony on Mars, the very first colony on Mars. And then the Doctor turns up, gets arrested by this robot, and brought back to the base, where he's interrogated by Captain Adelaide Brooke and the rest of her team. Meanwhile, these two are working in the Mars Gardens, and after being exposed to some water, this guy starts turning into a water monster. Meanwhile, the Doctor learns that this is the first colony of people to reach Mars, and of course he knows all about them. But he also knows that they're all about to die mysteriously, and with this being such a defining moment in history and a fixed point in time, the Doctor has no other option than to leave and let events play out. But after not hearing any response from the gardeners, Adelaide makes the Doctor come with her to check it out. They soon find one of the gardeners and put her in isolation. 
They then find the other one and he's all watery and then he possesses another crew member using his evil dribbly water powers. It is impressive as these actors actually had tiny little hose pipes feeding into their mouths so that water would just pour through it and pour out and can you imagine just how uncomfortable that would be? Like being constantly waterboarded, that sounds horrible. The Doctor and Adelaide get chased down by the growing water army but use the robot to get back to the control centre just in time. They try speaking to one of the water people and learn that it quite likes the look of Earth, what with all the blue bits and that. And all of this seems to be the result of some kind of virus in the water supply, so Adelaide enacts Action 1, deciding they all need to evacuate the planet. And as all this is going on, the Doctor just stands there, knowing he should leave, and he's even told he can leave, but he doesn't. Instead, he warns Adelaide that any one of them could be infected and they can't risk taking whatever it is back to Earth. So Adelaide goes to check water supply to find whatever this thing is and the Doctor still doesn't leave. No, he follows her. The Doctor explains to Adelaide that all of this is a fixed point in time and none of it can be changed. They talk about how during the end of Series 4, Adelaide was still a child and a Dalek found her. But even it knew not to mess with her and risk rupturing time. The Doctor goes on to explain that Adelaide's life inspires her granddaughter to pilot the first light speed ship in 30 years time. So basically Adelaide's life and death is super duper important and the Doctor needs to stop fucking with it. Oh, and we also learn that those filters only recently broke, so no one else has been exposed, which means that they can resume their evacuation. And now Adelaide straight up tells the Doctor he needs to leave, which he eventually does. But before he does, Adelaide asks what happens to them, and the Doctor tells her, saying that she activates the self-destruct, destroying the base and killing everyone. She begs for him to help, but he can't, and so he does leave, but still listens on the comms, to the flood now invading the base and infecting more people. And this is a very affecting scene. Like, you can really feel the inner turmoil that the Doctor's going through right now. Well, the Doctor finally snaps when the rocket is destroyed, and so Murray Gold's hype music starts playing, and the Doctor returns, and immediately starts fixing things, electrocuting the flood, and trying to steam the rest. Adelaide protests, but the Doctor's all, listen, the Time Lords are dead, so I'm in charge of time now. But time starts fighting back and the Doctor's helmet gets destroyed. So he uses the robot and drives it to the TARDIS, flying it back to the base as Adelaide activates the self-destruct. Having now absolutely wrecked the laws of time, the Doctor returns the three surviving crew members to Earth. And all three of them are rightly terrified, having basically just met God. And we even get a little... It's... bigger. I, I mean, it's bigger on the inside. The Doctor's pretty arrogant here, boasting that he's now in control of everything, having completed his arc of slowly becoming an all-powerful god, and he's now calling himself the Time Lord Victorious. He tells Adelaide to go and inspire her daughter in person, and she says, nah, this is wrong, mate, and so Adelaide goes home and shoots herself. And with that, the Doctor realises that maybe he went a little bit too far, and the episode ends with an ood showing up and just looking at the Doctor like a disappointed mum. This was a great episode and definitely the best of all the specials. The reason for that is because it really delved into the Doctor's character. Rather than just giving a basic plot like the last two did where the Doctor fights a villain, the Doctor's more so fighting himself here, which is a really interesting take on a story. Unfortunately, as Russell T Davis' era was drawing to a close, there wasn't really much room to fully explore the whole Time Lord Victorious idea. At least not until many years later, when there was a whole multimedia experience created for it. Telling one big story involving comics, novels, audio dramas, figures, escape rooms, video games, and it was... it was alright. It wasn't amazing, but I enjoyed it. There was this whole complicated route that you could go down to explore all the different elements of Time Lord Victorious in order. And the whole thing basically tells a story of the Doctor going back to the beginning of the universe and fighting Daleks and vampires and Time Lords. And there's even an Ood assassin named Brian. And yeah, it's fine. Although, the fact I can't seem to remember too much about it probably isn't a great sign of its quality. I remember it doesn't just feature the 10th Doctor vote, it's got the 13th, the 8th, the 9th, the 4th. They all show up at different points and that was kind of a problem with it. There were so many random bits to it and it released all fragmented. I don't know, if you're interested in the Time Lord Victorious idea, then by all means check it out. You might really like it. Now, 
If you thought the Infinite Quest looked awful with its wonky 2D animation, then do I have a treat for you. As airing nightly in November in 6 minute chunks via the red button, we got a wonky 3D adventure called Dreamland, and this one looks properly bad. This looks like a bad licensed PS2 game cutscene. It's like trying to be cel shaded, but it's just not doing it properly. So this one is set in New Mexico in the 50s, where the Doctor meets Cassie and Jimmy in this diner. Cassie incidentally is played by the Doctor's daughter slash wife Georgia Moffat. The Doctor then finds this alien artifact just lying around in this diner, so he activates it, which causes a man in black to show up to try and take it. They all escape, and immediately run into an alien called a Viperox, and the army, who then bring them all to Area 51, to be pumped full of amnesia gas. The Doctor breaks out thanks to a trick he learnt off Houdini, and does that work as an excuse? So what, the Doctor can just get out of all handcuffs now, can he? Perhaps he wanted to learn after Riversong locked him up in the library. Well, they all manage to escape through a ventilation shaft, and then find another alien. But the classic alien design this time. They're all captured again, but then escape in a spaceship, before the Doctor then crashes it into the desert. They all hide out in this abandoned house, and another Viperox shows up and takes Jimmy. The Doctor and Cassie follow, save him, see the Queen, and then there's another escape scene. Is this episode just going to consist of the Doctor running away from things? Some more Men in Black show up, wanting that device thing from earlier, also they're robots. Then Jimmy's granddad, called Night Eagle, shows up and shoots them with arrows. And don't worry, I'm watching the entire thing, and even I don't know what's going on. Night Eagle takes them to see another little grey alien who wants to find his wife, which is the one back at Area 51. And also we learn that his people are at war with the Viperox. They all get captured by the army, again, and we learn that the Viperox are working with the army and the men in black to create a weapon to fight the Russians using that alien device. What is happening right now? It's okay, it will be over soon. The Doctor convinces the Colonel that the Viperox can't be trusted, and then the Viperox declare war with Earth. Those two little grey aliens reunite, but one of them is dying and needs something from its ship to help heal it, so the Doctor and the alien go to this storage place to go get it. On their way back to the base they find all the Viperox attacking it, but then Jimmy and Cassie show up with the TARDIS, and the Doctor drives it back to the base. The other grey alien gets healed, and then uses that artifact device thing to transmit a signal that the Viprax don't like, so they all leave. That was the busiest series of random things happening that I've ever seen. My point being, that was bad. Really bad, and I didn't like it. Now, raise your hand if you know the show Nevermind the Buzzcocks. No? Well, it's a music-based quiz on the BBC, and there was a Doctor Who special with David Tennant, Bernard Cribbins, and Catherine Tate. And this is legitimately hilarious. Bernard Cribbins is always a treat. Watching this, you realise just how much of a comic genius Bernard Cribbins was. His wit and timing in this is just razor sharp. Kaylee's favourite bra fetched a staggering £6,000 on eBay. You want to see it? Well, I have... <laughs> Catherine Tate's lack of Doctor Who knowledge is very, very funny, and it's where this classic clip came from. Matt Bellamy has been plagued recently by a flurry of letters from fans claiming they would commit suicide unless he sleeps with them. Barrel man! <laughs> I do recommend looking for this one because it genuinely is a really good time. So here we are, finally at the end of the first era of the revived series of Doctor Who. On Christmas Day 2009, we got The End of Time Part 1, and it's fair to say, expectations were impossible to meet. And for Christmas that year, we even got a new Doctor Who ident, which was really cool. Apparently Russell T Davis saw that Wallace and Gromit got one the year before and were like, why doesn't Doctor Who get one? Doctor Who better get one. So the episode begins with a narrator saying that everyone started having bad dreams of what was to come, mostly of the master laughing, and then we get to see Wilf wandering into a church and seeing a little TARDIS in the stained glass. A woman appears and tells him about the legend of the Doctor and the Blue Box and how he just might be coming back before then vanishing. Meanwhile, the Doctor heads to the planet of the Ood to find out exactly how his song is going to end. 
Remember how they teased that the last time he was here? Well, the Ood tell the Doctor that they've also been having bad dreams about something returning. The Doctor is shown a vision of the Master, Wilf, these people, and then the Master's wife, Lucy Saxon. We also learn that the Master's ring was picked up after his death. Remember, all the way back in The Last of the Time Lords? And the Ood give one final warning, saying that the end of time is coming. And that's kind of a lot of what this episode is. It's just ominous teasing of stuff that's going to happen, instead of actually just having exciting stuff happen. Anyway, there's this cult and it's enacting a ceremony using Lucy and the ring to revive the master, except Lucy also planned for this eventuality, so throws a potion at him which damages the master and burns the place to the ground. But on a bit of a lighter note, Wilf has recruited this group of OAPs to search for the Doctor. Oh, and it turns out that Lucy's potion didn't work and the Master isn't dead, he's just got bleached hair now. And he's also going extra mad and all skeletal and flying and eating people, which I'm guessing is the result of Lucy's potion, but I'd argue that potion only really made him stronger. And then the Doctor finds him. Randomly. But it doesn't amount to much as the Master just screams at him and flies away. And then Wilf finds the Doctor, also pretty randomly. One of Wilf's friends sexually assaults the Doctor, and then the Doctor and Wilf head to a cafe to chat for a bit. And the scenes with David Tennant and Bernard Cribbins are the best bits of the end of time. Just a big old load of sincerity and chemistry and great acting between the pair. The Doctor explains to Wilf that he was told he'll knock four times and then he'll die, and he's really scared of regenerating this time, likening it to dying. Also, it turns out Wilf brought the Doctor to this cafe, as he knew Donna was going to be there, and asks the Doctor to stop messing about and just fix her. But he obviously can't. Oh, and Donna's engaged now. The Doctor goes to visit the Master again, and he now has electricity powers too? Just what was in that potion? So he shoots the Doctor with all his zap powers. The Doctor asks for the Master's help to stop whatever is returning, as it's apparently not him, and to help stop the end of time. And the Master talks to the Doctor about the drumming in his head and how it's getting louder. And then the Doctor actually hears the drumming. Meaning that the sound was more than just the Master's madness. Before they can finish their chat, the Master is kidnapped and the Doctor gets knocked out. It's now Christmas morning and Donna's got Wilf this mysterious book for Christmas, written by a man named Joshua Naismith, the guy from the Ood Vision and also the person who kidnapped the Master. Wilf watches the Queen's speech on TV, except that woman shows up again, says some more vaguely ominous stuff, tells him to go get his gun, and then disappears again. So Wilf goes under his bed and grabs his World War II pistol, and finds the Doctor waiting outside his house. Wilf shows the Doctor the book, and the Doctor recognises Naismith from the vision, so the pair go to find him in the TARDIS. And this is so unfair, the Doctor doesn't even give Wilf the chance to say it. Like so Naismith has this sci-fi gate and these two people working for him are secretly aliens with plans on taking the gate back as it belongs to them. The point of this gate is that it can heal people and with the Master's help it should be able to make people immortal. Except the Master's tampered with it and made it so that it will send out his genetic template to every human on Earth. The Doctor reaches him just in time to watch the Master activate the gate and turn everyone on Earth into him. Everyone except Wilf who was protected in a radiation chamber. Oh, and Donna's starting to remember everything. Oh, and remember that narrator I mentioned at the beginning? Well, that was actually Timothy Dalton playing Rassilon, president of the Time Lords, who announces that the Time Lords are returning. So yeah, basically this whole episode just acts as kind of a prologue to this, as I would say only about 10 minutes of actual plot happened in this episode. And as much as I think this is a pretty mere episode, I can't deny that that cliffhanger is pretty damn cool. After all these years of teases, the Time Lords are actually coming back. And one week later on New Year's Day 2010, we got The End of Time Part 2, which starts us off on Gallifrey during the final days of a time war. Rassilon has a meeting with the council and first of all asks where the Doctor is. Apparently he's off somewhere with something called The Moment and will use it to destroy Time Lords and Daleks alike. Rassilon seems to be getting pretty desperate and he's refusing to die, so he comes up with a new last plan, one involving Earth. Back on Earth, the Doctor and Wilf are tied up as Donna calls in. The Master gets all the other Masters to hunt her down, but the Doctor left her with a defence. Which takes out all the Masters, and she's not dead despite having remembered the Doctor. I don't know, it's a bit weird. The Master then starts talking about all the drumming in his head again, and says that it started when he was a kid. Except, it's a signal. 
the sound of a Time Lord's heartbeat, implanted by Rassilon, and with 6 billion people amplifying the signal, the Master hatches a plan to find out exactly where it's coming from. <laughs> Those cactus aliens then help Will from the Doctor escape, and they all teleport up to their ship, where the Doctor quickly breaks everything, turning everything off so that they can't be detected by the Master. But now they're also deserted. Rassilon, having implanted the signal in the Master's head, now sends a white point star diamond through time to follow that signal. The woman appears to Wilf again to mutter some inconsequential, ominous nonsense. Then we get the best scene in this special, Wilf and the Doctor having another conversation, with the pair reminiscing about their lives. We must look like insects to you. <laughs> I think you look like giants. Then Wilf tries to give the Doctor his gun, asking him to use it to kill the Master before the Master kills him, but the Doctor refuses. Then the Master sends out a broadcast telling the Doctor about the diamond that he's received and how he's going to use it to bring all the Time Lords back. And upon hearing that, the Doctor takes the gun. He explains that the Time Lords are more dangerous than anyone he's ever fought, and then the Doctor gets the ship running again and flies it down to Earth, with Wilf and one of the aliens shooting down all the missiles the Master sends their way. The Time Lords begin arriving through the gate, and then the Doctor just leaps out of the ship, smashing through the skylight, and lands in a pile of broken glass in front of Rassilon. Right, so the fourth Doctor regenerated after falling off some scaffolding, the sixth Doctor regenerated after tripping and knocking his head on the TARDIS. There is no way, no way the Doctor survived this. Anyway, the Master reveals his plan of now turning every Time Lord into him as well, but then Rassilon just reverses it like it's nothing, making the whole thing with everyone turning into John Sim pretty inconsequential in the end. And so Rassilon reveals his plan. He's bringing Gallifrey back, the entire planet crashing into Earth. Meanwhile, the aliens drop Wilf off, and then unceremoniously leave. On his way in, Wilf notices someone trapped in the radiation room, so sets him free by trapping himself inside. The Master's like, sure, the Earth's gonna get destroyed, but Gallifrey being back is still good, right? And the Doctor reveals that it's not just Gallifrey that will be coming back, as it will bring all the Daleks, and the Nightmares, and the entire Time War with it. But Rassilon's plan is more than that. He intends to rip time apart, destroying everything apart from the Time Lords. He doesn't explain how he's going to do this, and none of his plan really makes any sense, but who really cares at this point? Rassilon goes to kill the Master, but the Doctor stands in his way, pointing the gun at Rassilon. No wait, the Master. No wait, Rassilon again. But then the Doctor sees that woman, who, it turns out, is his mother. It's not stated that it's his mum, but Russell T Davis has confirmed it many times that it is his mum. Which makes the Doctor reconsider murdering people, and instead tells the Master to get out of the way so he can shoot a random machine responsible for maintaining the link with Gallifrey. Eh, doesn't really work, but again, who cares at this point? Rassilon goes to kill the Doctor, but then the Master saves him by zapping Rassilon and returning with the Time Lords back into the Time War. And that's it. Everything's fixed, and the Doctor is still alive. Although, as we agreed, he definitely shouldn't be. Except, then he hears four knocks behind him. Wilf knocking on the door of a radiation chamber, which is about to flood with radiation. The Doctor fights with himself and complains and argues before, then accepting his fate and freeing Wilf, taking his place and absorbing all the radiation. After this, the Doctor steps out, healing himself as the regeneration has now started. The Doctor brings Wolf home and then goes to get his reward. His 15 minute long reward. Is it self-indulgent? Yes. Was this my favourite part of the episode as a kid? Also yes. So let's get on with it. Martha and Mickey are fighting off a Sontaran and it turns out they're married now, so I guess things with Tom didn't work out then? And then the Doctor shows up to save them, giving them a look and then leaving. Next up, Luke is walking down the street and nearly gets hit by a car, but the Doctor saves him. Then he gives Sarah Jane a wave and leaves. In a bar somewhere, Jack is having a drink, probably still reeling about murdering his grandson and all, but then the Doctor slips him a note, saying his name is Alonzo, you know, the guy from Voyage of the Damned, setting the pair up before leaving with a salute. Okay, here's a pretty random and obscure one, the granddaughter of Joan, the nurse from Family of Blood, has published the Doctor's journal from that episode, and he asks her if she was happy in the end, to which the granddaughter replies, yes. 
Then we get to see Donna's wedding, a nice ending rounding off her story from the first time we saw her where she was also getting married, and now it's to someone actually nice. And the doctor makes an appearance, where he tells Wilf that he has a wedding present for Donna, which he bought with some money he borrowed off of Donna's dad. It turns out that the present is a lottery ticket, so Wilf salutes the doctor, and the doctor leaves, with one final stop to make. New Year's Day 2005. Rose and Jackie are heading home, and the doctor spies on her in the shadows, before then telling her that she's going to have a really great year. And with that, the Doctor can't put it off any longer, so he staggers back to the TARDIS as the Ood appear once more to sing to him. The Doctor says his final words, I don't want to go, and then regenerates. Into Matt Smith, who starts checking out his new body before then shouting Geronimo and crashing the TARDIS back down to Earth. This episode really felt like it was starting to buckle towards the end, like everything was there and it was all kind of coming apart and there wasn't really good reasoning for what was happening on screen anymore and it kind of felt like an early draft and Rusty Davis really didn't know where he was going with it and if you've read Rusty Davis's book then you'll know he didn't know where he was going with this. This was like his fifth idea that he was just chucking out there. The episode was originally just going to be a small stake story where the Doctor was on a spaceship saving a little group of aliens but no, he made it massive and grandiose. And once again, as Rusty Davis often does, he then writes himself into a corner, doesn't know how to finish it, and we get a weird deus ex machina ending. But I will say that I did like how he rounded off the story as a whole by giving every single character a little bit of finality. I just can't shake the feeling that there's someone missing. Like, there was someone that the Doctor forgot to visit. Adam! The Russell T Davies era of Doctor Who never truly ended. I mean, other than him currently being the showrunner again, and even getting David Tennant and Catherine Tate back for a bit, no, I'm talking about the countless spin-offs produced by the company Big Finish. Big Finish make full cast audio dramas starring the original cast members and have made spin-offs starring every conceivable character of the Russell T Davies era. That's right, even him. There's a load of Ninth Doctor ones taking place in his brief time before taking Rose on as a companion, three series of Rose's adventures on parallel Earth, adventures featuring the Tenth Doctor with Rose, Donna, Riversong, or just exploring the Time War. Midshipman Frame gets some adventures with Jack, New Earth got its own spin-off as did Jenny, Derek Jacoby's master, Lady Christina, Martha during that year she was exploring the Earth. And that's not even all of them, there are so, so many more. And that's not it for extended universe stuff, as there's also the Titan comics range, which I heavily recommend. The Ninth Doctor and Tenth Doctor got their own runs here. The Tenth Doctor even got a couple new companions. There's also a story that shows how Rose and the Metacrisis Doctor had a life after the events of Journey's End. And that one's really weird. The point being that there is no shortage of Doctor Who content being produced for fans of this era. And if there's like one tiny aspect of this show that you really are into, then there'll definitely be some extended media that caters exactly to that. So if this seven hour tour of the Hooniverse just wasn't enough for you, then there's some stuff to keep you busy for now. So that's it, that's, that's the end of the video. I've got nothing else about the Rusty Day era to talk about. I'm, I'm spent, I'm empty. Please let me stop making this video. If you did get this far into the video and watch the whole thing, then first of all, you're probably lying, but honestly, thank you so much. I appreciate it like you couldn't believe. This has been four months of my life just watching Endless Doctor Who and editing so many episodes. I, I just want to be free. If this video does well, then sure, I suppose I'll go into the Moffat era, but I kind of hope it doesn't do too well because I don't know if I can really watch that much more Doctor Who. <laughs> this is, uh, please, just let me be free. Please, please!